Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. Mr. President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr. President, committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators Mr. that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I'll call the clerk to call on business. Private senators' bills, consideration. Order of the day number 42, Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment, Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill 2019, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Gabbagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on this important private senator's bill, which, if passed, would improve accountability and transparency in government operations. The Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Act, or the PGPA Act, is the key piece of legislation underpinning the financial framework and governance architecture of the Commonwealth. It applies to all Commonwealth entities and companies. The establishment of the PGPA Act was done during the term of the previous Labor government in 2013. It replaced the Financial Management and Accountability Act and the Commonwealth Authorities and Companies Act, both of which had been in place since the late 1990s. The PGPA Act was designed to establish the framework necessary for a modern public service. The Act, along with the necessary governance and accountability aspects, also contains provisions for the granting of discretionary financial assistance to members of the public. The bill before us today deals with two aspects of this discretionary financial assistance, waivers of debt and act of grace payments. Section 63 of the PGPA Act authorises the Finance Minister on behalf of the Commonwealth to waive a debt owing to the Commonwealth. This waiver extinguishes the debt meaning the Commonwealth cannot pursue the debt at a later date, even if the financial circumstances of the debtor, person or organisation change for the better. These debts relate to non-corporate Commonwealth entities, so it would relate to debts owed to the tax office or to Centrelink. Debt waivers are granted when the decision maker, the finance minister for debts over $100,000, finance officials for amounts below that, consider that recovering the debt would be inequitable or cause ongoing financial hardship and that other debt treatment options are not deemed appropriate. Financial hardship, as stated by the Department of Defence, would exist uh, sorry, the Department of Finance would exist where payment of the debt would leave some unable to provide food, accommodation, clothing, medical treatment, education or other necessities for themselves or their families or other people for whom they are responsible. The PGPA Act also provides the Finance Minister with the power to provide act of grace payments. Section 65 of the PGPA Act authorises the Finance Minister on behalf of the Commonwealth to make payments to a person if they consider it appropriate to do so because of special circumstances. These special circumstances are not defined in the Act. However, the Department of Finance cites examples where such circumstances may exist such as when, where a non-corporate Commonwealth entity has taken action or failed to take action, which has caused an unintended or inequitable result for someone, or where Commonwealth legislation or policy has an unintended, um, inequitable or otherwise unacceptable impact on someone. Like waivers of debt, the provision of an act of grace payment is discretionary. Each request is treated individually at the full discretion of the relevant decision maker and does not create a precedent for future requests. While this bill covers both act of grace payments and waivers of debt, I want to particularly focus on the waiver of debt aspect. 
At Senate estimates in October last year, it was revealed that the Tasmanian housing debt, worth $157 million, was waived under the waiver of debt power in the PGPA Act. Finance officials also stated that these debt waivers and Act of Grace payments are not reported publicly. Of course, the waiver of the Tasmanian housing debt was a measure in the MIEFO of that year, but I find it interesting, in the interests of government accountability and transparency, that there is no requirement at all for reporting on these debt waivers and Act of Grace payments. After all, we're talking about taxpayers' money either being given in a discretionary fashion to people or organisations, or debts owed to the Commonwealth, that is the taxpayer, being waived at the stroke of a pen. This is extremely pertinent, particularly as we are now understand the government has to repay debts to the value of $721 million as part of the illegal robo-debt scheme. While anyone, of course, can ask through the estimates process or questions on notice for an update on these type of these figures, governments are not required to voluntarily put information out into the public domain on it. When you look back at what has happened over uh, the term of this government, it's interesting to see that from 1 July 2014 to 30 June 2019, so over that five-year period, there were 723 decisions made by finance portfolio ministers or appropriate delegates to waive debts owed to the Commonwealth with a total value of $159.5 million, or an average of $220,608 per decision. From 1 July 2019 through to October, so just in those four months, there have been 26 decisions to waive debt with a total value of $158.6 million, so almost exactly the same total as over the previous five years, the average skyrocketing to $6.1 million per decision, but noting that this is the period of time that the Tasmanian housing debt was being waived. By March this year, this had increased to 62 decisions with a total value of $159.4 million. So over that uh, five-and-a-half-year period, um, almost six-year period, we saw over 310, uh, almost $320 million um, being waived uh, of taxpayers' funds um, through um, either um, through the waiver of debt uh, process. I'd also notice, and this has come to me through questions on notice, that the status of other housing debts in the pipeline, because after Tasmania had their housing debt waived uh, in order, if senators recall, for the vote of Senator Jackie Lambie for uh, the government's tax legislation, which actually passed tax cuts, which passed by one vote in this place. Um, the price of that was $158 million to Tasmania. So, as you'd expect, the other states with housing debts to the Commonwealth um, have all sought to have their debts waived and to renegotiate their loans to the Commonwealth. And we know that New South Wales um, they have $838 million debt. Uh, in relation to housing debts, Queensland $278.5 million, Western Australia $343.2 million debt, the ACT $114.9 million debt and Northern Territory $190.5 million debt. Now, presuming these um, loans were engaged in, in similar ways to the Tasmanians and presuming all state gov governments have similar arguments about the fairness or otherwise of those loans and the fact that Tasmanians have had theirs waived, you would think there were equally strong arguments on the same grounds if those grounds were applied as they are required to be applied under the PGPA Act, uh, that there will be more um, waivers of debt coming our way um, for the finance minister to sign off in the not too distant future. And indeed, when um, I pursued this at estimates, um, in March this year, Treasury confirmed that they have provided advice to the government on state housing debt forgiveness in relation to the further applications they have had, but the Treasury is unable to comment on the specific nature of the timing or the advice, or indeed, I presume, when the government 
uh, will make a decision on that. But I can certainly say from the ACT government's point of view, when engaging with the Commonwealth on um, loans, um, my experience uh, is that they haven't been as generous as they have been with Tasmania in any way, perhaps because they, don't, uh, they know my vote um, doesn't count as much as Senator Jackie Lambie's does for the purpose of particular legislation. I, I presume that's, that's the reason why they haven't waived the ACT's debt. Um, but when we negotiated with them about the asbestos dump that they and the um, houses riddled with asbestos in this town from when they actually administered the territory, um, you know, they, they wouldn't even um, give an inch on that loan. In fact, it's a billion dollar loan which I think the current chief minister has paid out after going and getting cheaper debt uh, from the private sector because of the terms of that loan. So, the Commonwealth has been reluctant, I think, to waiver debts for anyone, any other state government in any other situation other than when it serves their purpose to get one vote in this chamber, all of a sudden the waiver of debt requirements have been met and uh, the, the debt is washed away um, with the, the signing of an instrument. Uh, and you know, Tasmania is certainly better off for it, um, but all the other struggling state governments with similar debts um, are left uh, to manage their debt with a Commonwealth with a, you know, a closed ear, it would seem. This bill would improve, um, in a small but important way, the level of accountability and transparency to the graving of debt waivers and act of grace payments. And I think accountability and transparency is an issue that um, this government has a problem with. And we know from all the OPDs that come back being, you know, relative, well, ignored mostly, or um, we know from the committee processes that we're involved in how often cabinet in confidence is used or um, how questions come back from the public service not answered or ans you know, answered in a way that doesn't provide any information. So we know this government doesn't like providing information um, to the parliament and, and therefore us to the community. And so this is an important way of requiring that. We shouldn't have to pursue it and wait 30 days. This is information that, that the community is entitled to. It is the community's money. It is not your money to do secret deals with and hide away and hope people don't ask about. It's the community's money and it should be reported. And That is what this bill seeks to do. It increases transparency without infringing on the privacy of individuals and organisations. And I know that would have been a response from the government that you can't identify who you are providing debt waivers to and under, or act of grace payments, and fair enough. That's why this bill has been uh, drafted in a way that would require the Department of Finance to report in its annual report the number of debt waivers made during the annual report, uh, during the period that the annual report covers, the total dollar amount that was waived as a result of those debt waivers, the number of act of grace payments made during the period and the annual, uh, the annual report covers and the total dollar amount that was paid as a result of those act of grace payments. As the explanatory memorandum to the bill states, I would anticipate this looking like, for example, in 2019-20, in X debt waiver authorisations were made with Y in debts waived, and in 1920 X act of grace payments were made totalling Y. And then, if people have further questions about that, then of course they can pursue it. It's simple, straightforward and adds a layer of accountability, but importantly sends a message to the public service and to executive government that this is information that is legitimately in the public interest and should be provided as a matter of course, as so much uh, other details are in the annual reports. Given that all the bill is asking for is the publication of aggregate or global figures for the total amounts, no private information would be made public and the identities of recipients of a debt waiver or act of grace payment uh, would not be made known. So I think when you look back at um, the last five, six years um, of decisions that have been made under this government, we know that the total involved is you know, over 300, three, about $320 million. It's not small or insignificant sums by any means. We know that um, the applications keep coming in. Uh, we know that the Has Tasmanian housing debt was one of them. We know that there are applications in 
from five other jurisdictions to have their housing debts waived. So potentially, this is going to be a mechanism that is used to offset, you know, in excess of a billion dollars, 1.3 billion dollars worth of loans. It's only appropriate uh, that the government report this, report it clearly, and that it just becomes standard practice in terms of information that's required uh, to be put in the um, public domain. It's not controversial. I can't see any reason why any senator in this place wouldn't support it. Uh, it's about providing taxpayers uh, with a level of transparency they don't have at the moment. It also requires um, a more open government in terms of information that is provided out to the community, both, I think, uh, positive initiatives and uh, hopefully the Senate will support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Senator Seselja. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, the purpose of the opposition's bill is to amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013 to increase transparency in government operations relating to active grace payments and waivers of debts. It would require the Department of Finance to include in its annual report the details of decisions made under the Act to authorise active grace payments or to waive debts owed to the Commonwealth. I note that in recognition of privacy and confidentiality concerns, the bill only seeks that the total number of matters authorised and the total value of those authorisations be published. The Act of Grace and uh, Waiver of Debt Power exists under the PGPA Act to enable the consideration and resolution of matters that fall outside the usual legislative frameworks. They are intended to be exercised as a last resort as they provide flexibility for the Commonwealth to deal quickly and effectively with issues where special circumstances arise. The government does not use these powers lightly, but they are a necessary capability to respond to fast-moving events where existing legislation may not be able to be used. For example, these powers are an important part of the government's response to COVID-19, enabling the waiver of annual levies in the fishing industry and the waiver of the Commonwealth Register of Institutions and Courses for Overseas Students' Levy for the education sector to help support those sectors in this challenging time. In considering this bill, it's important to note there is already a robust system for the exercise of these powers. Debt waivers and active grace payments are discretionary and there is no automatic entitlement. Each claim is carefully assessed on its merits. The Department of Finance consults broadly and confidentially with the applicants and impacted Commonwealth agencies to ensure that decision makers have all the relevant information in considering each claim. Further consideration of the exercise of these powers for amounts over $500,000 can only occur after an advisory committee has been established and provided advice to the Minister for Finance or the Assistant Minister for Finance. The advisory committee is comprised of relevant public servants with knowledge of both the process of debt waivers and act of grace payments, as well as specialist knowledge of the policy issue. There is some merit in the disclosure of some data of payments made under the PGPA Act, provided that individual payments are not able to be identified. Indeed, the Minister for Finance has reported some aggregate data in answers to questions on notice. Most recently, debt, waivers, uh, debt, waiver was provided, uh, in response, debt waiver data was provided in response to a question from Senator McAllister during the October 2019 Senate estimates. Many payments are to individuals, small business or small organisations. Sometimes the value of a payment can pertain to sensitive information, such as the value of lost income, and we therefore need to be very careful about how any data is released to ensure the privacy of applicants is maintained. Uh, that being said, amending the PGPA Act, as proposed by this bill, to mandate disclosure in finances annual reports is an unnecessary and inflexible expansion of the PGPA Act. The normal approach is for annual report requirements to consist of fixed requirements that do not change from year to year. That model for reporting is, however, too rigid for discretionary payment data, where some years can yield relatively few discretionary payments and a risk can therefore arise that the value of an individual payment could be reduced. There is also uh, the issue here of ensuring appropriate consultation. Ordinarily, annual reporting requirements are not changed without consultation uh, with the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. 
If the JCPAA had been consulted, uh, they might have suggested the, the intent of this bill could be better addressed through an amendment to the PGPA annual reporting rule or through a direction from the Minister of Finance to our department to make this information available, while taking into account the risks of disclosure and amending the presentation of data to reduce that risk. Requests for act of grace payments or waiver of debts are made on the basis of utmost privacy and confidentiality. This bill creates the risk that, in those years where there are a small number of matters authorised, rigid reporting, as envisaged by the proposed bill, could serve to identify a particular claimant. There are no safeguards in the proposed bill to protect against this possibility. Rather than the approach in the proposed bill, it is preferable that the government releases data in a way that ensures there are no inadvertent disclosures that may compromise the Commonwealth's commitment to treat claims in confidence. As such, the Minister for Finance has directed our department to commence disclosure of annual and five-year aggregate data in relation to active grace payments and debt waivers, including the 2019-20 financial year. There are sufficient payments in the 2019-20 year that there is not a concern about privacy this year. I understand that this data will be made public later this, later this calendar year on, on the website and at transparency.gov.au. This bill is an unnecessary and inflexible expansion of the PGPA Act that has not been considered by the relevant Joint Committee of Parliament. This government strongly believes in transparency in government operations. Uh, that is why the Minister for Finance has directed our department to release the information that the proposed bill is seeking in a manner that is flexible enough to ensure the privacy of applicants is maintained. Thank you, Senator Cecil. Just Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to the, uh, the discussion of this bill, the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment wa Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill 2009, of 2019. This bill requires the Department of Finance to include information about debts waived and Act of Grace payments in its annual report. It requires the Department to report on the number of waivers of of debt granted, number of act of grace payments made and the total number of debts waived and act of, uh, act of grace payments made. The Minister for Finance already has the power to extinguish debts owed to the Commonwealth, including the ATO and Centrelink debts. This, be this bill would provide for additional transparency by requiring the department to report on those figures. However, this bill would not fix the robo-debt mess or deliver justice for robo-debt victims, and it, would, and, and it shouldn't distract from the bigger problems at hand. Now, the robo-debt debacle highlights the need for transparency. The fact that, uh, as uh, members of this place and members of the Community Affairs Reference Committee have not been able to find out some very basic details about robo-debt and the way the government has handled robo-debt is a very good example of the need for increased transparency and the way the government hides behind uh, its public interest immunity claims and uh, privacy claims and um, its lack of accountability uh, measures. And so that's why the Greens think that uh, this sort of information is very important to be released. Um, this bill uh, is um, a step in, in that direction. In terms of robo-debt and the absolute intransigence of government over many years to release critical information and to actually admit that it got it wrong, to actually admit that there that the debts were illegal, that in fact putting a machine in charge and continuing to claim that oh yeah there was human oversight, the very issue is the fact that the debts still kept going out to people, they were still wrong, they still used income averaging. So in other words, the so-called eyeballs over the debt, bef let the debt issues before they went out, either they weren't doing it properly, or they didn't actually pick up and they um, relied on the, on the algorithm to be right at every time, when quite clearly A was wrong on many occasions, but most importantly, in fact, it was illegal. And the government has finally admitted that by 
uh, now saying they'll refund some of the debts, but only if you've got a debt up to 2000 and, uh, past 2015. It's impossible to put a dollar figure on the harm done to hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Australians. The robo-debt scheme has made people feel worthless, humiliated. Sh they, they talk about their feeling of shame, uh, they're embarrassed, um, and it has strongly affected people's mental health. It's endangered people's jobs, health and education. Just imagine the mental and physical cost of dealing with Centrelink as they chase you over a debt. People talk about being hounded. They talk about feeling of feeling harassed, of never being able to get away from the fact that the government owed them a debt, uh, said they owed them a debt. The government has sought to demonise people on income support through the robo debt program. The very people who need assistance and have a right to access social security were then made to feel worthless and that they had cheated because they had, in fact, accessed our social safety net. What's even worse is this government won't rule out doing this again, changing the legislation so they can continue the income compliance uh, program going into the future. We still haven't received a genuine apology from this government on it, on this issue. When the Prime Minister commented in the other place on this matter, it was as if he didn't understand the depth of anguish, harm and trauma had, that had been caused uh, by this program. I strongly believe that, in fact, the only way that we can get to, bottom, to the bottom of this and to actually forensically look at all the files, because quite frankly, I don't trust the government to be able to or to, in fact, acknowledge all the income averaging debts or partly income to average debts that they are. Some of them they don't even know how to contact. And they claim that going back to the debts before 2015, they, don't, they, don't actually, they can't actually find those people. Um, I think those people know very well who they are, so I'm very confident that they would come forward. The government knew about the illegality of the debts before they, way before they acknowledged and suspended the program. And the question has to be, if they keep up with this facade about not really knowing that it was illegal is where was the due diligence in terms of actually thoroughly investigating it. And of course we saw the farce of their claim that they did not have a duty of care. Well, Australians believe that our government does have a duty of care. A Royal Commission would allow us to examine all elements of the robo-debt programs, including debts that were issued before 2015 using income averaging or partly income averaged. They'd look at what decisions were made, when and by whom, the human cost of the program. It could look into all of the debts and do a proper forensic analysis of the process. Australians agree that, ro that robo-debt victims deserve justice and they support the concept of a Royal Commission. Recent polling showed when people were asked if there should be a Royal Commission into robo-debt, 53 per cent of respondents agreed. The poll also found that 74 per cent of people said the government should apologise and 66 per cent of victims uh, they believe 66 per cent of victims sh uh, sorry, 60 cent be believe victims should receive uh, interest and damages on top of their refunds. The government won't do its job and it can't be trusted to actually hold itself accountable when it comes to this unlawful scheme. That's why we need a Royal Commission. Victims deserve justice and someone needs to be held accountable. This government needs to be held accountable. In terms of this particular bill, anything that helps transparency and people to understand the act of grace system. There's been, an Senate, there's been a number of Senate inquiries into over the years, but there has been Senate inquiries into uh, Act of Grace payments and in, into compensation and Act of Grace payments. And I think it's fair to say that many in the community, or most in the community, don't actually uh, understand how decisions on Act of Grace are made, um, how much the government uh, spends on it, how many there are. And I don't accept 
the uh, argument put forward by uh, the minister to uh, say that if it was a small amount, it would identify people. There are ways, and there are ways that the government deals with information and releasing public information when there are only a small number of uh, people involved. Um, so, for example, in the Community Affairs Committee, we're often asked. Uh, we're often asking for information on various payments, and where there's, for, where there's a small number, the government then says, "Well, it's less than five to enable enable people not to be identified." For example, although quite frankly, I think just telling numbers does not in, it, in, 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 identify people um, at all. This this. Uh, asks for public reporting, which I think is fair enough, on how many waivers of debt or active grace payments have been made, what amount of debt has been waived, or what amount has been paid out um, in, an in active grace payments. I think these um, are fair enough. I also think the government needs to be looking at how it's using these provisions to actually deal with the issue of debts to Centrelink uh, right now, or supposed debts to Centrelink right now. Um, these are issues that I think uh, need to be very clearly identified. Uh, the, this bill does help. It doesn't fix everything, um, but it does help. And I don't see why um, the government can't support uh, this sort of information becoming uh, public and to increase transparency. It does got, not go as far as the Greens want us to. Uh, want the government to go in terms of transparency. There's a long, long, long way to go, and I'm sure my colleague Senator, Wa uh, Senator Waters will be addressing some of those other areas when she makes her contribution to the debate on this bill. But I fail to see why this sort of transparency is not acceptable to government, given that this is public money, given that the community have a right to know this type of information. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And uh, I too rise to add my contributions to the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill of 2019. This bill does indeed amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act of 2013. And in doing so, it requires the Department of Finance in its annual report to report on the number and the dollar amount of waiver, waivers of debt granted and act of grace payments provided. At present, waivers of debt and act of grace payments are not publicly reported and there is no requirement for there to be any publication of this information. The bill will require the Department of Finance to provide information in its annual report on the number of debt waivers granted in the financial year, and that annual report covers as well the total amount of the debt waived, and very importantly, by putting it in the annual reports, it then becomes available to us as senators to review at the relevant estimates period towards the end, generally, generally towards the end of the year. Um, it will also require the Department of Finance to provide information in its annual report on the number of active grace payments made in the financial year that the annual report covers, as well as the total amount provided through these payments. Uh, it does not and it will not require the publication of any personal or sensitive information about any individual or organisation who received a debt waiver or act of grace payment. But in the interests of government accountability and transparency, uh, it is important that this, uh, this amendment goes to rectifying this lack of publication. It's, it's a small but nonetheless important step. Um, the bill before us today for debate is a sensible bill and it strikes a good balance between transparency of government operations and protecting the privacy of individuals and organisations. And this is something that we have found very much wanting in the standard modus operandi of this LNP government. They've been found wanting on far too many occasions when it comes to any notion of transparency or the implementation of necessary transparency in the law that they have brought into being in this country. Take, for example, the issue of foreign investment. Uh, just one case, the Alinta Energy Privacy Scandal, which involved the identities of 1.1 million Australians being stored offshore a million identities at risk with data that was 
are not revealed and not known to the Australian public because of failures of governance by this government, a lack of transparency and a lack of commitment to it. This put a spotlight on the Morrison government's lacklustre record when it comes to scrutiny. The Alinta Energy privacy scandal exposed the darker side of foreign investment and the slow and ineffective compliance regime that is managed by the Treasurer and his department. It highlighted a regime unfit for purpose and the critical need for urgent and sustained scrutiny in the national interest. My jaw hit the ground when I received evidence in a recent Senate hearing that in 2019 there were only two brave souls in the whole of the country overseeing inter international investment compliance with conditions that were set by the Foreign Investment Review Board and approved by the Treasurer. I, I, I do want to put on the record my concern for the sullying of the name of those on the Foreign Investment Review Board because it should be constantly made clear to Australians that the board is simply a place in which recommendations are delivered. The person who makes the decision and is responsible for implementing those recommendations is none other than the Treasurer. All responsibility must be sheeted home to the Treasurer at the time. We're talking about tens of billions of dollars, a huge footprint right across the country, swathes of agricultural land, essential services like gas and electricity, and two, yes, just two Australians in Treasury on watch for the nation. Are you serious? But this is the level of the gap between the public perception that this government tries to create, the sense of confidence that they're looking after people right across this country, and the reality that they are, they are, um, they are allergic to transparency, in fact. To give you a sense of the scale of how big this is and how disingenuous this, disingenuous this lackadaisical government has been on this matter, those opposite told us, as a nation, that they'd fixed the problems within the Foreign Investment Board, and that they described earlier this month, and then they described earlier this month that they had introduced um, their Foreign Investment Review Board changes in response to a problem they said they'd already solved. And this goes back to 2018 when they introduced a bill into Parliament, which was passed, uh, called the Critical Infrastructure Act of 2018. At that point of time, the government told Australians that they'd fix this problem about making sure infrastructure security was in order. The Treasurer at the time was our now Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison. He was not truthful or transparent then and continues to be loose with the truth. I mean, we just have to look right now at the moment. People are voting in the seat of Eden Monero, uh, devastated by bushfires, uh, and they were promised by this minister, Prime Minister that they would have an immediate response to the bushfire challenges that they face. Here we are, half a year later, and we know that only 4% 4 per cent have received help. And this is the problem with this government, the gap between what they say they're doing, the frequency of their announcements and their constant failure to deliver on the things that they make a show and dance about and get a headline on. The transparency gap is widening by the day. And this is a critical failure that I'm recounting today because it's a matter of failure on national sovereignty and security. In that same year of 2017-18, those opposite harped on that they'd fixed the Foreign Investment Review Board and Treasurer oversight problems. The Foreign Investment oh, no. Review Board made recommendations that the Treasurer ticked off on, and nobody else other than the Treasurer can tick off on it. And the amount of those approved proposals was a total of $163 billion, including $16.6 billion alone for the areas of manufacturing gas and electricity. And believe me, the senator opposite might be upset about a little light being shone on a lack of transparency by this government. But Australians are interested in manufacturing. They are very interested in chains of delivery. They are very interested in the price of gas. They are very interested in national security around gas and electricity. And this government has failed to be transparent about what they're doing. And that is absolutely relevant to the debate here this morning. A little bit of scrutiny and you can't even stand it here in the chamber, bleating and moaning over there. This is the scale of the work that has to be done by the Treasurer and his department to make sure Australia's interests are looked after. Former Treasurer Mr Morrison handed over to Mr Frydenberg a Foreign Investment Review Board structure with $16.6 billion to be managed with terms and conditions and two people, two people allocated to the task of looking after the nation. The government's not up to the job and it's certainly not interested in transparency. 
The Critical Infrastructure Act of 2018 that was supposed to fix the problem didn't do the job, and the Foreign Investment Review Board was left to operate in a black box with no transparency or accountability. And that is why today's uh, private members matter that is being debated is of some importance because it is a tiny indication, a minuscule indication of some interest in transparency. In the Senate Economic Reference Committee last month, I was shocked to find out that at no time has Alinta Energy, uh, since its federal government approval of purchase by the Chinese business company Chow Tai Fook, been compliant with all set conditions of the Foreign Investment Review Board. We're talking about April 2017, and here we are now, we're clicked into June. That evidence was received on May 15. That is a failure of governance at a national level in terms of national interest and security. Also, just last month, the Foreign Investment Review Board was um, indicated it was unaware of uh, known and reported investment links between Mr Henry Cheng, the principal of Chow Tai Fook, which now owns Australia's Alinta Energy, and the Ho family of the Macau uh, gambling infamy. Concerns about the Ho family were sufficient to prevent them from being allowed to invest in gambling ventures in Australia, but unknown to Treasury officials. Mr Cheng, who owns Alinta Energy with his company Chow Tai Fook, owns also a 9.7 per cent investment with the Ho family in another entity, SJM. And it strikes me as very peculiar that standards for buying into a casino appear to be much higher than the standards set and supervised by this government for the purchase of an electricity retailer with over a million Australian customers and all their data and identity in the hands of Alinta. But this is what this government's all about, isn't it? The smoke and mirrors game, a charade of doing more than they actually are. And Australians will see in the upcoming months how wanting this government actually is when it comes to the tasks of proper governance, transparency and accountability. And that's why this legislation that's here before us today is just one part of an important and necessary mechanism of accountability that brings uh, some accountability to this government. The bill before us today, as I said, is a sensible and reasonable step forward with regard to the waiver of debts. Uh, let's talk about debts and those who did not get a debt waived, in fact, those who were pursued, hounded in some cases, to their ultimate demise by a government through the robo-debt scheme. It's incredibly relevant that we discuss transparency and debt with regard to the recent revelations that the government has now agreed to repay $721 million in illegal robo-debts that they generated. They created the invoices and sent them out to hundreds of thousands of Australians. If you were in a business and you sent out debts that you made up on half of the information, you would not be able to operate. No small business that I've ever seen, known or been a part of has ever been able to carry on with a lack of transparency of the scale that we've seen from this government. I spoke this last week in this place about the everlasting and damaging impact of the government's robo-scheme to trust in this nation. Last week, in response to a question from my colleague and friend, the Honourable Mr Bill Shorten, the Prime Minister apologised in a half-hearted way for any hurt and harm people suffered from the government's robo-debt scheme. But that was after stonewalling for months and after implementing a scheme by his design for years inflicting that pain and suffering on Australians. Let me be very clear to those opposite. Firstly, your apologies, five years too late, are completely inadequate. Secondly, do not think for one second that an apology lately given and half-heartedly given will do what needs to be done to redress the shame of robo-debt and the stench of it that hangs around this LNP government. Your robo-debt extortion racket has ravaged people's lives and left a trail of carnage through people's lives in credit issues, personal trauma and the loss of life. Answers to Senate questions I noticed revealed that 
2,030 people died after receiving a robo-debt notice. That's a lot of Australians, a lot of Australians severely impacted by the decisions of Mr Morrison, Mr Porter and implemented by Mr Stuart Robert. Robo-debts targeted members of my community on the Central Coast. I'm aware of three students, three students in one family in Empire Bay who were collectively sent debts of nearly $10,000 as they tried to wake their, work their way through university. Now, I'm a mother of three young people. And when this government demanded that people go back and find their receipts or find their uh, documents for payment received for any work back to seven years, it just reveals that they have no sense of understanding of how young people in Australia might keep records. And this was a critical change that they undertook. Instead of doing the work with the resources of government to check, they took people out of the work at the highest level here in government and they transferred all responsibility for 17-year-olds who reached the age of 24 trying to struggle through university saying, go back and get your pay slips from entities that no longer existed. That's what they did with robo-debt. I also know of a teacher on the Central Coast who was sent a robo-debt of nearly $7,000, couldn't get a response from Centrelink despite numerous efforts, and was harassed, harassed and publicly shamed in their home by the arrival of debt collectors. I won't forget the man who was robo-debted $17,500 it would have taken him 22 and a half years to pay it back, but this government pursued him mercilessly. All unlawful, causing needless harm. Only when confronted with the prospect of hundreds of thousands of Australians getting their day in court has this government executed a backflip for the ages and announced a plan to repay the victims of robo-debt. They've been dragged kicking and screaming to this point. An apology will never be enough for this robo-debt extortion racket. Victims and their families need a solemn promise this scheme will never rear its ugly head again. I call on the Prime Minister to genuinely and penitently acknowledge the needless pain that they've suffered. All those responsible for Senator the program ignore the mountain of expired. evidence because they're not interested Senator in transparency. Your time has expired. Senator Patterson. Oh, thank you, Madam <coughs> Acting Deputy President. And I rise to make a contribution on the Public Government's Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill 2019. Uh, in doing so, I, I listened very carefully to the contributions made by Senator Seward, uh, substantially about robo-debt, uh, Senator O'Neill, substantially about the Foreign Investment Review Board and also about robo-debt. Uh, I will be making some concrete observations about the bill itself later in my speech, but like Senator Seward and like Senator O'Neill, I'd like to make some uh, closely related uh, observations about transparency in general, the principle of transparency and the importance of transparency in government, the importance of transparency in, in public life, the importance of transparency for, for political parties, because in a way it's very opposite that uh, Labor senators, Senator Gallagher in particular, has moved a private member's bill this morning that goes to the issue of transparency, because it is an issue uh, which has been very prominent in the media in the last 24 hours. And I know that transparency is something that's important to all senators, Labor senators included. And in fact, they have a great opportunity today to contribute to the transparency that we know is so important in our public life. And I encourage them to make that contribution here in the chamber or through the media or by whichever means that they feel is most appropriate. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to the matters in the media this morning and last night on the 60 Minutes program and The Age regarding Mr Somurek, uh, the now former member of Mr Andrews' cabinet in the Labor government in Victoria. In the interests of transparency, uh, there are some fairly important issues to be answered about this affair and the extent to which it involves the Federal Labor Party here in Canberra. Now, I'm sure, of course, that Federal Labor MPs will be going out today, given their lines by the Leader of Opposition's office, to say that this is a state matter, that this is a matter for Mr Andrews, that this is not a matter involving the Federal Labor Party. But, in fact, that's not the case, and we know that's not the case for a number of reasons. Mr Albanese said in one of his interviews this morning uh, in the morning media uh, that he barely knows Mr Somurek. He might have met him a couple of times. Most people outside of Victoria wouldn't have even heard of him. I thought that was a little bit strange, given that Mr Somurek is a member of the National Executive of the Labor Party, oh. attends National Executive 
executive meetings with Mr Albanese, presumably sits alongside him in some of those meetings and uh, engages in uh, matters of state as it concerns the Australian Labor Party and its national governance. Uh, as I understand it, in fact, he's a significant figure on that national executive, quite an influential figure on that national executive. So it would surprise me if Mr Albanese uh, doesn't know Mr Somirek and doesn't know him, in fact, very well. Uh, we heard in the recordings last night, uh, televised by 60 Minutes, uh, both audio recordings from telephone phone calls and, in fact, sensationally video uh, evidence, which I'll come to in a minute, uh, that Mr Somurek claims to effectively own, control and have great influence over a number of members of Mr Albanese's caucus. Uh, he claimed to have called in the member for uh, McEwen, Rob Mitchell, to inform him that his career was coming to an end. It's an interesting uh, power for a state politician to have who's got no uh, connection to the Federal Labor Party, but he called Mr Mitchell in and said that his, uh, presumably his performance was not up to standard by Mr Somerick's uh, estimation and that his career would be coming to an end. Uh, he boasted of how the member for Bruce, Mr Hill, uh, his career would also be coming to an end and that he would be um, sacking him uh, from the federal parliament in the same way he sacked a number of local government uh, authorities in Victoria. Uh, he even uh, claimed and quite amusingly reenacted uh, his engagements with uh, the member for Jellybrand, Mr Watts, who apparently bows uh, to Mr Somurek in uh, genuflex, as, as uh, my colleague Senator Scar has interjected, uh, genuflex towards Mr Somurek in respect of his authority and control over the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party. Uh, he made similar claims about the influence he exercises over the member for McNamara, uh, Mr Burns, uh, and of course uh, we, uh, the member for Holt, Mr Byrne. Uh, I note that uh, among these claims of influence and control, which might just be boasting, it might just be uh, big claims made by Mr Somurek, or indeed there might be some truth to it. And I think it is incumbent on all Labor MPs named and those not named, including the Leader of the Opposition, to front up today in the interest of transparency and explain exactly what their connections are to Mr Somurek, exactly what their involvement is with Mr Somurek, uh, exactly what knowledge they have of Mr Somurek's activities. Uh, are we seriously to believe that last night was the first time that Mr Albanese had a whiff that maybe something was not completely kosher about Mr Somurek, that maybe something was amiss, that maybe he was engaged in multiple recruitment or even branch stacking in the Labor Party. Uh, his activities in the Victorian Labor Party are notorious, notoriously well known. Uh, no one involved in politics on any side of politics would be unfamiliar with Mr Somerek's reputation, and it beggars belief that Mr Albanese, who was happy to sit on the national executive with him yesterday, suddenly has a problem today and suddenly is going to act on it today. Of course, on the involvement of federal Labor parliamentarians uh, with Mr Somerek, and in the interest of transparency, uh, it appeared from the footage last night that at least some of it was filmed inside the office of a federal member of parliament. Uh, you could clearly see uh, from the footage a Australian Parliament House login uh, uh, displayed on one of the computer screens. Uh, I don't think they have those in state parliamentary offices. I could be wrong, but I think they're only in federal parliamentary offices. Uh, also uh, in that footage was uh, some uh, maps, electoral maps, and particularly uh, one that came up time and time again was the, a map of the electorate of Holt. Uh, I don't know why a, fed, a state member of parliament would have that in their office. Perhaps it was indeed in a federal pa parliament office. And in fact, later in the program, you could even see a close-up shot when Mr Somerek is pacing up and down on the phone of some core flutes. Uh, that appear to be uh, have Mr Burns' name on it, but he appear to be in some way connected to him. Uh, so it clearly, in the interest of transparency, it's up to uh, Mr Byrne, Mr Albanese and the other Labor MPs named in last night's episode and in the papers today to come forward and explain what they knew about Adam, Adam Somerek's activities and when they knew about them. Uh, there, it, is, it is not sufficient for them to say this is a state matter. It is not sufficient for them to say this is a matter uh, for Mr Andrews. Uh, if they don't do that, then I think Mr Albanese has failed a very important test of leadership. Mr Albanese uh, made a big song and a dance about how he was expelling John Setka from the Labor Party. That didn't quite go to plan. Uh, and, uh, and finally, Mr Setka le left the Labor Party, although certainly not by Mr Albanese's hand. Uh, and this is yet another test for him and his leadership. Is he actually going to ensure that Mr Somurek is out of the Labor Party? He has been sacked uh, from Mr Andrews' cabinet, but he remains a member of parliament, he remains a member of the Labor Party, uh, and whatever he does so, that reflects very poorly on Mr Albanese and his leadership. And the key question in the interest of transparency that I think all Australians would like to have answered is who runs the Labor Party? Is it the faceless factional men like Mr Somurek, who boast 
that he will be choosing who replaces Mr Andrews when he re retires as Premier? And is, it, is it him who says uh, that Mr Albanese cannot be protected, that uh, he in fact runs the Labor Party? Or does Mr Albanese run the Labor Party? Does a federal parliamentary leader of the Labor Party run the Labor Party? That is the key test today. And the fact that Labor MPs have been willing to tolerate this behaviour for so long in such an open and acknowledged way up until, up until today reveals a lot about them and their commitment to transparency. Uh, so Many speeches will be given in the Senate this morning about, the, about transparency. Uh, any speech which does not deal with this core issue on the front of everyone's mind today on the matter of transparency I think reflects on the contributions of those that are making them. Uh, turning now uh, to the bill, uh, as I understand it, the purpose of the opposition. And I thank you for the interjection, Senator McCarthy. You weren't in the chamber previously uh, when your colleagues were making contributions to this debate. Senator O'Neill oh, gave there. a very long speech uh, in which I'm not sure she even referred to the bill on, it, on any occasion, uh, certainly not any provisions of the bill or any detail of the bill. Uh, I, think, I think others were the same. Anyway, I, I'll, I'll turn to the bill now, and I promise in the six minutes and 53 seconds I have remaining I'll talk more about the bill than any Labor senator has so far in this debate. Maybe others will rise to the challenge as they come to speak next. But as I understand it, the purpose of the opposition's bill is to amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013, otherwise known as the PGPA Act, uh, to increase transparency in government operations relating specifically to acts of grace payments and waivers of debts. I am advised that it would require the Department of Finance to include in its annual report details of decisions made under that Act to authorise act of grace payments or to waive debts owed to the Commonwealth. Uh, I note that, in recognition of the privacy and confidentiality concerns, the bill only seeks that the total number of matters authorised and the total value of those authorisations be disclosed. The act of grace and waiver of debt powers exists under the PGPA Act to enable the consideration of and resolution of matters that fall outside the usual legislative frameworks. They are intended to be exercised only as a last resort, but they are important powers as they provide the flexibility for the Commonwealth to deal quickly and effectively with issues where special circumstances arise. The government does not use these powers lightly. But they are a necessary capability to respond to fast-moving events where existing legislation may not be able to be used. For example, these powers were an important part of the government's response to COVID-19, enabling the waiver of annual levies in the fishing industry and the waiver of Commonwealth Register of Institutions and Courses for Overseas Students uh, levy for the education sector to help support these sectors in ch this challenging time. In considering this bill, it's important to note that there, are already robust, there is already a robust system in place for the exercise of these powers. The Department of Finance consults broadly and confidentially with the applicants and the impacted Commonwealth agencies to ensure that decision makers have all the relevant information in considering each claim. Further, the consideration of the exercise of these powers for amounts over $500,000 can only occur after an advisory committee compromising relevant official, public officials with knowledge of both the process and also the policy issue has been established and has provided advice to the Minister for Finance or to the Assistant Minister for Finance. Uh, there is, of course, merit uh, in disclosure of some data where individual payments will not be identifiable. Indeed, the Minister for Finance has reported some aggregate data in his answers to questions on notice, and of course the Senate estimates process provides a very important uh, oversight to powers exercised like these by ministers, and it's a very welcome part of this Senate. And I note uh, the, the 50th anniversary of such oversight committees was uh, recently. Uh, now, most recently, the debt waiver data was provided in response to a question from Senator McAllister during the October 2019 uh, Senate estimates, and no doubt in our upcoming uh, Senate estimates in October later this year, senators will have further questions about how this power was exercised, particularly during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and that is an appropriate question to ask. They could also uh, explore this issue through the Senate Select Committee on COVID-19, of which I serve as Deputy Chair, which is conducting an ongoing oversight of all decisions of government and advice to government in this period. Uh, many of these payments are to individuals or small businesses and small organisations, and sometimes the value of the that payment can in fact pertain to sensitive issues such as the value of lost income. Uh, however, amending the PGPA Act as proposed by this bill to mandate disclosure in finances annual reports is an unnecessary and inflexible expansion of the PGPA Act in the view of the government. The normal approach is for annual report requirements to consist of fixed requirements that do not change from year to year. 
That model for reporting is, would be too rigid for discretionary payment data, where some years can yield few discretionary payments and, risk, and a risk therefore could arise uh, that the value of an individual payment could be deduced. Uh, there's also an issue here of appropriate, appropriate consultation. Uh, ordinarily, the annual reporting requirements are not changed without consultation with the Joint Committee on Public Accounts uh, and Audit. If the JCPAA had been consulted, they might have suggested that the intent of this bill could be better addressed through an amendment to the PJPA uh, annual reporting rule or through uh, direction from the Finance Minister to his department, uh, taking into account the risks of disclosure and amending the presentation of the data uh, in a sensitive way uh, to reduce that risk. Requests for act of grace payments or waiver of debts are made on the basis of utmost privacy and confidentiality, as is appropriate. Uh, this bill, though, could create a risk that, in those years where there are a small number of matters authorised, as I said earlier, rigid reporting as envisaged by the bill could, could serve to identify a particular claimant uh, and therefore breach their privacy. There are no safeguards in the proposed bill to protect against this possibility. Rather than the, propose, the approach that is proposed in this bill, it is preferable that the government releases data in a way that ensures there is no inadvertent disclosures uh, that may compromise the Commonwealth's commitment to treat claims in confidence. Uh, I understand, I am advised, that the Minister for Finance has directed his department to commence disclosure of annual and five-year aggregate data in relation to active grace payments and debt waivers, including in the 2019-20 financial year. Uh, there are sufficient payments, uh, I am advised, in the 2019-20 year that there is not a concern about privacy this year, and I understand this data we made public later in this calendar year on the Finance website and on the Transparency .gov.au website, and no doubt that, that will be able to be pursued uh, in the appropriate way through Senate estimates and other means. Uh, in conclusion, uh, the government believes that this bill is unnecessary and an inflexible expansion of the PGPA Act, and it's not been considered by the JCPAA. Uh, the government, of course, strongly believes in transparency in government operations, and that's why the Finance Minister has made that direction uh, to his department to release the information uh, that the proposed bill is seeking uh, and will be publicised later uh, this year uh, through appropriate public mechanisms. Uh, in closing, though, I just want to return to the point that I made in the opening. Uh, it's all very well and good for Labor senators and others to come into this chamber and extol the virtues of transparency, uh, but we should take uh, them at their word when they seek to choose to exercise that transparency about their own activities, about their own affairs, about uh, their own misdeeds, which we've seen so prominently displayed in the media today. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill of 2019. Um, uh, now, this bill would require amounts that the Commonwealth forgives in the way of debts to the ATO um, or to social security payments to be made public. It would also require act of grace payments made by the government to be made public. So, In that sense, it's a bill that improves transparency, and we welcome it. But it's not exactly a groundbreaking bill, let's be honest. We're spending two and a half hours of the uh, chamber's time talking about these issues when actually we think far broader transparency mechanisms are required. And that's why we had a bill for an independent federal corruption watchdog passed through this Senate late last year that's been laying in abeyance on the House notice paper because this government refuses to bring that bill on. So if we really want transparency and accountability and integrity in this place, well, the government knows what to do, but instead it's had 18 months of saying that it's going to deal with this matter, describing it as imminent. And then, of course, we saw two weeks ago saying, sorry, coronavirus, we can't do anything, everybody just keep, being, uh, keep up with the rorts because we're not going to have an ICAC anytime soon. So, as I say, whilst we welcome um, this bill for disclosure of when the Commonwealth actually does do the right thing and waive some debts or provide active grace payments to people, um, it's, it's a pretty low bar in terms of a transparency reform. Um, there was some concern about the administrative burden, but to be honest, this government's not known for forgiving debts uh, by vulnerable people to the government, so I don't imagine the list is going to be very long. So I don't think there will be much of an administrative burden in complying with this bill should it be passed, um, unless, of course, we're talking about corporate tax avoidance, which the government is indeed very forgiving of. As my colleague Senator Seawitt spoke of in her contribution, the real debt uh, that should have never existed in the first place, let alone now be waived, is robo-debt. 
So it's, um, it's very interesting that this bill is coming on for the debate in that context. As I understand it, this bill would not have affected the hundreds of thousands of people that were issued with a incorrect and illegal robotically issued debt notice that this government presided over, that the Prime Minister gave a very half-hearted, not really fulsome apology in my view um, last week to. Hundreds of thousands of people were affected by that debt scandal. And trigger warning, uh, we know that many people, um, it was a contributing factor, robo debt was a contributing factor to them taking their own lives. It must never happen again. So if we're talking about debt waivers and transparency, we need to be talking about ICAC and we need to be talking about robo debt. Um, it's, of course, why we've pushed for a royal commission into robo-debt. Um, otherwise, we won't get to the bottom of how this happened, how many people it truly damaged and how many people, sadly, who took their lives as a result of the financial um, imperilling and the, the dogged pursuit by debt collectors, um, thanks to this government sicking them onto people. Um, but this bill is a step towards transparency, and we welcome that, because look at the history books, folks. In the last few years, you can't blink without there being another rorts scandal exposed. We had sports rorts one. Hot on its heels, we had sports rorts two. We've now had the community development grants rorts. We've had the export grant rorts. We've had the uh, urban congestion fund rort. And we've had the environmental restoration grants rort. That is six buckets of public money that have been used as pre-election slush funds to bankroll the government of the day to keep government. Absolutely election slush funds. We're up to six now. No doubt they'll keep on being revealed. This government, of course, has delayed its own weak federal corruption watchdog bill because it doesn't want those rorts investigated. It should be embarrassed by them, and I hope it is embarrassed by them. And it's no wonder that their own ICAC bill is being delayed. But of course, their own ICAC bill is so weak it's been criticised for not even being able to stop such rorts. It's a Clayton's ICAC that is just on the never never. That's why later today we'll be moving a concurrence motion to call on the government to bring on the Greens bill for a strong federal corruption watchdog with teeth that we expect will pass the Senate and that will then compel the House to bring on that bill for a vote. Now, we did this late last year, and of course the government ganged up to gag debate on that motion, the effect of which is the bill for a corruption watchdog could not be debated, could not come on for a vote in the House of Representatives. This is a government that has been plagued by scandal, plagued by rorts. It's stopping all attempts to bring on debate for an integrity watchdog. It's delaying its own weak version of an integrity watchdog. And then it's got the cheek to criticise um, this bill and to use the time to debate this bill to simply attack its political opponents. I think the Australian public know full well what's going on here. This is institutionalised corruption. These are slush funds en masse. Um, and sadly, the list of rorts doesn't stop there. We've got a whole series of sagas which are contracts for mate scandals. Uh, we saw the Paladin uh, a uh, grant of a contract to a two-bit shelf company that had no experience running these offshore gulags, which have been known to torture people and send people to their graves, which my colleague Senator McKim um, has long spoken of and raged against. Um, that was the, one of the most uh, egregious examples of contracts for mates that the ANAO has criticised. Still nothing from this government explaining why that company was chosen. Well, of course, the fact that there's a personal connection there is the reason we all know that. Um, you've had the numerous scandals with Minister Taylor, whether it's uh, allegations that he's doctored documents to try to impugn um, the climate credentials of a local council. I mean, dude, haven't you got better things to do? You're a minister, for heaven's sake. Or whether it's uh, trying to get your mates off an environmental law prosecution um, and trying to change the listing of a critically endangered ecosystem so that, whoops, the fact that your brother's company poisoned it won't get him into strife. Um, or whether it's the dodgy water dealings that have plagued Minister Taylor and also um, former Minister Barnaby Joyce. Um, we saw a couple of weeks ago now that a big farmer donor to this government 
got the contract to do the COVID um, uh, vaccination work for aged care organisations. Again, it's contracts for mates, it's election slush funds, and it's special treatment for people with personal connections to this government. And then we come to the COVID Commission, again, a so-called advisory body that's stacked with people who are recommending their own industry's projects, getting paid a pretty penny while doing so, and they don't even have to disclose their conflicts of interests here on that task force, the manufacturing task force in particular. And I asked the government this last week, and you know, Senator Cormany thinks it's fine. Why am I asking about this? Sit down, little girlie, was the short version of what he said. He, he said that he missed Senator De Letale and that I was you know, going a bit far. Well, get used to it, folks. Get used to it, folks. When you are putting your mates um, in charge— Senator, Senator Waters. Yeah. I would ask um, uh, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, that the senator withdraw uh, what she has uh, ascribed to Senator Cormann saying he did not say that. And I would ask that you ask her to withdraw that, please. Senator Waters. Yes, thanks, Deputy President. I, I withdraw if the interpretation was that that's what he said. What I thought I said and what I meant to say was that's how I interpreted what he said. I acknowledge he did not say those words, but I also— Oh, uh, well, I'll take order. that interjection from that, um, that great bastion of morals there that uh, hails from my state of Queensland. I'll, I'll take— I'll take that interjection, but I don't have a glass jaw, so I don't mind if you don't withdraw that. I can actually handle it. Um, <laughs> Senator Waters, could you just please take a seat for a oh. minute? Thank you, Senator Waters. Yeah, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. Look, we'll get back to the matter at hand, which was, um, sadly, the uh, very self-interested appointments made to the COVID Commission, a bunch of big business folk who are all steeped in the gas industry, which of course we all know is a dirty fossil fuel um, that will simply delay the transition to genuinely clean, cheap, renewable energy, which will create more jobs and help us address the climate crisis. Um, but this government thinks that actually, no, they don't even need to disclose their conflicts of interest. They are trusted to manage those conflicts. And we saw that the actual COVID commissioners, essentially the umbrella body under which those task force members sit, of those uh, six COVID commissioners, five of them don't want to put in the public domain what their personal financial interests are. So once again, there is a complete lack of transparency by this government. The government's not going to require those conflicts of interest to be disclosed. It's certainly not going to do anything to manage them. It trusts those people to manage those conflicts. Well, we don't. The Australian public doesn't. And this is exactly why your government has no credibility on integrity or transparency matters. I've listed the six pre-election slush funds that have been rorted to help this government retain government. I've listed many of the contracts for mates scandals that have been exposed, and we now see the favours for donors with the appointments of uh, gas industry luminaries to an advisory body that then recommends investment in gas in a climate crisis when farmers are desperate uh, to have some security of water supply um, and when the Great Artesian Basin is at stake. So, um, we're debating a bill for transparency today, which the Greens welcome and we support. But what we really need to be doing is bringing forward a vote on the Greens bill for a federal corruption watchdog, which passed this Senate. Thank you to all of those folk in here that supported that bill, not the government, of course. Um, but we need the House to actually vote on that, because it is long past time that this level of government had a corruption watchdog. It's going to be very busy. There's an awful lot for it to look at. And notions that somehow it's not necessary are just ridiculous. This government's own version is so weak that it's been roundly criticised by anyone that knows anything about integrity or this, this subject matter. It's a fig leaf of a body, and it's been delayed yet again after being described as imminent more than a year ago. So we welcome the moves for increased transparency, but let's do the job properly and let's actually finally have this government held to account for the litany of rorts, of contracts for mates, of appointments of donors to advisory positions, 
of policy for donation, which is bringing this government and this institution into disrepute. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill provides for what may seem like a small step, but in terms of government accountability and transparency, it is important. Others have spoken about the general significance of what this bill would achieve in reporting publicly how many debt waivers have been made and the amount of debt that has been waived. Debt waivers obviously have a significant impact on an individual, and quite rightly, the waiver of debt mechanism is generally an avenue of last resort and is used only where there is no other viable avenue to provide redress. In general, this assistance is usually granted where it's considered the Commonwealth has a moral responsibility to provide assistance rather than a legal responsibility. Debts are usually waived where recovery would cause ongoing financial hardship by, for example, leaving the person unable to provide food, accommodation, clothing, medical treatment, education or other necessities for the person or their family. A lot has been written and said about the economic circumstances in the Northern Territory, where we have a small, open economy heavily reliant on resources and historically driven by major projects. This makes economic cycles more pronounced than in other jurisdictions in Australia. Our reliance on the tourism sector makes us even more vulnerable, particularly regarding the impacts of the pandemic on this sector. Consideration of waiving the NT's debt to the Commonwealth would have a significant effect, especially if we look at the issue of housing. And I raise this issue in particular as, under the PGPA Act, the Finance Minister has the ability to extinguish debts owed to the Commonwealth, meaning the debts are completely forgiven and cannot be recovered. These debts relate to non-corporate Commonwealth entities, such as the Australian Tax Office or Centrelink Services Australia and Departments of State, but not the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation or the Commonwealth Superannuation Corporation, as examples. It was discovered in the Senate estimates process that the waiver of the Tasmanian housing debt of $157 million was performed under the debt waiver provisions of the PGPA Act. It was also discovered that there is no mechanism by which how many waivers of debt or what amount of debt has been waived is reported to the public. There are five states and territories seeking waivers from the Commonwealth for housing-related loans. And one of these is the Northern Territory, who is seeking the waiver of $190.5 million in housing-related debt. This is hugely significant for the Northern Territory, Madam Acting Deputy President. Not only is this a significant amount of money, but consider the impact putting this amount of money into social and community housing provision in the NT rather than going into the pockets of the Commonwealth. Housing is a key determinant of health, education and safety. Poor housing and poor housing circumstances negatively affect the physical and mental health and well-being of Indigenous people. Kids need a safe and stable home in which to study, and parents struggle to secure and hold down a job without one. Housing is equally a key determinant of economic development. Given the scale of homelessness amongst First Nations people in particular, without seriously addressing the issue of housing, means we will struggle to reach any of the closing the gap targets, whatever they may end up being. Indigenous people make up 3 per cent of Australia's population, but 20 per cent of the nation's homelessness. We are 2.3 times more likely to experience rental stress and seven times more likely to live in overcrowded conditions than other Australians. And the impacts are particularly felt by young people. About a quarter of First Nations people accessing homelessness services with children under 10 and more than half are under 25. Housing up to this point has not been a closing the gap target, but it must be if we are to, if we are to have any chance of finally closing the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians on all the other targets for life expectancy, child mortality, education and jobs. This has always been a glaring omission and, in my view, has contributed to the failures in closing the gap. I certainly do look forward to hearing more about the refreshed targets in the new Closing the Gap partnership 
I do note the comment last week from the Coalition of Peaks, Pat Turner, who said, and I quote, we want to push the percentages of achievement much higher, but we are in a consensus decision-making process with governments. What the targets will reflect is what the governments themselves are prepared to commit to. This does sound like some warning bells about whether the government and its agencies have been really listening to what the experts on the Council of Peaks have been telling them about the priorities of First Nations people. And I certainly look forward to learning more about the refreshed targets and the process that has gone into these decisions and, importantly, the commitments that will need to be made to ensure the new targets are a reality. I look forward in particular to learning what targets have been thrashed out around housing, the building block that progress will rest on. The housing need in the Northern Territory is acute. The NT receives approximately $18.8 million in Commonwealth funding, or 1.3 per cent of total funding, but has 12 times the national rate of homelessness. With twice the level of unmet client demand compared to other states, the current level of funding for specialist providers of homelessness ser services is inadequate. The NT needs to receive funding for homelessness services based on need, not on a per capita basis. The demand for specialist homelessness services is rapidly increasing and is expected to increase further within, with the uh, impact of the pandemic. 81 per cent of the NT's homeless persons live in severely overcrowded housing. First Nations people represent 88 per cent of all homeless Territorians. It's estimated that a further 2,750 new homes need to be built in remote NT by 2028 to reduce severe overcrowding. Further Commonwealth and Territory government investment in remote housing is essential in order to eliminate overcrowding in these communities. I do, though, want to acknowledge the contribution the Commonwealth is making in partnership with the Northern Territory Government to try and address some of this shortfall. The commitment of $550 million from the Commonwealth, matching the NT's contribution of $550 million, is significant, and we'll see a $1.1 billion investment into housing in the NT over the next 10 years. But the reality is even this is not enough to address the severe shortage and disadvantage. There is a desperate need for further investments into social and community housing, into homeless services and crisis accommodation. There is a significant deficit in available public housing stock, much of which is ageing and in poor condition, resulting in unacceptably high wait times for eligible applicants. The Northern Territory Government has acknowledged that public housing wait times and growing numbers of applicants on the wait list are very challenging. Ongoing and additional investment in public housing is needed. Recognising other options also need to be explored, including social head leasing, stock transfers, growth of the community housing provider sector. We need a national housing strategy to address Australia's broken public housing system and ensure there is sufficient supply of social and affordable housing to meet growing demand. We need to address the issue of affordable housing shortages. There is insufficient affordable housing available for low to moderate income earners struggling to pay market rent. It's estimated that one in four low to moderate income Territorians are in rental stress, where more than 30 per cent of their income is allocated to rent. The growth of the community housing sector and options for access to private rental should be encouraged. Further incentives that bridge the gap to market rent are necessary in order to ensure the supply of new affordable housing. Amongst other things, a Commonwealth-led initiative similar to the current National Rental Affordability Scheme is needed. Waiving the Territory's housing debt to the Commonwealth could see an extra $190.5 million invested into social housing, homeless services and affordability programs. It would make a significant difference to the lives of thousands of Territorians and certainly make a real difference in closing the gap and reducing the disadvantage faced by First Nations Australians. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Scott. 
Madam Acting Deputy President, I do in fact rise to speak on the bill, uh, which is the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill. And I note that many of the speakers who have spoken uh, in the debate haven't necessarily spoken in relation to the bill, so I am going to try and do my best uh, to stay to the actual content of the bill. And in terms of making some introductory comments, I just want to place on the record, Madam Acting Deputy President, how important this regime is, how important that there be a regime under which the Commonwealth can waive debts and the Commonwealth can set off debts against other debts and how the government can make act of grace payments. Because one of the things, Madam Acting Deputy President, that I've learned since becoming uh, a senator on 1 July last year is that there are many people out there battling the Commonwealth bureaucracies, uh, doing their best, and sometimes the result is not just. The result is not just. And there are cases where waivers should occur and there should be acts of grace. It's an extremely important part of the fiscal arrangements of the, of the nation that we have this scheme whereby uh, the federal government can exercise its discretion in certain matters and provide justice to people, provide justice to people who uh, genuinely are aggrieved and have every right to be aggrieved where their engagement with the federal government bureaucracies has not led to a just result. So I think that's the context in which this debate should be set up. And uh, I think all of us should uh, bear that in mind as we engage in this debate. Now, I'd like to turn to the particular clauses of the bill, which would provide that the annual report prepared by the department and given to the finance minister under section 46 for a reporting period must include, in relation to authorisations waiving amounts under section 63, the number of such authorisations during the period and the total amount that was waived as a result of those authorisations. And secondly, in relation to authorisations of payments under section 65, which is the uh, payments of grace, grace payments provision, the number of such authorisations during the period and the total amount that was paid as a result of those authorisations. Now, in considering the amendments contained in this bill, I did actually turn my mind to the actual sections in the Act. And a number of things concern me uh, arising from this bill. I actually don't think it necessarily does what it's trying to achieve. And I think some greater care should have gone into the drafting of this bill. And I think it would have been of good assistance if the bill had have gone through a committee process uh, through the JCPAA, of which I'm a member. And I'll go on to the, the role of the JCPAA shortly. So as I said, the first limb of the proposed amendment deals with waivers. But when you actually go to section 63 of the Act, it refers to the waiver or modification, the waiver or modification of the terms and conditions on which an amount owing to the Commonwealth is to be paid. So the actual section of the Act doesn't just deal with a waiver per se, which is, for example, if I owed someone $100, they waived the debt, I would no longer owe them $100. It also includes circumstances where a debt is modified. So that might well be that instead of my owing the person $100, the debt's modified, so I am the $50. That comes within section 63 of the existing legislation, but it isn't covered by this bill. It isn't covered by this bill. Another circumstance might be where the terms and conditions on which I owe that $100 to someone else are modified. The payment time might be modified, the date for payment, the quid pro quo, something given in return could be added as a condition of that payment having been made, but none of that is covered by this clause in the bill as well. Not covered. Not covered. So a yawning gap in terms of what this bill is trying to achieve. There is in the curious matter as to why section 64, dealing with set-off amounts, isn't covered. So can I say to you, Madam Acting Deputy President, a set-off of an amount of $100 million would be of more concern to me than the waiver of an amount of $1,000. But the waiver of the amount of $1,000 is covered by this bill, but the set-off 
of an amount of $100 million wouldn't be covered by the bill under section 64. Wouldn't be covered by the bill. So waiver of 1,000 covered, set off of 100 million, not covered. And there's absolutely no explanation for that. Uh, I've, I've read the explanatory statement. I've read uh, the remarks of uh, Senator Gallagher when she introduced the bill, and I can find no explanation of that whatsoever. So another yawning gap in terms of, uh, in terms of this bill. It doesn't cover modification of debts, doesn't cover terms and conditions varied with respect to debts, and doesn't cover the set-off of amounts, where amounts are owed between parties and one amount is set off against another. None of that's covered by this bill, which is calling for greater transparency. And that's disappointing. And if, if this bill had been referred, to the JCPAA, I would have raised those matters as a member of that committee, and I would have teased out those issues. But I wasn't given that opportunity, so I'm just here to raise those issues, those flaws with this bill, in the context of this debate. Whereas, if it had been raised through the committee in good faith, and it would have been in good faith, I would have raised those concerns. But instead, the committee process has been denied that opportunity to improve this bill and to make it workable, and that's disappointing. It's disappointing. I would, uh, I would seek that uh, Senator Gallagher would refer such bills as this to the committee, and she might see that the committee process can indeed some, add some value to these pieces of legislation. The second uh, point I'd like to make, Madam Acting Deputy President, is relation to this allegation of transparency. And when this bill was first introduced. I was curious as to what the concern was. What was the mischief? What, were, what was the opposition trying to achieve? What was the private member, the senator, trying to achieve through introduction of this bill? And then, uh, in the remarks we heard earlier this morning, the senator referred to the waiver of the Tasmanian housing-related debt to the Commonwealth. Now, is that a transparency issue, Madam Acting Deputy President? Because I've got here before me a media release dated 8 September 2019, which is entitled Morrison Government to Waive Tasmania's Housing Debt to Commonwealth. The Australian Government is, and I'll read, read from the announcement, the Australian Government is continuing to address housing affordability and homelessness concerns by today agreeing to waive Tasmania's housing related debt to the Commonwealth. Now this isn't a media release. You didn't have to go down any rabbit warren to find that this occurred. This is on 8 September. 2019. And my friend Senator McAllister raised her questions on notice in relation to the finance portfolio, where she raised questions in relation to the number of waivers and the amounts that had been waived with respect to these debts on the 22nd of October. 22nd of October, the questions on notice occurred, but the media release from the government was on 8 September 2019. So it was actually publicly announced one and a half months before the question on notice was made. And months, I should say, months and months before it would have been re released through an annual report. Months and months and months before it would have been released through an annual report. So where is the transparency issue in this? And should I also say, so also place on the record, I'll continue reading from the media release. The Morrison and Hodgman governments have worked hard, hand in hand, to support the growth of ambitions of Tasmania. Waiving this loan will support the Tasmanian government's efforts to reduce homelessness. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what we should be trying to achieve here? Increase access to social housing and improve housing supply across the state. Isn't that a good thing? Isn't that what we're trying to achieve here? So what is the problem? What is the problem that this bill is seeking? in a very amateurish way to try and address. I can't see it. Let's go to the question on notice and the answers given to my friend Senator McAllister. And I was actually sitting on this committee when these questions were put on notice. And I always listen very carefully to any contribution Senator McAllister makes on a committee, because I do value her insight and intelligence. And she asked a question with respect to the number of debt waivers that have been granted. Uh, and the total val dollar value, and she also asks a particular question with respect to 2019 to 20 financial year to, date, to date. And she received the response from the minister on the 13th of January, to, from the department on 13 January 2020, 
Over the period 1 July 2014 to 30 June 2019, there have been 723 decisions by the Finance Portfolio Ministers or Delegate to waive debts with a total value of $159.5 million. Now, under my arithmetic, that means each amount was for an average amount of $220,000. So that was over the period of those five years. Full disclosure. And then in answer two, for the 2019 to 20 financial year to date, there have been 26 debt waiver decisions by the Finance Portfolio Ministers or Delegate with a total value of $158.6 million. Now we know, and I knew when this question was asked, and I knew, as the Australian public knew when these questions were answered from the press release on 8 September 2019 that part of that $158.6 million, referred to as up to that point in time, the amount of debts waived, $157.6 million was in relation to the Tasmanian debt, which meant the other 25 matters amounted to the, prince, to the princely sums of $40,000 each. $40,000 each. That's it. Now, can I say to those who've been making the point that well, we can disclose this in a way which doesn't um, reveal the identity of those who received uh, the waiver, etc. Can I tell you, I don't think that's transparent enough. I don't think you're being transparent enough. Let me tell you why. Under your own scheme as you proposed it, if nothing else had been disclosed, you wouldn't have known that under, under, in this $158.6 million, a total of $157.6 million went to one party. Went to one party. So someone just looking at that general statement might well say, oh, so there's 26 debt waivers with an average of $220,000 each, when in fact there was one debt waiver of $157.6 million and the other 25 were on average $40,000. One for 157.6, and the others on average 40,000. It just shows. It just shows why matters such as this should be going through a committee process, so they can be carefully considered, instead of being putting, put up in a way which hasn't taken into account all the ways in which the uh, matter should be considered in terms of reporting. Because if you just reported that bland statement on an aggregate basis. You would have had no insight into the fact that over 99 per cent of that waiver was in relation to one debt. One debt, 99 per cent. But, Madam Acting Deputy President, of course, as I said earlier, the government had already made the announcement on 8 September. It was already public. It was in the public domain. How more transparent can you be than that? How more transparent can you be than that? Would those sitting opposite have liked the government to sit on that information and wait until the annual report so many months after? Absolutely not. I think it was entirely appropriate that the matter be dealt with in a media release the way it was and an announcement made to the public as soon as possible. I'd like to make some comments in relation to the robo-debt issue, and I'd simply say that on the basis, on the basis of what has occurred, the issue with respect to robo-debt, which has impacted tens of thousands of Australians, simply has not been dealt with under the waiver and, and grace period legislation. It hasn't come under the terms of that legislation. As all senators here would know, a class action was launched and the uh, litigation involved thousands, thousands of recipients. And in response to the uh, claims which had been made, the government is in the process of making refunds to 190,000 Australians, and so be it. So be it. But it doesn't come under these bills, and I wouldn't have expected anyone here would have wanted those 190,000 Australians to have to go through the process contained under Section 63 or Section 65 of the of the legislation which this bill seeks to amend. So again, why are you? Why is the issue of the robot debt being raised in the context of that bill? If you've got hundreds and hundreds of people affected by a policy decision, the last thing you want to do is to force every single one of them to go under the provisions of this legislation. 
So with that, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll cease my contribution to the debate and just, just ask senators to reflect on the usefulness of the committee process. Uh, thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this bill seeks to increase transparency and accountability of government decisions by amending the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act to require the Department of Finance to publish details relating to waivers of debt and acts of grace payments in its annual report. I want to talk about two aspects of this bill. Firstly, the need to increase transparency and accountability of government decision making. Uh, and spending, and secondly, in the context of the uh, housing debt that was waived by the Commonwealth uh, for Tasmania, the possibility of waiving, waiving similar debts for other states to improve social and Indigenous housing outcomes, particularly in my home state of Queensland. Senators will be aware that under Division 7 of Part 24 of the PGP Act, the Finance Minister has the ability to extinguish debts owed to the Commonwealth, meaning that debts are completely forgiven and um, cannot be recovered. And under the same division, the Minister has the ability to make acts of grace payments to a person if they consider it appropriate to do so because of special circumstances. These debts relate to non-corporate Commonwealth entities, such as the Australian Tax Office or Centrelink and Departments of State. And right now, waivers of debts and act of grace payments are not publicly reported, and there is no significant no requirement for them to be um, uh, made public in, in any um, any way, uh, such as um, how much has been made or um, what the amounts involved. So. As senators would be well aware, in recent times a pretty significant debt waiver was made, which made headlines when the government did a deal with um, uh, Senator Lambie to waive Tasmania's historical housing debt, the substance of which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so this private senator's bill introduced by Senator Gallagher seeks to provide more transparency and accountability when such waivers of debts are made. And as Senator Gallagher said in her second reading speech, in the interests of uh, government accountability and transparency, rectifying this lack of publication is a small but important step. It is important to note that the amendments to this bill do not and will not require publication of any personal or sensitive information about any individual or organisation who receives a debt or an act of grace payment. I think that's a very significant and important uh, point to make that uh, the requirement to make this information public will not require the publication of any personal sensitive information, and that's an important uh, step to take. The accountability of the executive and the transparency of its decisions is fundamental to our system of government. In particular, when decisions of the executive relate to financial matters, there should be increased levels of transparency that not only allow parliament to hold the executive to account for decisions, but to allow the public to know what decisions are being made and why. An increased lack of transparency and accountability has sadly been a feature of the Liberal National Government, and the cumulative effect of this increased secrecy and lack of accountability should raise alarm bells in our community. Some previous examples come to mind, including the backlog of FOI requests, refusing to answer questions during estimates, instead putting questions on notice repeatedly, refusing to comment on on-water matters, shifting $500 million, $500 million to the Great Barrier Reef Marine Foundation so the decisions and spending of that fund and that money can no longer be scrutinised through estimates or other methods. And the Prime Minister dismissing genuine questions from journalists as Canberra bubble or gossip. But most recently, as the Senate would know, the sports rorts debacle has shown that the government is willing to undermine the important values of transparency in government to avoid embarrassment. The failure to release the Gaetchen's report, despite relying on it to claim that there was no biased decision making during the notorious sports rort scheme, shows a new level of secrecy and deception. But as I foreshadowed, the particular waiver of debt and the details of that debt, which sparked inquiries leading to this bill, is also of interest to me as a Queenslander, because we need more social housing in Queensland, and we need it now. So it was curious to me when, in September 2019, the Morrison government waived one 
um, $157.6 million owed to the Commonwealth by the Tasmanian government. The debt was accumulated to pay for the construction of public housing, housing between 1956 and 1989. At the time, the minister said, Tasmanian government demonstrated unique challenges relating to housing affordability. It committed to statewide planning and zoning reform to support housing supply targets consistent with economic and population growth projections. The minister also acknowledged various members of the government for their advocacy and Senator Jackie Lambie for these significant reforms. And as we all know, uh, the the subtext of that um, ministerial um, media release um, was that a deal was done to guarantee the passage of the government's tax cuts. Now, I also understand the social housing challenges facing Tasmania, although I'm a Queensland senator. Um, I certainly do not begrudge um, Senator Lambie for securing that deal and that debt waiver. However, Queensland is, uh, and particularly far north Queensland, also has unique challenges relating to housing. And it is time for the government to consider that historic housing debt and the possibility of waiving that debt for Queensland. Answers to questions on notice show that as of the 1st of July 2019, Queensland Historic's housing debt was uh, $278.5 million. State Housing Minister Mick de Brenny said at the time, if the Morrison government forgave that historic debt to Queenslanders, the Palaszczuk government could deliver another 957 homes for vulnerable Queenslanders, creating 919 housing construction jobs in the process. We, he said, um, Mr De Brenny went on to say, we welcome the Prime Minister's willingness to potentially deliver more social housing to Tasmania, but it's galling that once again, it's part of a last minute backroom deal. 957 homes would go a long way in regional Queensland. Last year, I attended a Homelessness Week uh, seminar where Dr Kathleen Flanagan from the University of Tasmania was the keynote speaker. And she discussed the Tasmanian housing uh, crisis and compared it with the Cairns housing market as well. It was significant to note that there are some similarities and, some, and both communities are in acute need of more social housing. The current wait list for social housing in Cairns is over 2,000 people. On top of this wait list, the Federal Electorate of Leichhardt last year made a list of areas experiencing the highest rental stress in the state. According to a survey, survey by the University of New South Wales, 29% of tenants in Cairns are experiencing rental stress. This percentage equates to almost 8,000 households. Queensland had eight of the 20 electorates in the country with the highest proportion of tenants in rental stress. 28 of the 20 top electorates. And yet, from the federal government, there's no support, no plan, just a tired refrain about it being the state government's problem. It always surprises me when you hear that, especially in this place, because well, there's 29 members of the government who are from Queensland, and they want Queenslanders to believe that when they come down here, their hands are tied. Where's their press release? Where's their acknowledgement of their advocacy? Why aren't they advocating for something to be done about these levels of rental stress or the social housing backlog? At least waive the debt. Why aren't they calling for that? The top 10 electorates experiencing rental stress in Queensland are in coalition held seats. But what are they doing about it? I've got the list here. The top 10 electorates in Queensland, Hinkler, Moncrief, Longman, Wide Bay, McPherson, Fisher, Fadden, Fairfax, Ford and Wright. That's, that's 10 members of the government who know that their electorate is right now experiencing extreme levels of rental stress. In Moncrief, rental stress is 40% 40, 40 of the electorate of renters in the electorate are experiencing rental stress. That's 10,000 households. In Hinkler, 41% of rental 
renters are experiencing rental stress. For a regional area, that is a big number. And yet, with all their numbers and all their might and all their bravado, those members of the government are doing nothing to address that rental stress or our need for social housing. There's 29 of them, and yet they're so impotent they can't get this one thing done. So what is the point of having them here? The government had an opportunity to do something about social housing when they announced the Home Builder Scheme a few weeks ago, but the announcement falls a long way short of what is needed to prevent massive job losses in the building industry. And it also does nothing to fix our social housing problem. It is incredibly disappointing that the Morrison government could not fund a housing construction um, program that included one cent for social housing. Home Builder will not build a single home for people who need them the most. Mums and kids fleeing domestic violence, veterans sleeping in parks or essential workers. No wonder members of the government, of the, of the government called the policy a dud. Our country lacks an adequate social housing and that is a disgrace. It impacts the health and safety of our community and the strength of our economy. Building affordable housing and social housing also creates jobs, and as we know, we are in desperate need of them right now. This crisis has also shown us how important it is for the good of our country, for every Australian to have a good home. Not just to isolate in during a pandemic, but to keep safe during the recovery. We're about to face an economic cliff when stimulus is pulled back when bank payments begin again and when the flow and effects of job losses start to impact spending and savings. We need to do something about housing affordability, but this government once again has put its head in the sand. In addition to social housing, Queensland is in desperate need of more housing for Indigenous communities and uh, waiving the housing debt owed by Queensland to the Commonwealth would go a long way to fixing this problem. As many people in this chamber know, the communities in Far North Queensland, our Indigenous communities in the Torres Strait have been isolated in ways and have had restrictions in place that we will never have the um, we will never fathom how difficult those restrictions have been. And one of the main reasons and one of the issues why it was so important to isolate and restrict access to the, those communities is because of the very poor health and housing outcomes of those communities. This should be a huge wake-up call to this government that it is time to get Indigenous housing right. It is not time to push it off into the never-never. If we have a community that needs to be cut off and isolated so severely because of the health and housing outcomes, that should ring alarm bells for this government. But unfortunately, the track record on Indigenous housing has been woeful. In Queensland last year, the federal government walked away from Napari. They walked away from an ongoing housing agreement and instead said that they would invest a one-off payment to councils in the area to build social housing. Now, those councils want that money and they're supportive of getting that, that funding, but they also know that it's not going to build all of the houses that they need. In the Torres Strait, there's a seven-year wait list for housing. They will be building houses and they will not get through that seven-year wait list with a one-off payment. What we need is ongoing funding. The Napari program wasn't perfect, but the government's own review of it in 2017 found it was making good progress on overcrowding. In Queensland, the program built 1,114 new dwellings and refurbished a further 1,490, and that's what we need at this moment. At the moment, all we've got is $5 million of a $105 million program that has been or will be delivered soon for funding that was uh, promised over a year ago now. And you've got people in communities who have been cut off. How much longer do they have to wait? When will this government understand that housing is a fundamental right and it is a responsibility for them to get it right? 
This bill is about transparency and accountability. And what we do not want to happen during this crisis is for the government, governance or public accountability to be pushed aside. But we also need to use this crisis as an opportunity to recognise and fix the very grave problems with social housing and Indigenous housing in our country. Because if not now, when will we do it? Thank you, Senator Green. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too rise to speak on this bill, which will amend the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013 to make public the number and dollar amounts of grace, acts of grace payments and waiver of debts. Now, what we have here is another grand gesture by those opposite to create optics that they have the monopoly on the idea of good government. And yet again, we have another example of something that they've put forward, which may look quite reasonable on the face of it, but when you peel back a few layers, you discover exactly what it is, and that is that it's just a facade. It's nothing more than just a set on a movie uh, sound stage. Uh, if you go up to it, you'll see that it's got a thin veneer and really has no substance to it and wouldn't really stand up to any serious uh, um, scrutiny. This bill uh, was thought up and drafted without the appropriate consultation. It just seems like another one of their back-of-the-envelope kind of ideas. Now, as a member of the Joint Standing Committee on Public Accounts and Audit, the committee responsible for the oversight of these matters, one would expect that this would have been raised in some forum, uh, socialised uh, and consulted uh, with that committee, but sadly it wasn't. And I think there's a very clear reason for that, because had that been done, those opposite would have discovered that, in fact, this bill is not required. Uh, if the JCPAA had been consulted, they might have suggested that the intent of this bill could be better addressed through an amendment to the PGPA annual reporting rule or through a direction from the finance minister to his department to make this information available, while taking into account the risk of disclosure and amending the presentation of the data to reduce that risk. But sadly, those opposite did not consult on this, and I think this alone has demonstrated how high this bill actually really is on their list of priorities. The fact remains that we already have robust accountability and transparency procedures in place and forums where these payments can be explored, uh, as we do, in fact, for the whole of government. That's demonstrated both through the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit and, importantly, through the estimates process. Now, without going down the path of detailing the role of the parliament, and its committees, because we'd expect that everyone in this place would in fact know what that's all about. Uh, there are mechanisms which exist that can, that can examine these kind of issues in detail, and they are there already. If there is a payment or waiver which we, and I mean any of us here in this place, uh, believe warrants particular attention or scrutiny, then we can already deal with that. We have inquiries, estimates and questions. And these are all important accountability measures in our democratic tradition. Indeed, in certain cases, the government also make public the details of debts waived uh, to the Commonwealth and opening these decisions up to broader scrutiny. Recent challenges have demonstrated where this is the case. As a senator for Western Australia, I can point to the fishing industry in particular, where there has been a case recently where certain liabilities to the Commonwealth were waived. But if you then look at some of the minor or individual waivers of payments that would have been covered under this amendment, a number of privacy concerns come to mind. And I note, as a number of other contributors have here in this debate, that in recognition of privacy and confidentiality concerns, the bill only seeks that the total number of matters authorised and the total value of those authorisations be disclosed, but this is not sufficient. 
There is merit in disclosure of some data where individual payments will not be identifiable. Indeed, the Minister for Finance has reported some aggregate data in answers to questions on notice. For example, the debt waiver was provided uh, in response to a question from Senator McAllister during the October 2019 Senate estimates. But many payments are to individuals or small businesses and small business organisations. And sometimes the value of a payment can pertain to sensitive information such as the quantum of lost income. Requests for acts of grace payments or waiver of debts are made on the basis of utmost privacy and confidentiality. This bill creates the risk that in those years where there are a small number of matters authorised, rigid reporting as envisaged by this bill, this proposed bill, could serve to identify a particular claimant. Now, there are no safeguards in the proposed bill to protect against such a possibility. The Act of Grace and Waiver of Debt Powers under the, the PGPA Act is to enable the consideration and resolution of matters that fall outside the usual legislative frameworks. They are provided to be exercised as a last resort but are important powers as they provide the flexibility for the Commonwealth to deal quickly and efficiently with issues where special circumstances arise. And the government does not use these powers lightly, but they are a necessary capability to respond to fast-moving events where existing legislation may not be able to be used. For example, these powers were an important part of the government's response to coronavirus. Levies to the fishing industry, as I touched on earlier, and the waiver of the Commonwealth Register of Institutions and Courses for Overseas Students levy uh, for the education sector is another example to help those in those sectors during challenging times. And in addition to the transparent accountability measures I touched on earlier, the process in which these powers are exercised is equally rigorous. The Department of Finance consults broadly and confidentially with the applicants and the impacted Commonwealth agencies to ensure that decision makers have all of the relevant information in considering each claim. Further, consideration of the exercise of these powers for amounts over $500,000 can only occur after an advisory committee comprising relevant public servants with knowledge of both the process and the policy issue, has established and has provided advice to the Minister for Finance or the Assistant Minister for Finance. Now, amending the PGPA Act as proposed by this bill to mandate disclosure in, finance, in finance's annual reports is an unnecessary and inflexible expansion of the PGPA Act. The normal approach is for annual report requirements to consist of fixed requirements that do not change from year to year. That model for reporting is, however, too rigid for discretionary payment data, where some years can yield few discretionary payments and therefore risks arise that could therefore arise that, would, that the value of an individual payment could be deduced. There is an issue here of an appropriate consultation. Ordinarily, annual reporting requirements are not changed without consultation with the Joint Committee on Public Accounts and Audit. Rather than approach uh, this in this proposed bill, it is preferable that the government releases data in a way that ensures that no inadvertent disclosures that may compromise the Commonwealth's commitment to keep claims uh, in confidence. I understand that the Minister for Finance has directed his department to commence disclosure of annual and five-year aggregate data in relation to the Act of Grace payments and debt waivers, including in the 2019-20 financial year. There are sufficient payments in the 2019-20 year that there is not a concern about privacy in this particular year. And I understand this data will be made public later this calendar year on the finance website and through the transparency.gov.au website. 
The government strongly believes in transparency in government operations, and that is why the Finance Minister has directed his department to release the information the proposed bill is seeking on the Finance website and the transparency.gov.au website later this calendar year. This bill is not required, and as such, I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Ayres, and I remind senators we do have the hard marker at 12.20. Uh, thanks, um, Madam Deputy President. I um, always listen carefully to uh, Senator Sullivan's contributions uh, on these bills. He always makes a thoughtful contribution, uh, and he's always very well prepared. Um, he's, uh, he's dedicating himself assiduously to the task of performing his role as a backbench defender of the government's uh, position, and he's uh, done that again today. He's a thoughtful contributor uh, in our committee system, uh, and he, he plays uh, that role well as well. Um, and sometimes that means that he's passionately defending the government's interests when it comes to a bill that um, that'll really enliven public debate, and sometimes that means he's making a more workmanlike contribution over a bill that's unlikely to be on the front page of tomorrow's Border Morning Mail or the Sydney Morning Herald or, or in fact, any paper except perhaps some obscure uh, government, uh, government gazette, because the bill that's in front of us, of course, is an amendment to the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act. Um, it's the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Amendment Waiver of Debt and Act of Grace Payments Bill 2019, not something that's really likely to breathe uh, excitement and passion uh, into people out there, but it is nonetheless important. And uh, Senator Sullivan's description uh, of the bill and the Labor Party's approach uh, to the amendment as a facade, a veneer conducted with no consultation, a bill that's not really necessary. Uh, well, the truth is someone's got to be paying attention to public accountability in this place. Someone's got to be working on evolving the legal position, evolving the laws to improve public accountability. And during the term of this government, that so often falls to the Labor Party because the government's uh, just not up to it. His first argument, I think, was that there's got to be some other way. Um, it's not a very strong argument, really, um, that the amendment achieves or would achieve if it was supported here. It would achieve what it sets out to achieve, a higher level of transparency uh, and accountability in terms of active grace payments. Uh, secondly, he says, uh, if I can put words in his mouth, that there are profound privacy issues. I, I'm, I'm not persuaded as much as the drafters of the amendment are that there are deep privacy issues here. I think if a decision is made by the Commonwealth to pay an act of grace payment or to do a debt waiver, that there are deep issues of public accountability and transparency that are involved here, and I would lean towards uh, transparency uh, over, the, um, over the rights to privacy of individuals or companies who have received either a debt waiver or an act of grace payment. However, uh, the amendment uh, does deal with that question. There is no proposal here to uh, name the recipients of those payments, to simply record the amount of those payments uh, and to record the number of those payments that are made in the annual report of the Department of Finance, which I'm sure is read uh, very deeply uh, out there. Uh, the original uh, legislation in 2013 was, uh, was developed to merge two existing pieces of legislation that went, to, uh, that went to accountability. It was designed to reduce complexity, increase operational efficiency and provide for clear accountability requirements. Uh, and this bill, this amendment, 
uh, strengthens the original purpose and original intention of the bill. Uh, the, there is a power for the Minister for Finance, circumscribed, as Senator Sullivan correctly pointed out, by the processes set out in the legislation, to waive debts owed to the Commonwealth. Uh, that means debts are no longer payable. There's a hundred thousand dollar threshold below that. Public servants can simply make a decision uh, to waive a debt to the Commonwealth. Above that, above that, there's a requirement uh, for the minister uh, to do that work, him or herself. Uh, the, in terms of active grace payments, uh, where uh, an individual or a uh, company uh, is impacted by a decision of the government or a failure to make a decision, and they've had a loss of earnings as a result of that, it may be, it may be appropriate for the government to make an act of grace payment uh, in those circumstances. Those payments are currently not publicly reported. And there is no requirement for there, there to be any publication of details about how many Act of Grace payments have been made or the amount provided through those payments. That is an impossible proposition, in my view, for the government to defend. And it would be all right if the government came in here with an alternative proposition to the one that's outlined in the amendment, but there is no alternative proposition, and the position uh, that the parliament is left with is with an unsustainable uh, weakness in accountability and transparency terms uh, in the legislation. Uh, these payments are made when there's uh, some inequity that causes hardship, an act of grace in special circumstances for non-government corporate entities who have taken or not taken an act that causes harm, uh, or have legislation or an intention to have legislation that causes economic harm. Um, there, is, uh, there is a very simple requirement in this very straightforward amendment to require the Department of Finance to report in its annual report the number of waivers, the total dollars, the number of active grace payments and their total dollars. It can't infringe privacy. There's no requirement to report on the individuals or the companies. Of course, in recent times, uh, the Senate estimates process it came to light that payments that a, that a debt waiver was provided to the Tasmanian government of $157 million. It's performed with a debt waiver consistent with the Public Governance, Performance and Accountability Amendment Bill uh, Act 2013, there was no requirement to report that decision of immense significance, of immense political and fiscal sig significance in Tasmania. No requirement for that to be reported. And it only came to light in Senate estimates what the mechanism was that the government used to provide debt relief to the Tasmanian government. That is a big public policy call to exempt one state from its uh, obligations uh, in terms of housing-related loans. And there is, there are, when one looks across the Commonwealth, uh, vast, uh, considerable uh, uh, liabilities uh, from the states to the Commonwealth in relation to public housing. New South Wales, as at the middle of last year, owes the Commonwealth $838 million in public housing related loans. The Queensland government, just over $278 million in housing related loans. The Western Australian government, $343 million. The Australian Capital Territory, just over $115 million in total, and the Northern Territory 
with vast housing needs uh, in that state, in particular in remote communities, owes a disproportionately large $190.5 million. Now, the illusion is created whenever the Commonwealth government gets up to talk about uh, housing, public housing and social housing, that somehow uh, every time it makes an announcement it's, uh, it, it creates the idea in the public that these are grants uh, to the states. Well, they are termed grants, but for accounting purposes they are loans. They have concessional rates of interest, uh, but they are loans and they create a long-term obligation uh, for those state governments and I believe create long-term inertia between the Commonwealth and the state governments dealing with the public housing crisis, dealing with the crisis in terms of accommodation for low-income uh, workers, for families uh, on low incomes, uh, a crisis that grows every day. Now, it seems to me that public housing is a total mess uh, in Australia. There is a growing queue, um, a growing queue of families and workers lining up for public housing. Why is it that we've allowed this position to evolve? Well, in 2008, 2009, and then as a response to the global financial crisis, uh, and over the course of the rest of the period of the Labor government, Labor built and refurbished 70,000 social housing dwellings. Uh, the Commonwealth governments, the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison governments, response to this crisis has been to wind back capacity, to fall further behind. In response to the uh, economic crisis that's the result of uh, the government's steps to deal with the public health crisis uh, and COVID-19, uh, the government's only announcement so far has been home builder. Zero in terms of social housing, zero in terms of support for low-income workers and low-income families uh, to build homes, to buy homes, and that sits across the back of a long-term legacy of policy failure in this area. It's been an entire refusal to countenance reform of the taxation arrangements uh, that surround new home construction uh, and renovation of existing homes, no attempt to deal uh, with the taxation arrangements in the real estate market that constrain uh, the building of homes, uh, particularly in our big cities. The government's closed the National Rental Affordability Scheme that provided 38,000 new affordable housing units and was on track to achieve its target of 50,000 new home dwellings. The government scrapped the first Home Saver Account Scheme, which was helping people save for their first home. The government closed its eyes and its ears by abolishing the National Housing Supply Council and the Prime Minister's Council on Homelessness. The government's cut $44 million a year in capital funding from homelessness services. The government defunded Homelessness Australia, National Shelter and the Community Housing Federation of Australia because the government doesn't want to hear the voices of people who can't find a home, doesn't want to hear solutions for homelessness or arguments in favour of increasing the federal and state government's public housing stock. And until 2019, the government failed to appoint a dedicated minister for housing. And the only sign, the only sign of any activity is the home builder scheme. And you could not, if you got the smartest people in Canberra and got them together in a room and, and gave them the remit to design a hopelessly complex scheme, impenetrable to outside observers, that, that has such a narrow base, hard to identify people who fall into 
the category who could actually use the scheme, uh, and a scheme that was so profoundly inequitable. If you ask people to design a scheme that was going to provide zero stimulus to the economy, zero stimulus to the construction industry, I just don't think with even the smartest people in Canberra brought together in the public sector, they could design a scheme as dumb uh, as the home builder scheme patently is. And if we had some sensible transparency and capacity in terms of the arrangements between the Commonwealth and the states that this bill is designed Thank to assist Senator development. Thank you, Senator Your time Thank has you. expired. Senator Watt, you've got a couple of minutes. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I'm aware that um, we're about to hit a, hit a hard marker at 12.20, so I'll just begin my contribution on this bill today. Um, as has been explained by previous speakers, Really, what this bill is about is increasing transparency from the Morrison government, increasing transparency and accountability for very large payments that it has the power to make using public funds. Uh, in the last 12 months, we've seen one example of that. Thank that you, we're... Senator Watt. <laughs> um, the Senate, you'll be in continuation. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Migration Amendment Regulation of Migration Agents Bill 2019 and a Related Bill Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Minister. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Pre President. And I continue with the uh, summing up speech for uh, this bill. The bill reflects the government's deregulation agenda, the commitment to establishing a world-class class migration advice industry and removes the unnecessary administrative burden of dual regulation of these legal practitioners who are already subject to a strict professional regulatory regime. The government recognises that deregulation should not be prioritised over the maintenance of important consumer protections. The Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee stated it is, and I quote, confident that the legal profession in Australia is well regulated and offers effective co consumer protection mechanisms, including for vulnerable consumers, such as those who seek migration assistance." Unquote. The Regulation of Migration Amend Agents Bill also allows the OMARA to refuse an application for registration as a migration agent if the migration agent does not provide further information. This will remedy the current situation where the application will remain open and unfinalised indefinitely while there is a failure by an agent to provide the information sought. The bill will also complement amendments to fees and charges in the Rates of Charge Bill and make other minor amendments. The Rates of Charge Bill ensures that a person who paid the non-commercial application charge in relation to their current period of registration but gives immigration assistance otherwise than on a non-commercial basis is liable to pay an adjusted charge. In summary, Madam Deputy President, we are committed to a strong but practical migration advice industry that works in the best interests of Australia. I believe that the package and the bills deserves the support of all members, and I commend the bills to the chamber. Um, the minister needs to close the debate. Okay, so the question is that the bills be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Okay, uh, ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the noes. Order. There being 35 ayes and 8 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Migration Amendment Regulation of Migra Migration Agents Bill 2019. Migration Agents Registration Application Charge Amendment Rates of Charge Bill 2019. So there is a committee stage. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. I'm in the hands of the Senate. Senator McKim. Probably very soon. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy President. Um, I move the uh, amendments that have been circulated in my name on sheet 89. Five, seven. Are you seeking leave to move them together, Senator McKim? I am. I am is leave granted? Being no objection, leave is granted. Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, look, I'll only speak very briefly uh, to these amendments. I'll, I'll make the point, though, that um, the Productivity Commission, uh, in an annual review of regulatory burdens on business, business and consumer services, uh, recommended that dual regulation should cease, and I acknowledge that's effectively what uh, this bill does. However, the Productivity Commission uh, went on further to recommend that an independent review of the performance of these immigration lawyers and the legal professional complaints handling and disciplinary procedures with respect to their activities should be conducted three years after an exemption becomes effective. So what this amendment um, does is seek to give effect 
to um, that Productivity Commission recommendation. Uh, I don't understand why the government has not included a three-year uh, review, a statutory three-year review in this legislation. It's simply uh, good practice when you make a change uh, of this nature, which has the potential to, uh, to impact significantly on the way that people practising as migration agents are regulated, and more importantly, has the potential to impact significantly on um, clients of people um, uh, who act as migration agents. So, in those circumstances, we think this is a very practical and sensible amendment. Um, the Migration Institute of Australia has argued that the current system and registration of migration, agent, migration agents that currently captures lawyers includes robust complaints mechanisms and codes of conduct, which, when complaints are lodged, set off thorough investigations. This, they further argue, ensures a better quality and qualification of migration agent services. So the review that we're seeking to insert into this legislation will be able to assess after three years whether that was or was not the case, and it will be uh, in everyone's best interests to know uh, whether or not that is in fact the case. And uh, we are moving this uh, for many reasons and on behalf of many people, but most particularly we are moving it on behalf of people who are clients of people acting as migration agents because it is in uh, all of our interests that people receive the very best advice and a statutory three-year review would assist in that aim. Thank you, Senator Kim. I just remind senators that um, we are dealing with the um, amendments as moved by Senator McKim on sheet 8957. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Labor has made it clear from the beginning that this legislation should pass through the parliament quickly. That was a commitment given at the Law Council of Australia Immigration Law Conference earlier this year. I appreciate Senator McKim's amendment calling for a review. However, Labor will not be supporting this amendment. This bill contains measures stemming from the recommendations of the 2014 Independent Review of the Office of the Migration Agents Registration Authority. In fact, Mr Tony Abbott was the Prime Minister when these recommendations were made. The current Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison, was the Immigration Minister who received the review. The Senate has held not one but two inquiries into this bill. The bill was even debated for a short time in December 2018. And then, despite bipartisan support, that's where the legislation stopped. The bill has sat on the Senate notice paper for over 200 days, Madam Deputy President. A simple, straightforward bill which Labor has supported and recommendations that the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government have failed to make law for six long years. Even government senators recommended, and I quote, the Senate pass the bills without delay. After six years, multiple reviews, many sitting weeks and three prime ministers, this bill is finally before the Senate. So let's pass it now. Thank you, Senator Brown. Um, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, the government won't be supporting the amendment. Um, we do not consider it necessary to review the performance of immigration lawyers and, and the legal professional complaints handling and disciplinary procedures after the removal of dual regulation. The 2014 independent review of the OMARA, the Kendall Review, recommended that lawyers be removed from the regulatory scheme that governs migration agents such that they are entirely regulated by their own professional bodies. The Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee report, released in February of 2020, states the committee is confident that the legal profession in Australia is well regulated and offers effective consumer protection mechanisms. The relevant legal, professional and disciplinary bodies and the statutory schemes underpinning them have a broader range of powers to resolve consumer-related issues. This includes penalties outside of the MARA's existing jurisdiction, including financial penalties for improper conduct and recommending compensation for affected clients. Lawyers with practising certificates intending to practise in the migration advice field will be able to access educational offerings to increase their knowledge, as they already do with other complex complex aspects of the legal profession. 
After the commencement of the bill, the policy intention is for the regulation of immigration lawyers to be a matter for the states and territories, and it will be for them to evaluate the performance of immigration lawyers and related matters. The authorities responsible for disciplining Australian legal practitioners in states and territories would be better positioned to conduct any such review as they will have access to information on legal practitioners through their regulation of them, which is not readily available to the Commonwealth. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Chair. Well, uh, how very disappointing it is that um, the major parties uh, are on a unity ticket here and will we'll not support a, a completely uncontentious amendment by the Australian Greens to insert a requirement for a statutory review into this legislation. Um, look, I won't speak at length. I'll just make the point that the people who seek uh, migration advice are often extremely vulnerable people. And migration advice, um, the quality of migration advice, can often impact on um, a person or a family's entire future, including whether or not uh, they can remain in Australia. So, given that circumstance, I think it is the, the Greens believe it is incumbent on um, on this Parliament to ensure that um, the uh, the new regulatory framework, which is cre uh, created by this legislation, is reviewed. I'll make um, the point uh, here by quoting um, a submission by the Migration Institute of Australia to the committee inquiry into this legislation, which reminds us all—and I quote from their submission—that lawyers have been allowed to continue practising by their law societies without conditions attached to their practice, even after being barred by the OMARA for gross misconduct and breaches of fiduciary duties. Well, there it is in black and white, colleagues. OMARA, in some circumstances, has barred lawyers but they've been allowed to continue practising by their law societies without conditions, without conditions uh, attached to their practice. And I'll also uh, quote from a uh, previous submission to an earlier inquiry into the 2017 versions uh, of these bills by the Migration Institute of Australia. Uh, which uh, contained this observation. The removal of lawyers from the regulatory system will result in disastrous unintended consequences for the humanitarian migration sector. It is crucially important that it be protected for both consumers and the large numbers of altruistic lawyers working in this sector. If, remo if removed from the Amara regulatory system, these lawyers will be barred from registrating, registering as migration agents and then be unable to provide migration advice and assistance within these non-legal practices and will need to leave these organisations to seek employment in legal practices if they wish to practice as lawyers. So again, this is a completely uncontroversial uh, amendment proposed by the Australian Greens. It's simply good governance um, and good practice that when changes like these are made, the impacts of those changes be reviewed after a period of time that allows for the changes to be bettered in uh, and, uh, and enough evidence um, uh, to exist that would inform a review. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the amendments as moved by leave together on sheet 8957, standing in the name of the Australian Greens, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendments as moved by Senator McKim by leave on sheet 8957 be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being nine ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just give the whips and the minister a few minutes to get back to their seats before we move to the next stage. <clears throat> so the question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say. So the question is that the bills be agreed without amendments or requests. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Migration Amendment, Regulation of Migration Agents Bill 2019 and a related bill and agreed to them without amendment. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Migration Amendment Regulation of Migration Agents Bill 2019, Migration Agents Registration Application Charge Amendment Rates of Charge Bill 2019. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Crimes Legislation Amendment, Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I want to make clear at the beginning that Labor and I consider that there is nothing more sickening than child sexual abuse. Uh, as a father of two children, I feel that on a personal level, uh, let alone my, the position I might take in politics. Children are the most precious and vulnerable members of our community, and Labor will always support strong and effective laws to protect children from abuse and to punish their abusers. Labor, has, Labor always has and always will fight to protect children here and overseas from exploitation and abuse. Labor is proud of our record under the Keating, Rudd and Gillard governments in this area. To pick up on just a few examples, in 1994, Labor in government introduced world-leading offences targeting Australians who engage in the sexual abuse of children overseas. In 2009, 
Labor in government brought federal, state and territory governments together to implement the National Framework for Protecting Australia's Children, which included a significant funding commitment over four years from the Commonwealth Government. In 2010, Labor in government introduced new child abuse offences and other protection measures. In 2013, Labor in government appointed Australia's first National Children's Commissioner to advocate for the rights of Australia's young people. And of course, in that same year, Labor in government established the Royal Commission into, into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, the first national inquiry of its kind. That commission shone a light on how systems have failed to protect children and made recommendations on how to improve laws, policies and practices to prevent and better respond to child sexual abuse in institutions. I could go on. Despite the occasional efforts of some, not all, but some on the other side to use this issue for base political reasons, my colleagues and I do not question the commitment of the current government to doing what it can to protect children from harm. To the extent there is disagreement, it should only ever be about the means and not the ends. Labor strongly supports the vast majority of the measures in this bill. Labor supports Schedule 1, which would allow the Attorney-General to revoke a parole order or licence in the interests of community safety. Labor supports Schedule 2, which would remove the requirement for a court to approve the admission of a video recording of an interview of a vulnerable adult or child as evidence in chief. Labor supports Schedule 3, which would prohibit the cross-examination of child witnesses and other vulnerable witnesses at committal proceedings. Labor supports Schedule 4, which would create new grooming offences. Labor supports Schedule 5, which would significantly increase the maximum penalties for a range of offences relating to sexual activity with children outside Australia and child sex offences relating to the use of postal or similar services within Australia. Labor supports Schedule 7, which would introduce a presumption against bail for serious Commonwealth child sex offences. Labor supports Schedules 8 and 9, which would require the court to consider a range of additional factors, including aggravating factors, when it comes to sentencing a person who has been convicted of a Commonwealth child sex offence. Labor supports Schedule 10, which would insert a presumption in favour of cumulative sentences for ch Commonwealth child sex offences. Labor supports Schedule 11, which would require offences, uh, offenders convicted of a Commonwealth child sex offence to serve a period of imprisonment that is not suspended other than, ex other than in exceptional circumstances. Labor supports Schedule 12, which would include residential treatment orders as a sentencing alternative for, very, for certain classes of offenders. Labor supports Schedule 13, which would introduce new provisions in relation to the remission and reduction of sentences in circumstances where parole is revoked or a person to whom a parole order relates is sentenced for a further offence. And Labor supports Schedule 14, which would replace the existing definition of child pornography material with a broader definition of child abuse material in various acts, including the Crimes Act 1914. So as you can see, Labor supports many of the measures contained in this bill. The only schedule Labor does not support is Schedule 6, which would introduce mandatory minimum sentences. Labor has a long-standing, well-reasoned and principled opposition to mandatory sentencing. Mandatory sentencing may, may sound tough, but there is nothing tough about sentencing measures that make it more difficult to catch, prosecute and convict child sex offenders. There is nothing tough about measures that do nothing to reduce crime or criminality. And there is nothing tough about sentencing measures that could, in some cases, result in unjust sentences being handed out to teenagers. The evidence is overwhelming. Accused persons are less likely to plead guilty or cooperate with authorities if faced with a mandatory minimum sentence. The Commonwealth's own Attorney-General's Department has previously gone so far as to argue that mandatory minimums should be avoided as they create an incentive for a defendant to fight charges, even where there is little merit in doing so. 
as well as resulting in costly and unnecessary trials and the possibility of acquittal, this forces survivors of child sexual abuse to endure the trauma of having to give evidence in court against offenders who would otherwise have pleaded guilty. This, in turn, could result in fewer survivors of child sexual abuse coming forward at all. As the Uniting Church Synod of Victoria and Tasmania told the Senate Committee, if the perverse outcome of mandatory sentencing is that fewer victims are willing to come forward because the process is going to be made even more onerous for them and more traumatic, then you actually get a reverse outcome to the one you are intending. Even the current government implicitly acknowledges that accused persons are less likely to plead guilty or cooperate with authorities if faced with a mandatory minimum sentence. For that reason, the bill would allow a judge to reduce a mandatory minimum sentence by up to 25 per cent to reflect either an offender's early guilty plea or an offender's cooperation with law enforcement. However, this supposed solution is little more than window dressing, as it does not remove the obvious incentive for a defendant to fight charges even where there is little merit in doing so. All this reduction means is that, in some circumstances, an accused person will be faced with a different mandatory minimum sentence. Instead of seven years, for example, an accused person may instead face a 5.25-year mandatory minimum. The problem remains. It's just a slightly smaller problem. And then you have the problem of juries and judges being less likely to convict guilty people and prosecutors may be less likely to charge alleged criminals if they do not believe the mandatory minimum sentence is justified. That is the evidence of the Law Council of Australia, the Queensland Law Society and a range of other experts who have looked into this issue. These and other reasons for opposing mandatory minimum sentences are set out in greater detail in a report tabled by Labor senators of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee in relation to this bill. I would urge government senators to read it. It is also worth noting that almost every non-government witness who gave evidence to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee in relation to this bill recommended that it proceed without mandatory minimum sentences. Those witnesses included the No More Legal Service, which was established in 2013 to assist people to engage with the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse, the Uniting Church Synod of Victoria and Tasmania, the Jesuit Social Services, the Sexual Assault Support Service, the Law Council of Australia and the Carly Ryan Foundation. So what is the evidence to support the introduction of mandatory sentencing? As Labor senators noted in the Senate report, the government has produced no evidence to support the introduction of mandatory minimum sentences in this bill. Schedule 6, it seems, is not based on the outcome of any review or detailed analysis of sentencing practices. Instead of evidence or detailed analysis, the Attorney General's Department has pointed to high-level and irrelevant statistics about sentencing outcomes generally. That's not good enough. Labor believes that this bill should proceed without mandatory minimum sentences. To that end, we will be moving an amendment to delete set Schedule 6 from the bill. We urge the government to reconsider its position on this matter and support that amendment. In addition to moving an amendment to delete mandatory sentencing from the bill, Labor will also seek to amend the bill to include a comprehensive statutory review of sentencing practices in relation to Commonwealth child sex offences. That was a suggestion made by the Carly Ryan Foundation in its evidence to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, and we think, we think it's a very good one. So just on that point in closing, I see that there are a number of government senators lined up to speak on this bill, including some with a legal background, and I'd encourage them in their contributions to explain to us why they disagree with the evidence of experts to this Senate committee, which says that mandatory minimum sentences in fact make it harder to get convictions and make it less likely that the tough sentences that you say that you're about will actually get imposed. I'll be very interested to hear whether you address that point. I would like to conclude by saying something about resourcing. As Labor senators pointed out in their report, this bill would introduce a range of measures that are likely to create an additional burden on a criminal justice system that is largely administered by state and territory governments. 
The government claims in its explanatory memorandum that the financial impact of the bill will be negligible and will be absorbed by the states and territories. But, like the proposal to introduce mandatory minimum sentences, that statement does not appear to be based on any evidence at all. This is because, prior to introducing this bill, the government had not consulted with a single state or territory government about the potential resourcing implications of the measures contained in this bill. The assertion by the government that the financial impact of the bill will be negligible is not credible. As such, Labor reiterates its call for the government to consult with state and territory governments to ensure that appropriate resourcing is in place to implement the measures proposed in this bill. More generally, on the question of resourcing, it is worth stating the obvious. This parliament can pass the strongest child in the, exploitation laws in the world, but unless our agencies are equipped with the best technology in the world and have an appropriate number of personnel, we will not be in a position to address the scourge of child abuse. It is well known that reports of child sexual abuse imagery on the internet have exponentially increased over the last several years. We need to keep up. Labor calls on the government to conduct a detailed and thorough review of the adequacy of the resourcing that is currently available to authorities across Australia for the detection and apprehension of those who commit crimes against children, especially online. So, in conclusion, Labor will always work constructively, whether in opposition or in government, to put in place the most effective measures to protect children. In that spirit of cooperation, I urge the government to examine the evidence about mandatory sentencing, not just the rhetoric, not the rhetoric that I predict that we will be hearing from government senators during this debate, but look at the evidence about whether mandatory minimum sentencing actually works, whether it actually does lock up people who have been convicted of heinous crimes against children in the way that you claim it, do, it will do. And in particular, I would urge the government to consider the significant potential for mandatory sentences to cause injustice and to actually make it harder to protect children. Labor will be moving amendments to remove the mandatory sentencing provisions and to require a review of sentencing practices in relation to Commonwealth child sex offences. We urge all senators to support those amendments and then to support this bill. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator McKean. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Well, the Australian Greens, of course, uh, supported, uh, are supportive of the bill's stated objectives, and uh, we support most of the provisions in this legislation. The uh, Crimes Legislation Amendment, Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019 Explanatory Memorandum. Uh, states that the bill seeks to better protect the community from the dangers of child sexual abuse by addressing inadequacies in the criminal justice system that result in outcomes that insufficiently punish, deter or rehabilitate offenders. The bill targets all stages of the criminal justice process, from bail and sentencing through to post-imprisonment options. Now, um, Senator Watts has gone through the schedules to this bill in some detail and made it clear that the Australian Labor Party does not support Schedule 6 to this bill. And I can indicate to the Senate that that is also uh, the position of the Australian Greens. It's worth pointing out before I go to that in detail that there were some submissions uh, to the, uh, the committee inquiry into this legislation, which raised um, some technical concerns in various other parts of this bill. And that is why uh, the Greens, uh, in our dissenting report to, uh, to that inquiry, uh, recommended that the bill be withdrawn and redrafted without mandatory minimum sentencing and with consideration of the technical concerns raised in various legal submissions to this inquiry. But in regards to um, mandatory minimum sentencing, unfortunately, the government's continued its evidence-free ideological agenda of attempting to, and in some cases legislating, mandatory minimum sentencing. We will also be moving amendments in the committee stages, which seek to uh, remove Schedule 6 and also insert a requirement for 
a review. But ultimately, the government's position here is ideological because evidence just doesn't support the government's agenda. I mean, there is any amount of research by sentencing experts, by criminologists, by justice experts that has found that mandatory sentencing actually increases the likelihood of recidivism because, uh, for among other reasons, it makes offenders less likely to plead guilty and cooperate with authorities. Uh, for lower level offences, it places offenders uh, in prison where they are in basically a learning environment for crime and associating with other people convicted of similar offences. Uh, it reinforces criminal identity and it fails to address the underlying causes of crime. And to shorthand what all of that uh, evidence taken collectively shows, um, people who commit crimes, including crimes against children, actually don't believe they're going to get caught. So the best way to deter people from committing those crimes is to increase the chances that they will be caught. But because they don't believe they're going to be caught, mandatory minimum sentences do not play into their thought processes such as they are. I mean, this is, this is well known and has been well known for decades. But no, uh, in come the Liberals, as usual, uh, for political purposes and ideological purposes, wanting to go out and say they are tough on crime, when in fact the evidence shows they are anything but. Now, we, uh, we understand the evidence in this context and uh, our amendments are based on that evidence. And like Senator Watt, I'll be very interested to hear what some of the government senators can offer in way of evidence that shows that this kind of approach is actually going to deliver the outcomes that they say it is because all of the available evidence actually shows that it will not. And I'm not after sweeping motherhood statements here from coalition senators. I'm after actual evidence. So we, as I said, submitted a dissenting um, report uh, to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee inquiry into this legislation. In a submission, to that inquiry, the Sexual Assault Support Service wrote this. Whilst we're strongly supportive of reform to strengthen punishments against those who sexually abuse children, we do not feel there is sufficient evidence to suggest that mandatory minimum sentencing is an effective response. Now, of course, the Greens consider sexual offences committed against children to be extremely serious. And we believe serious sex offenders should receive appropriate sentences that are, as submitted to the inquiry by No More, a nationwide free legal service for victims and survivors of child abuse, in line with increasing societal understanding of the seriousness of sexual crimes against children and the enduring impact of such offences on survivors. However, the Greens, along with No More, and most other legal experts and associations do not believe that this includes mandatory minimum sentencing. And one of the reasons we don't believe that, uh, that, that that kind of approach includes mandatory minimum sentencing is that it undermines fundamental rule of law principles and puts at risk enduring public safety outcomes. Sentences should be determined by the courts on the merits of each case. And mandatory minimum sentences fly against that principle. One matter that we uh, will seek some clarity on when we move into the committee stages of uh, this legislation relates to um, the offences of causing a child to engage in sexual activity with another person using a carriage service where the other person is also a child. And uh, I just place um, the minister and his advisers uh, on notice uh, that uh, we would like to understand how 
Uh, in that case, uh, it would intersect with other pieces of legislation. So, um, for clarity, where the alleged perpetrator is um, themselves a minor, um, how would uh, those provisions operate? So, uh, as I've said, we have an amendment um, to remove Schedule 6 from uh, this bill. Um, we won't uh, be opposing this legislation. We would like to see it pass without Schedule 6, but we won't be opposing uh, the legislation because, as I indicated uh, at, the top, at the top of my speech, uh, most of the provisions uh, of this legislation are strongly supported by the Greens. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This is a bill that is close to my heart. As a mother of three girls, I know how terrifying the prospect of child exploitation, starting from the online world, is to parents. As a barrister and a former prosecutor, I have dragged ordinary looking people before the courts to answer charges of the most abhorrent behaviour, acts that make me feel sick to my stomach to recall them. Over and over, I heard defence counsel say that crimes about child exploitation images are victimless crimes. Victimless crimes? It made me so angry because in every picture, there was a real child, a barbaric moment of their short lives captured, circulated among the most repugnant people on the internet for their gratification. And sadly, those image-based offences, well, they're not the worst offences. Child abuse ordered over the internet, the barbarism inflicted to order in exchange for cash upon children anywhere in the world, children abducted and held prisoner for this vile business, or their innocence sold by their parents, the people who are supposed to love and protect them. Grooming of children over the internet for sexual abuse, something too common, too easy, and yet so hard to counter in a time when digital connectivity has never been greater. Indeed, with more children of late being at home and learning and spending their recreation time online, the risk has never been higher. Last year there were 18,000 complaints made in Australia of crimes of this kind. That was double the year before. Authorities are expecting that number to increase again this year. Now, I've worked with and I deeply respect those people who continue to work to protect all of our children from these kinds of nasty pedophiles. The police officers in Task Force Argos, based in Queensland, my home state, are right up there with the best in the world. They work with and are trusted by their international counterparts because these crimes have puzzle pieces spread all over the internet and all over the world. And so, to the Task Force Argos girls and boys, thank you very, very much. To the champions at the Commonwealth DPP, my former employer, for full disclosure, thank you. Your enduring every day of these horrible crimes makes our community safer for all of our children. And at a personal level, I know it often takes a really serious personal toll on each and every one of you. Here's something that victims, parents, investigating officers and prosecutors have to deal with every day, and it's that the penalties that are imposed for these offences are too often too low. In 2018 to 19, 39 per cent of convicted Commonwealth child sex offenders did not spend a single day in prison. Not one. And I think the mums and dads at home would be horrified to hear that statistic. It's important we value the discretion that we give to judges to weigh up the circumstances of the case, but it's not as though the need for 
these penalties to be taken seriously is a message that is new. It's not something anyone could be taken by surprise on. 39 per cent, not a single day in prison, despite the innocence of children stolen. It just does not wash. So, what does this bill do? Well, it does four things, broadly speaking. It introduces new offences related to grooming activities and for websites and online platforms that are designed to host child abuse material. It introduces new aggravated offences for the most horrific types of child abuse engaged in while someone is outside of Australia which again, sadly, is far too common, where an Australian travels to another country and inflicts upon a child who is not Australian usually cruel, inhumane and degrading treatment. The third thing it does is implements a range of presumptions against bail and presumptions for imprisonment, meaning it will be more likely that child sex offenders go to prison, that they stay there for longer and that it is harder for them to get bail. And fi finally, it introduces mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious types of child sex offences and for those who are repeat offenders to address the completely unacceptable situation we face at the moment where 39 per cent of offenders last year did not spend a single day in jail. The bill also recommends um, implements recommendations from the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse to protect vulnerable witnesses by allowing them the automatic right to give evidence via a video recorded interview and prohibiting their cross-examination at committal hearings to minimise the number of times they need to have the horror of their experience revisited upon them. This bill complements a wide range of reforms that have already been brought in by the coalition in this field. We've brought in tough new measures to stop child sex offenders from travelling overseas to abuse children. We've brought in Carly's Law, which targets online predators who use the internet to prepare or plan to sexually abuse children. And we've brought in a range of recommendations arising from the Royal Commission that I mentioned a moment ago and improves the Commonwealth framework for offences relating to child abuse material, overseas child sexual abuse, the use of childlike sex dolls, forced marriage, the failure of people to report child sexual abuse, a very important recommendation arising from um, the Royal Commission, and the failure to protect children from such abuse. Now, we've heard some um, interesting remarks from and those on the Labor side today about how committed they are to this bill, but none of that hides the facts. And the first of those facts is that Labor refused to support this bill when it was last before the Parliament in 2017. So they might talk the talk, but they definitely don't have a record of walking the walk. And as they foreshadow their plans to bring in amendments to this bill today to remove those aspects that are directed at increasing the penalties that are inflicted upon convicted child sex offenders, we see more evidence that they don't quite have the stomach to do what needs to be done today either. Now, they say they don't support mandatory sentencing on principle. And I understand that mandatory sentencing is a very serious measure. But it strikes me that offences don't get all that much more serious than these. And in any event, they're not consistent in their application of their opposition to mandatory sentencing on principle. If they truly opposed mandatory sentencing, why did they support it under the Rudd-Gillard-Rudd -Rudd government to introduce mandatory sentencing for people who engage in people smuggling offences? If people smuggling is serious enough to justify mandatory sentencing, if people smuggling is serious enough to allow the principles of the Labor Party to be set aside, well, why not this? Why not the safety of your children? Why not the safety of my children? I have no qualms in standing up for the measures in this bill any day of the week. 
So let's go to what they are. The first thing that's been said by those on the other side about mandatory sentencing, uh, both in its committee report and before the chamber today, is that there is very little evidence that mandatory sentencing increases public safety. They say that's the reason why they don't support it on principle. Well, if that were the case, they wouldn't have supported mandatory sentencing in the past. It's also not borne out by other circumstances where mandatory sentencing has been effective. And I'll give you an example. When the Western Australian state Liberal government introduced mandatory sentencing uh, provisions for assaults against police and other officers, there was, in just a 12-month period following, almost immediately, let's say, a 28 per cent drop in assaults against police. 28 per cent is an awful lot of difference. Now, that's just one of many examples. But to say that there is zero evidence of the value of this stands very uncomfortably with the Western Australian experience as well as with Labor's past conduct. The other things we can say about this is that the academic opposition that is often proffered for mandatory sentencing um, is that it's insufficiently flexible to provide reasons for people to cooperate with the justice system. What's interesting about that is that the arguments that have been brought about mandatory sentencing to this chamber today have ignored the fact that the way that these mandatory minimum penalties have been structured in this bill aren't the kind of flat mandatory sentencing um, that are analysed in the academic context. In fact, this bill provides for considerable flexibility so that there remain incentives for people to, for instance, plead guilty to their offences. There remain incentives for people to not re-offend because those mandatory elements kick in, for instance, at the second offence. So it really is a shallow analysis to say um, that the academic arguments proffered against mandatory sentencing apply here. So let me explain how it's going to work in this context. Now, if a total sentence is less than three years, or three years or less, it's a subtle distinction there, a court re retains the ability to fully suspend a sentence, but only in very, very limited circumstances, where it is satisfied that there are exceptional circumstances. So the, to, to the extent that those opposites suggest that the removal of flexibility is going to see people refuse to plead guilty because their particular circumstances aren't going to be able to be taken into account, well, there is flexibility in the bill for those um, sentences of three years or less. And for those sentences that are more than three years, well, they're the really, really serious ones. And I'm pretty comfortable with the idea that for very serious child sex offences, a mandatory penalty to be served in custody passes the pub test. Now, the, the real life stories here should be enough to bring tears to the eyes of those opposite, those who are scoffing now at the fact that this stuff is unacceptable. And I'll give you an example. A man named Gordon Chalmers, Brisbane man, was an academic, a teacher who connected well with his students. He's alleged to have committed 931 offences against children, and his tactics were these, as explained by the police officers involved in that case. He pretend he was Justin Bieber online, strike up a conversation with children, girls as young as 13. 157 children fell into his trap. But he wasn't Justin Bieber. He was a polite, bookish, 42-year-old husband and father of two who allegedly sent messages just in the voice of Justin Bieber. He listened. He was a friend to those people online. And then, after isolating the child, turning them to distrust of their parents, he'd ask for a naked selfie 
or a brief pornographic act. He convinced those children to do things they would never have done otherwise, and then once he had that digital image or video in his hand, he would use it to blackmail them into real life abhorrent acts. This isn't in any way unique. This is the reality that parents face now. I'm proud of the work this government's been doing to try and help parents understand what they need to do to protect their children, the role that every parent must play in being vigilant, making sure they know not just what their children are doing online but the ins and outs of how those programs and apps are used. But this isn't a problem that's going away. And this government is prepared to fight it every day of the week. Thank you very much, Senator Stoker. Senator Feveranti Wells. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this very important bill. We must remain resolute in our commitment to protect children from all forms of abuse. As a former chair of Father Chris Riley Youth Off the Streets and having supported uh, his work over many years, I have seen firsthand the effect of child abuse on young people. And indeed, um, in my maiden speech uh, on the 14th of June 2005, some years ago, I referred to Father and his um, teachings to me that there's no such thing as a bad child, just bad circumstances. And I stated that I had come to understand the resilience of our young against terrible adversity and that a child was abused every 13 minutes across Australia. And we were talking back in 2005. And that the perpetrators of crimes against children and those who protect them deserve the severest of punishment. We must confront and end child abuse and the exploitation of youth once and for all. So fast forward. 15 years, and here we are. Um, let's not forget that those who are abused do go on to abuse themselves, and therefore we need to be strong and decisive in our actions so that this cycle is broken. Now, in a speech to the National Press Club on the 19th of February 2020, AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw spoke about countering child sexual exploitation and abuse, and he stated. Today, I want to lift the lid on society's dark secret. I want to shine a light on the ever-increasing online exploitation of our children by those that seek uh, to do them harm. Deviant and perverted offenders with global reach who are using the dark web to evade uh, law enforcement detection and commit heinous crimes against our most vulnerable. Over a decade ago, the AFP received about 300 referrals for online child exploitation material a year. Last year, the AFP had just under 17,000. And indeed, uh, on the 28th of May uh, this year, um, the Commissioner made these comments, which I think are very, very pertinent to our discussion today. He talked about the increase. Uh, of uh, exploitation because more people were spending more time on the dark web. Um, he says people probably don't realise that it's child abuse, it's rape, it's torture, it's horrific. It's not naked young girls or naked young boys. These are people who are being sexually assaulted, sometimes in real time. Those videos are shared. It's absolutely abhorrent. My view is that these individuals are hardwired this way. I personally have not seen any study that says you can be rehabilitated. That means they will continue um, to offend. So, therefore, it's vitally important that we do pass this legislation. And in commending uh, the Commissioner for his comments at estimates on the 2nd of March uh, earlier this year, and most particularly about comments in relation to pedophiles being hardwired, um, which I agree with, I stated that the current sentences were not keeping up with community expectations. 
I asked him whether the time had come for higher mandatory minimum sentences for pedophiles, but immediately, and I see Senator McKim over there, took a point of order, arguing that it was outside the scope of estimates. And for good measure, Senator Keneally also chimed in on the same point. Sadly, and for too long, people who sexually abuse children have been receiving gross, grossly inadequate sentences. It's time to send a clear message to perpetrators that their behaviour will not be tolerated. And this is why this legislation is so important. It will strengthen Commonwealth laws in order to provide greater protection to the community through deterrence and punishing child sex offenders. And it does four broad things. Firstly, there are new offences uh, relating to grooming activities and for websites and online platforms designed to host child abuse material. Secondly, it introduces new aggravated offences for the most horrific types of child abuse engaged in while someone is outside of Australia, including where the child is subjected to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment, the very sort of thing that the police commissioner was referring to. Thirdly, it implements a range of presumptions against bail and presumptions for imprisonment, meaning it will be more likely that child sex offenders go to prison, stay there longer, and it will be harder for them to get bail. Fourthly, it introduces mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious child sex offences and those who are repeat offenders to address the completely unacceptable situation where last year we saw 39% um, of offenders did not spend a single time in jail. Now, on the question of uh, mandatory um, minimum sentencing, um, this is really what lies at the core of this legislation for the most serious child um, sex offenders and repeat offenders. I am concerned that personal beliefs and behaviours may be influencing some judges, and this is reflected in more lenient sentences. I believe the time has come for judges to be positively vetted through some review process before they are appointed to the bench. And this will require personal disclosures to ensure conflicts of interest do not arise. Difficult though this may be, I think it is a reform that is necessary. So let me go back to the bill. It also implements recommendations from the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse to protect vulnerable witnesses by allowing them to automatically give evidence via a video recorded interview and prohibit, prohibit cross-examination at committal hearings. The bill complements a broad package of reforms which have already been introduced by the coalition, including tough new measures to stop child sex offenders from travelling overseas to abuse children, Carly's Law, which targets online predators who use the internet to prepare or plan to sexually abuse children, and the Combating Child Sexual Exploitation Legislation Amendment Act 2019 which implements a number of recommendations from the Royal Commission and improves the Commonwealth framework for offences related to child abuse material, overseas child sexual abuse, childlike sex dolls, forced marriage, failure to report child sex abuse and failure to protect children from such abuse. And we hope that those opposite will change tack on this important bill. We know that Labor refused to support this bill when it was brought before the parliament in 2017. And we know Labor doesn't have the political will to tackle these abhorrent crimes. We know Labor is divided and not focused on passing these changes. Um, on the 3rd of September last year, the leader of the opposition said people who engage in vile acts against children should have the book thrown at them. Right. However, the day after, in an article in the Canberra Times um, uh, entitled Labor Weighs Pedophile Mandatory Penalties, he is quoted as saying, sometimes what it can lead to is less convictions rather than more, Mr Albanese told 5AA Radio in, on Wednesday, because judges or juries will make the view that, that 
that because it's mandatory sentencing, all of the circumstances can't be factored in. This is a nonsensical argument. It is completely at odds with community expectations. Um, I mean, Australians do not want to hear that last year, 39 per cent of sex offenders, they're absolutely appalled to hear that last year, 39 uh, per cent of child sex offenders um, didn't spend a single day in jail. Um, the community expects that child sex offenders go to jail, and this is precisely what this bill uh, will, um, will allow. And we know that the Greens and parts of the Labor Party don't support mandatory sen sentencing on principle. Um, and as I indicated earlier, both Senator McKim and Senator Keneally tried to shut me down at estimates when I was seeking to pursue the issue with Commissioner Kershaw. Um, and having done that, I don't hold out much hope that they will come on board. But as Senator Stoker said earlier, of course, this position um, only applies when it suits them. Given that they legislated mandatory minimum sentencing for people smuggling offences in 2010 during the failed Labor Greens Alliance government, so does that mean that Labor think, uh, does not think that child sex offenders are as serious as people smuggling offences? The Australian public, of course, uh, believe that sex offenders are very, very serious, and therefore sex offences are very, very serious, and therefore uh, should attract the highest possible uh, sanctions. Now, in the inquiry into the Combating Child Sexual Exploitation Legislation Bill 2019, Labor senators commented that the problems created by removing judicial discretion in sentencing are well attested. As the Law Council of Australia stated in its discussion paper on mandatory sentencing, May 2014, there is very little evidence that mandatory sentencing increases public safety. On the contrary, the evidence is that it may have the opposite effect. Mandatory sentencing increases the incentive for defendants to fight charges and may increase the, the risk of recidiv recidivism." End quote. This is not true, absolutely not true. When the Western Australian state Liberal government introduced mandatory uh, sentencing provisions for assaults against police and other officers, there was a 28 per cent drop in assaults against police in just, 12, in just a 12-month period. Now, those opposite now have the opportunity to right the wrongs of the shortened Labor opposition and support these important changes, and it's incumbent on the Leader of the Opposition to stand up to those people in his party who oppose mandatory sentencing of child abusers because of some ridiculous left-wing ideological position. He needs to stand up, and those opposite need to stand up for Australian families to, and support this critical legislation so that our community can be protected against the evils of child sexual uh, abuse. In the time um, left to me, uh, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President, uh, I would like to return to the speech of the uh, Commissioner, uh, Australian Federal Police Commissioner, and some of the comments that he made. And the reason why we need to pass this legislation is to support him and his officers in their efforts. And he says, I want you to know law enforcement fights for those who can't. We speak for those who can't. And our basic mission is to prevent crime and disorder. But I want to not only prevent, but defeat and eradicate this crime. Madam Acting Deputy President, the dark web doesn't only provide anonymity, as the Commissioner says, for individuals and networks, but for whole websites, servers, untold volumes of material. We owe it not just to this generation, but to future generations because of the insidious nature of child abuse. As I said earlier, 
those who are abused go on to abuse themselves. And therefore, if we don't break this cycle, we will be having this debate in years to come. And indeed, in years to come, it will be much worse than what it is today. So I urge those opposite to consider, reconsider their position and support the government in passing this very important piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Feveranti Wells. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Sexual offending against children is as abhorrent as any crime a person can commit. The public rightly expects that the parliament makes it e as easy as possible to catch these predators, prosecute them and put them in jail where they can't harm children for a very long time. This bill before the Senate today amends the Commonwealth Crimes Act and the Commonwealth Criminal Code to make a number of improvements to better protect the community from the dangers of child sexual abuse by addressing inadequacies in the criminal justice system that result in outcomes that insufficiently punish, deter or rehabilitate offenders. These include provisions to insert community safety as a factor that can be taken into account to revoke the parole of an offender without notice, insert new aggravated offences for child sexual abuse that involves subjecting the child to a cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or which causes the death of the child, insert new offences to criminalise the grooming of third parties, including through the use of a carrier service, with the intention of making it easier to procure a child for sexual activity in Australia or overseas, insert additional aggravating sentencing factors that apply when a court is sentencing for certain child sex offences, including considering the age and the maturity of the victim and the number of people involved in the commission of the offence, increase the maximum penalties for certain Commonwealth child sex offences, introduce a mandatory minimum sentencing scheme to apply to Commonwealth sex offences, uh, Commonwealth rather child sex offences that attract the highest maximum penalties and all other Commonwealth child sex offences if the offender is a repeat child sex offender, insert a presumption against bail for Commonwealth child sex offences that attract the highest maximum penalties and all other Commonwealth child sex offences, again if the offender is a repeat offender. Make it an aggravating factor in sentencing if a federal offender used their standing in the community to assist in the commission of an offence. Ensure that when sentencing a Commonwealth child sex offender, the court must have regard to the objective of rehabilitating the person, including by considering whether to impose any conditions about rehabilitation and treatment, and considering if the length of sentence is sufficient for the person to undertake a rehabilitation program while in custody. Insert a presumption in favour of cumulative sentences for Commonwealth child sex offences and insert a presumption in favour of Commonwealth child sex offenders serving an actual term of imprisonment. In contributing to the debate on this bill today, I want to focus my comments on the measures within the bill which relate to the sentencing of child sex offenders, measures which I strongly believe in and which I'm gobsmacked to hear that the Labor Party will be seeking to remove from the legislation by amendment today. I'm one of many Australians who feel that courts across this country have lost their way when it comes to sentencing of child sex offenders. Every week we read of horrific cases of child abuse where offenders get a suspended sentence or six months in jail or just a few years in prison for the rape of a child. These light sentences are wildly out of step with community expectations. They amount to the courts taking a deliberate risk an unacceptable risk that a convicted pedophile will abuse a child again in the future. I've spoken on the public record previously about the need for the courts to better differentiate between lower level crimes and perpetrators of the worst category of crimes like child sex abuse and terrorism, offences where we should not be releasing offenders back into the community just to test a theory that they might be rehabilitated and won't again cause harm. For property crimes or drug-related crimes, we accept as a community that there is a level of risk when an offender is released, and we tolerate that risk because it's ultimately in the interest of the community that they, these people are given a chance to rehabilitate and prove they can live within the law and contribute positively to society. 
this logic of giving an offender a chance has absolutely no place when it comes to terrorists or people who sexually abuse children. I do not accept that a court should roll the dice on the abuse of children by giving a convicted child rapist a second chance. The risk that an offender may abuse another child because the court speculated on their likely rehabilitation is not a risk we should ever accept. The fact that a convicted pedophile is a risk to children after they release from prison is not contested. That's why we have sex offender registers that record where these offenders live. Those registers are not an academic exercise. They are there to record the names and locations of people we know to be a risk of abusing children again. What kind of system is this, where we catch a person who abuses children, convict them in court, and then let them out again while acknowledging they are still a high risk of harming another child? The only time we can be sure that convicted pedophiles won't harm children is when they're in prison. Yet the courts consistently pass up the opportunity to apply anywhere near the maximum life sentences, even for the most horrific examples. The difference between an offender walking free from court after being found guilty and an offender receiving a seven-year mandatory jail sentence, which this bill provides for with a number of offences, is over 2,500 days in which a predator is in the community and has the opportunity to inflict more abuse on children. This is not a hypothetical scenario. Evidence presented to the Senate inquiry conducted by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, of which I am a member, shows that in one study, 20 per cent of child sex offenders were caught reoffending again within six years. And that's just the ones who were caught and convicted. So in at least one in five cases, letting a child sex offender walk free can be expected to result in more children being abused, and this should be utterly unacceptable to us as a nation. We know that there is a low rate of convictions resulting in custodial sentences, meaning many child sex offenders are released straight back into the community. From 1 February 2014 to 31 January 2019, 40 per cent of sentences for Commonwealth child sex offences did not result in a custodial period. Of those offenders who did receive a custodial sentence during this time, the most frequent custodial period recorded was just six months. Again, this is completely unacceptable and something must be done. That's why we need mandatory sentencing for child sex offenders. Personally, I hope that the provisions in this bill are just the first step towards a complete recalibration of sentencing for child sex offenders in this country. People who rape and sexually abuse children are the worst of the worst, alongside terrorists, murderers and rapists. And far from a reduction of sexual abuse of children, instances of child sex crimes are escalating dramatically. Last year, the Australian Federal Police received almost 18,000 reports of child exploitation involving Australian children or Australian child sex offenders. This number has almost doubled from the previous year. That's ample evidence that current sentencing does nothing to deter people from committing these crimes—18,000 reports of child abuse. Sadly, there would be equally disturbing numbers of cases which aren't reported. Having sat through two Senate committee inquiries into sex offence crimes, there are several arguments used against mandatory sentencing for sex offenders which I find to be particularly spurious. Firstly, and this is the one most commonly brought up by legal groups and the Labor Party, there isn't evidence to show that tougher sentencing will deter people from committing these crimes. We've had an almost 100 per cent increase in reports of child abuse, and you don't want to even try and send a stronger deterrence message? Surely any attempt to increase deterrence is worth a try. What's the downside? Pedophiles spend longer in jail? Good, they deserve to. Deterrence is certainly not the only reason, or even the main reason, to implement mandatory sentencing. In my view, the increased community protection from having predators behind bars for a significantly longer period than we're currently seeing is the number one reason for mandatory sentencing. A pedophile can't harm a child while they're in prison. When they're out of prison, they can. It's that simple. 
Another spurious argument against mandatory sentences is that reoffending after release somehow proves that prison is contributing to the reoffending, and I find this a completely backwards <coughs> argument. If a pedophile reoffends after leaving prison, that demonstrates that the community would have been much safer if that person had still been behind bars. Courts should not be gambling on the assumption that pedophiles might learn their lesson and see the error of their ways. The consequence of them being wrong is another child being abused when their abuser could have been in jail. Community safety and, most importantly, the safety of children must always come first. That's why this government is legislating for additional mandatory jail time for a second or subsequent conviction for child sex offences, an important step. I note that the organisation Bravehearts has advocated for consideration being given to introducing mandatory life sentences for persistent offenders. I certainly support that proposal, most importantly at the state level, as states have jurisdiction over so many of the most serious forms of child abuse. And if the courts are giving weight to the chances of rehabilitation, well, why does the evidence show that current sentencing practices are delivering sentences too short for offenders to even complete the rehabilitation programs that they're offered in prison? The most common sentence of six months is not long enough to complete or even commence rehabilitation programs, according to state correctional services. The effectiveness of rehabilitation programs for child sex offenders is doubtful, and I don't think we should be relying on their effectiveness. But it has to be better that offenders are in jail long enough to complete a rehabilitation program rather than being released before the program finishes. I want to conclude my contribution today by reflecting on the views of victims of child abuse, people who deserve to be listened to because they know more than anyone the damage done by these heinous predators. The Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee inquiry into this bill heard that it is the common view of survivors that sentences for child sexual offences should be more severe, and survivors report feeling let down after the stress and often trauma of the trial process. We heard that it is especially difficult for survivors when actual imprisonment is not imposed. The Carly Ryan Foundation submitted that current sentencing for these and other appalling crimes against children is currently completely inadequate in each state, often resulting in suspended sentences or sentences delivered for only a few months. The Australian community expects our legal system to deliver justice for such inexcusable and horrendous crimes against children and those victims of crime deserve this justice given the lifelong suffering endured if the victim survives the offence committed against them. Victims of abuse deserve better. Victims of abuse deserve justice. They deserve to know that it will be a very long time before their abuser is back in the community. And most of all, those who are yet to come forward deserve to know that if they go through the pain and trauma of reporting their abuse, then it will be worthwhile, and they won't see their abuser found guilty and convicted, yet walk free from court or just get a slap on the wrist of a six-month sentence. And that's why I'm so disappointed that Labor are seeking to deny justice to the victims of child sex crimes by removing the mandatory sentencing element from this legislation with their amendment today. In a democratic society, it is the job of elected parliaments to make laws, including sentencing laws. The constant suggestion that it's inappropriate for us in this place to make laws which reflect the views of the community because this limits judicial discretion is a tiresome misrepresentation of the role of democratically elected parliaments. We have courts and judges to apply the law, not to make them. That's our job. So to those who say we can't implement mandatory sentences for pedophiles because it implies that the community doesn't have faith in the courts to hand down adequate sentences, I say this. I can assure you that when 40 per cent of convicted child sex offenders don't spend a day in prison, the community does not have faith in the way courts are sentencing for child sexual abuse. Now is the chance for this parliament to do as the community expects and send the strongest possible message that child sexual abuse is the most abhorrent of crimes and that perpetrators should be put behind bars for a long time, every time. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Antic. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in support of the Crimes Legislation Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill. 
The Australian Institute for Health and Welfare annual report on child protection, last published in 2018 to 2019, noted the following. 171,300 investigations were conducted for 115,700 children in 2018 to 19. 62,700 claims of child maltreatment were substantiated for 47,500 children. In 2018 to 19, emotional abuse was the common primary type of abuse substantiated for children at 54 per cent, followed by neglect at 21 per cent, physical abuse at 15 per cent and sexual abuse at 10 per cent. Mr President, too often our children, the victims of these crimes, are seen as just a statistic. And this bill before us today ensures that these children will not be just a number on a page. The Morrison government sees these victims and their families who are devastated by these monstrous crimes as more than just a statistic. Each number represents a child, a family unit or a community group that is forever scarred by this offending. And what is gut-wrenching, Mr President, is that the full prevalence of child sexual, sexual abuse, both domestically and internationally, is largely unknown. But this bill is a commitment from the Morrison government to protect children from sexual abuse. Too often do we hear it alleged that the perpetrator has reformed or that they have learnt their lesson from their actions and therefore deserve a lesser sentence. But these children and their families get a life sentence and they are left with the scars and they are left to pick themselves back up. From the moment of those uh, unforgivable and excuse inexcusable acts, the lives of these individuals are changed forever. No matter how hard they try to pick up the pieces, it will never be the same. And South Australians will remember the harrowing story of the two masked brothers matter. It's a matter that was watched closely by the local community in South Australia. And they will recall the masked brothers who were victims of an abuser. And they will remember their advocacy regarding child abuse and the field of innocence on Montefiore Hill in Adelaide. The offender was found guilty on nine counts of indecent assault and one count of unlawful sexual intercourse against um, three boys aged between 14 and 16. And the offender was sentenced to six years imprisonment with a two-year non-parole period back in 1996. The offender was released in 1997 after the sentence was backdated to commence from the date of arrest. In 2018, the offender was again charged and pleaded guilty to six counts, counts of offences of a sexual nature against children. And in this instance, the offender was sentenced to six years, seven months and six days imprisonment for those offences committed against the two brothers. The offender filed an appeal to serve out his sentence on home detention, claiming um, there was no longer an appreciable risk to the safety of the community due to advanced age and self-reports self -reports of diminished libido and sexual interest. The appeal was ultimately dismissed and the offender now serves a custodial sentence. And as you can imagine, Mr President, this case caused great angst throughout the community in South Australia. And it is a stark reminder of why it is that we need strong legislation in place because the Marx brothers were real people whose lives had been turned upside down by this offending. A victim gets a life sentence, and this is why we need strong legislation for these types of offences. I use this as an example as the community expects strong action in relation to such heinous offending. And I share this story to remind us that every single number in those statistics amounts to a life that has been forever changed. 
According to the Australian Bureau of Statistics' most recent personal safety survey in 2016, an estimated 7.7 .7 per cent of Australians had experienced childhood sexual abuse before the age of 15, with the average age at which the abuse started being approximately eight years old. Of the 1.4 million survivors of abuse in Australia, the majority knew the perpetrator and experienced multiple incidents. Mr President, last year the Australian Federal Police received almost 18,000 reports of exploitation involving children or Australian child sex offenders. And this number has almost doubled since the previous year. This parliament must show that this behaviour— Senator Anton, you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr uh, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Assistant Treasurer Sukha has said about the home builder, and I quote, our view has been that this is a jobs program. It's going to support half a million jobs in the residential construction industry. Does the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, stand by these numbers? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, Home Builder, of course, is a very uh, important uh, program which recognises that the residential construction sector uh, is of critical uh, importance to the Australian economy, and which is, of course, why a number of state governments, including the state Labor government in my home state of Western Australia, has uh, taken uh, certain measures to support that sector. Pre-COVID. The residential construction sector forecast commencements of 171,000 compared to a forecast of 111,000 post-COVID commencements. Uh, Home Builder is expected to boost residential construction activity, directly supporting 140,000 uh, tradies and a further uh, up to 1 million jobs indirectly in the residential uh, construction sector. Uh, these are, of course, estimates, uh, and as always with estimates, as, as indirectly in the residential Order. construction sector. And I further one million jobs indirectly through the, in the residential construction sector. These are estimates. We will, of course, monitor the uh, implementation of this very important scheme. The uh, Home Builder is primarily about new construction of dwellings, with Treasury expecting around 20,000 new dwellings to be supported by the policy compared to around 7,000 substantial renovations. So far, over 22,500 people have registered their interest. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, analysis by Credit Suisse has described the Home Builder program as, and I quote, disappointingly small. The research note goes on to say, and I quote, we doubt that the incentives delivered are large enough nor the eligibility criteria wide enough to really move the, me the needle. Why couldn't the government design a program that was capable, capable of moving the needle in the construction sector? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, you know, clearly, we've made judgments uh, based on what we believe is appropriate in the circumstances. Uh, you know, everybody uh, will have their own views. Some people would like us to spend more, others would let us like us to spend less. Uh, we made a judgment about what we believe is appropriate in the circumstances, but of course everybody is entitled to their own views. Senator Gallagher, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The director of the Grattan Institute has described the Prime Minister's announcement as, and I quote, classic retail politics but lousy economics. Australia has entered its first recession in 29 years is now the right time for the Prime Minister to be indulging in his passion for spin over substance? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Uh, we completely disagree with uh, the assertion made uh, by the Grattan Institute, but we, we are used to the fact that whatever we do, uh, there will be commentary from all sides, uh, uh, including the sorts of commentary that uh, Senator Gallagher has just uh, read out. We will continue to make judgments based on what we believe is in the best interest of uh, working families around Australia, and including what is in the best interest of uh, those Australians working in the residential construction sector. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Can the Minister inform the Senate how the Morrison government is driving the nation's 
economic recovery from COVID-19. The Minister for Finance, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I thank um, Senator Bragg for that very important question. Uh, of all OECD economies, uh, Mr President, Australia is expected to have the third uh, lowest fall in GDP in 2020. Uh, nevertheless, we do have a very significant challenge in front of us as a nation. We will still have a very significant mountain to climb. Compared to our MAIFO forecasts, uh, it is expected that over $100 billion of economic activity has been lost this year as a direct result of um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We expect that it will take us two years uh, to get back to the level of economic activity we were at pre COVID-19, but um, our government has a plan to lift growth, not just in the next few months, but over the next five years. Our focus will be on jobs, jobs and jobs, providing the confidence and the incentive for businesses to invest and to hire. Uh, we have done it before and we will do it again. More than 1.5 million jobs were created across Australia under our government before COVID-19 hit. Uh, increased investment in infrastructure will continue to be a central part of our plan. And today, the Prime Minister announced our commitment to invest a further $1.5 billion to start work on smaller priority projects identified by the states and territories. $1 billion will be allocated to priority projects which are now uh, sho shovel ready, with $500 million reserved specifically to target road safety works. Uh, that further $1.5 billion uh, builds on around $7.8 billion worth of projects we've brought forward since November last year. In total, our government has committed nearly $180 billion in economic infrastructure over the next decade, with more than half allocated across the forward estimates. Uh, we have also announced a priority list of uh, 15 major projects worth more than $72 billion in public and private investment. Order. Pro Senator Cormann. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Minister, can you inform the Senate why this is the responsible path to economic recovery? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, restoring growth and getting Australians back into work uh, is critical when it comes to our budget repair effort moving forward. Our budget has taken a hit, uh, not just because of the necessary expenditure to support the economy, business and jobs through this crisis period, but also because of the impact on, uh, of um, falling revenues. Our expenditure measures were targeted and time limited, but the impacts on revenue will be longer, longer lived as the economy makes its way back. That is why we will have to recalibrate our fiscal strategy. We will do that in a responsible way. The budget will be balanced, again, by keeping expenditures under control while boosting revenues through pro-growth policies that lift investment and get Australians back into work. We will not pursue excessive authority nor high taxes we will pursue growth and responsible budget management that ensures the government lives within its means while still guaranteeing the essential services Australians rely on. We must be very cautious about our expenditure Order. as we navigate Senator our Cormann, way back. Time for the answers expired. Senator Bragg, a final supplementary question. Can the minister inform the Senate about the risks of pursuing a different economic and fiscal policy direction? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Any suggestion? to keep the significantly elevated levels of spending going on forever and ever would harm our economy and harm our budget. It would harm our capacity to sustainably fund the essential services of government on a sustainable basis. That is because it would require higher taxes over time, which would harm growth. Higher taxes over time, which would harm growth. I know that the socialists on the other side find that very hard to understand. Harming growth would harm government revenue over time. That has always, and that of course has always been the Labor way. Higher spending funded by higher growth destroying taxes. Our, our government will put our country on a sustainable and responsible path and give the nation the best possible opportunity to thrive on the other side of this crisis. And of course the Australian people know that this is a government that delivers pro-growth, lower taxes, pro-business, uh, pro-opportunity policies, whereas those on the other side, given half a chance, would go back to impose higher taxes, which leads to fewer jobs. Order, Senator Coleman. Senator Green. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. The design of the government's home builder program has been criticised internally and publicly. 
Housing ex experts are concerned that the Home Builder program won't deliver for regional areas where the required spend will overcapitalise existing houses. The LNP member for Herbert and the LNP member for Leichhardt have raised concerns that renovations for houses in their electorates will not meet the $150,000 threshold. Minister, how many Australians in regional areas does the government estimate will access the Home Builder program? Minister representing the Prime uh, th Minister, thank, Senator thank you Coleman. very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator Green for that question. Uh, regional areas will benefit from the new construction component more, comparatively more than other areas, as house and land prices are lower there, allowing them potentially a larger build while remaining under the cap. Uh, it, is, it is true that we've also included. It is true that we've also included the uh, renovation, uh, the substantial renovation component as part of this program, and that is in recognition. That is in recognition of the fact that many Australian families can't afford to buy a bigger home, so a substantial renovation is the best way of supporting a growing family. But that, is, that is why we've designed the program we have and we stand by the program, but feel free to keep um, throwing Order. rocks against Senator, it. Senator, have you concluded your answer? Senator Cormann has concluded his answer. Senator Wong. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Senator Canavan has said about the Home Builder Program, and I quote, I'm worried we are putting ourselves in a weaker position if asset prices in Australia were to fall. Does Mr Morrison agree with Senator Canavan? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, our, our focus and our commitment is to put Australia in a stronger position. Senator Green. You're not doing it, though. That's the Order. problem. I'm, I'm going to... I'll call Senator Green when there is silence. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. The member for New England has said about the Home Builder Program, and I quote, I'm concerned about the complexity of trying to pay back that debt. Does Mr. Morrison agree with Mr. Joyce? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, well, you know what, what uh, Senator Green has clearly noticed is that uh, in the coalition uh, we've got uh, lots of uh, individual members and senators contributing to the policy debate, which is a fantastic thing. Which is a fantastic thing. But let me, but let me also, but let me also, let me also say uh, to um, the member for New England and everybody in this chamber that right around Australia. People are taking out loans to buy uh, land and house packages every single day. Uh, people are going out, going out to uh, take out loans in order to uh, organise uh, substantial renovations. You know, obviously on an ongoing basis. We do. This is a, a program that is designed. It's an important program that is designed to support jobs in the residential construction sector. We will continue to monitor uh, its implementation as we are rolling it out, uh, and uh, you know, we, we are confident that this is uh, going to make a, a positive and necessary contribution. Senator Antich. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, as the global economy faces the greatest economic decline since the Great Depression as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, how will the Morrison government's job maker plan accelerate infrastructure investment to drive our economic recovery and create jobs for Australians? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Antic for the question. Uh, Mr President, the Prime Minister today outlined the next phase of the government's job maker plan to support Australia and Australians' recovery from COVID-19. He announced that almost $72 billion of major infrastructure projects across Australia will now be fast-tracked under an agreement struck between the state, federal and territory governments. It will see approval times slashed by half and it will see the creation of 66,000 jobs. Mr President, as a government, we are also committing to a further $1.5 billion to immediately commence work on small priority projects identified by the states and the territories. $1 billion will be allocated to priority projects which are shovel ready, and a half a billion dollars will be reserved specifically to target road safety works. Mr. President, this builds on the $7.8 billion worth of projects we've brought forward since November of last year. Fifteen major projects are on fast track for approval under a bilateral model between the Commonwealth, the states, 
and the territories. And the projects include emergency town water projects in New South Wales, road, rail and iron projects in Western Australia, the inland rail from Melbourne to Brisbane, the Marinus link between Tasmania and Victoria, and of course, Senator Antic, in your home state, the Olympic Dam extension in South Australia. Mr. President, these 15 job-creating investments Will be, brought forward, will be brought forward by targeting a 50 per cent reduction in Commonwealth assessment and approval times for major projects from an average of 3.5 years to 21 months. Senator Antich, supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's skills reform agenda support these job-creating infrastructure projects? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the JobMaker program builds on the significant steps that the Morrison government is already taking to transform our training system to ensure that we have the skilled workforce that Australia needs. Our $585 investment in our skills package it is investing supporting Australians to ensure that they have the skills that Australian businesses are telling us that they need. We are establishing the National Skills Commission to improve our skills and our labour market forecasting. We have, of course, established the National Careers Institute to evaluate the status of vocational education and training and to provide evidence-based careers advice on vocational education pathways. We are also supporting, importantly, foundational skills for people with low educational attainment. Mr President, these reforms are critical to supporting Australians into careers, Australian businesses to get the skilled employees that they need and to support our infrastructure investment as Order. we recover Senator from COVID-19. Senator Antich, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's JobMaker plan bring Australians together and support the economy to rebuild following the COVID-19 downturn? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, the JobMaker plan is, of course, our roadmap for a new generation of economic success to guarantee the essential services that all Australians rely on. Mr. President, as we all reset for growth, the Morrison government's JobMaker plan will be guided by principles to secure Australia's future. And these principles include: we will remain an outward-looking, open, and sovereign trading economy. We must seek to leverage and build on our strengths an educated and highly skilled workforce that supports a thriving and innovative services sector, and a modern and competitive advanced manufacturing sector. And of course, we must ensure that there is opportunity in Australia for those who have a go to get a go. Mr President, as we have shown, working together across states, across territories, together as Australians, we will be able to restore jobs and support the economic recovery that Australia needs as a result of COVID-19. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, President. My question is to the Foreign Minister, Senator Payne. Australian citizen Calm Gillespie has been sentenced to death in Guangzhou, China, and has just 10 days left to appeal his verdict. He's been detained in China for six and a half years, and according to media reports, many of his friends thought he'd disappeared. Unlike other cases where Australians have faced the death penalty overseas, there's been no opportunity to mount a public campaign to support Mr Gillespie. Minister, when did the Australian government first become aware of Mr Gillespie's detention, and when did you become aware that he faced a possible death sentence? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. Let me begin by saying that uh, I am both saddened and deeply concerned that an Australian citizen, Mr Calm Gillespie, has been sentenced to death in China, and our thoughts are most certainly with him, his family and uh, loved ones. Uh, there are a number of steps uh, to go in the legal process, uh, including an appeal opportunity. We are continuing to provide consular assistance to Mr Gillespie uh, and his family in line with the Consular Services Charter. Uh, Mr President, uh, the Australian Government, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has been providing appropriate consular assistance uh, to Mr Gillespie uh, for uh, the period of his uh, detention. Uh, I would indicate to the Chamber that uh, the government has offered a briefing on this matter to the Australian Greens and uh, would appreciate the opportunity uh, to take that up with Senator Waters. 
Senator Waters, a supplementary question. Thanks very much, Minister. I look forward to taking you up on that. Um, I'm sure many Australians were as surprised as we were to hear over the weekend that Mr Gillespie had been sentenced to death, given that the public appeared to be unaware of his case. Why is the Australian public only finding out about his plight now? Why have you allowed this to happen? And at what levels and at which times did the Australian government raise this with the Chinese authorities? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. As I would have hoped, the leader of the Australian Greens in the Senate was aware every consular case with which the government deals is different, uh, and every consular case uh, is handled uh, in consultation with posts, with family, with legal representatives uh, in the most appropriate way. Senator Waters, a final supplementary question. Uh, thanks, President. Minister, how many other Australian citizens or permanent residents are currently detained in China's opaque and unjust judicial system? And how many are at risk of being sentenced to death during this particularly fractious time in our relationship with China? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. As I indicated in my response to the Leader of the Australian Greens' first question, we are very happy to provide the Australian Greens uh, with a briefing on these matters. That offer has already been made today. Uh, there are a number of Australians uh, in prison in China. Uh, in fact, there are a large number of Australians in prison in a number of locations uh, around the world. That is uh, obviously the case from time to time. Uh, and of course, what we do remind Australians uh, is Australians are always subject to the laws of countries that they are in. There are severe penalties in many countries for behaviour, particularly including drugs, and that includes China. But I will be endeavouring to repeat my offer uh, to uh, the Australian Greens uh, to provide a briefing, an offer which was made earlier today. Senator Walsh. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. I refer to the Minister who, when announcing the retention bonus for aged care workers, said, and I quote, this will mean a payment of up to $800 after tax per quarter, paid for two quarters for direct care workers. Does the minister stand by this statement? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, thanks, Senator Walsh, for the question. Uh, Senator Walsh is correct. We have made uh, a specific decision as government to provide support to residential aged care workers uh, and, and some of those who are working in uh, home care services to support them uh, and to indicate to them that uh, as a government we are, they are important to us and to the community and we want them to continue to come to work because in the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak Mr. President, we found that there were some particularly residential aged care workers who had said that they um, did not want to come to work, particularly in the circumstance where there was a COVID outbreak within the residential aged care facility uh, that, we, that they were working in. One thing that we didn't say, Mr President, is that the, uh, that the bonuses would, not be, would be tax free, because they're not, and that's not how these sorts of uh, income bonuses work. And Mr. So, Mr President, uh, we, we said up to $800—we well, said up to $800 and up to $600 uh, on each quarter, and so, Mr. President, uh, $1,600 additional income to uh, workers in residential aged care is a significant amount of money, and we uh, always said in our statements up to, Mr. President, and Mr. President, uh, $600, so $1,200 into um, into home care services. Uh, Mr. President, we never said at any point in time that these, that these support bonuses would be tax-free. That was never said, Mr President. So we are quite proud of the fact that we continue to support residential aged care workers and home care workers as a part of uh, our response to the COVID-19 process. Senator Walsh, a supplementary question. Uh, Order. Yes, I refer to the minister who, when announcing the retention bonus for aged care workers, said it would provide, and I quote again, two payments of up to $600 after tax per quarter for two quarters for those who provide care in the home. Does the minister stand by this statement in relation to the payments being after tax? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And uh, it's it's good that the 
uh, Senator, in her supplementary question, actually acknowledges what I just said in my response to the first question, where we said up to $600 and up to $800, Mr. President. And, and as I said in my first answer, we never said at any point in time uh, that it would be tax-free, because that is not how income bonuses work. Uh, in exactly the same way, same way that JobKeeper is subject to tax, uh, these bonuses are also subject to tax. And it's good, Mr. President, that uh, the senator has acknowledged in her question what I said in the answer to my in, to her first question, which was that these these would be up to eight hundred and up to six hundred dollars. Senator Walsh, a final supplementary question. Thank you. When the guidelines uh, for the retention bonus were released late on a Friday afternoon, it was revealed payment amounts were switched to being before tax. When and by whom was this decision made? Why, when it comes to the, to the delivery of the retention bonus, has the government again failed to deliver on its spin? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the announcement that we made was consistent. Uh, with approaches that we're making to all income bonuses, uh, Mr. President, and so uh, as I have said, and as Senator Walsh has indicated in her second question, we always said that these were up to $600 and up to $800 per quarter. And Mr. President, the decision that was in the guidelines that were released was a decision of government. Uh, that was a decision of government. Uh, so, in direct response to the question that uh, Senator Walsh has asked. We said all along that these bonuses would be up to 600 per quarter and up to 800 per quarter. And Mr. President, this is, and I'm quite proud of the fact that this government has chosen to support residential and home care workers in their efforts during the COVID-19 outbreak. Because we understand, Mr. President, we understand the importance of these workers. And at the last election, despite promises and huge tax. Take. There was no Order. money for Senator workforce Colbeck, retention time for the in the Labor Party's promises. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister Cash, representing the Minister for Infrastructure. On 13 November 2019, the majority of coalition senators supported a notice of motion that the Senate, and I quote, call on the federal government to take the necessary steps to ensure the construction of a Bradfield-type scheme can begin in Queensland as swiftly as possible. Speaking to this motion, the government stated, and again I quote, there is no reason for the Australian government to oppose this motion. Today the Prime Minister announced plans to fast-track a number of infrastructure projects, yet despite the government's claimed support, there was no mention of any form of Bradfield scheme. Why has the government chosen to leave the hybrid or new Bradfield scheme a crucial nation-building project they have expressed their support for off the Prime Minister's list of essential projects to be fast-tracked? The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development. Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question, and in particular for acknowledging uh, the significant announcement that the Prime Minister made today, as I alluded to in my previous uh, question from Senator Antic, and the uh, bringing forward of infrastructure projects across Australia to create around 66,000 jobs. Uh, in relation to the Bradfield scheme, I can provide you with the following information. Uh, the National Water Grid Authority, uh, which, as you have referred to, commenced operation on 1 October 2019, uh, is working with leading science agencies, including the CSIRO, to determine where and how water resources can be sustainably developed. This forms part of the Australian government's commitment to invest $100 million into bringing world best science together to identify opportunities for enhancing water supply and reliability for regional Australia. As part of this work, the authority is considering options for developing large-scale water harvesting and transfer schemes, such as elements of the Bradfield scheme or hybrid versions of the Bradfield scheme, to capture and transport water to both grow agricultural sector and improve drought resilience. Over the decades since it was first proposed, there have been a number of assessments on the merit of the original Bradfield scheme and more recent variations. It is important that the feasibility of these schemes are now investigated using the best available contemporary science. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. There has been, um, there has been a, uh, 
and uh, feasibility study done on it by the Snowy Mountain Engineering Corp in 2018. Water security is crucial to all Australians, Australians especially given the horrendous drought that more than 60 per cent of Queensland continues to endure. Why can't the government simply give the people of Australia a firm commitment that the hybrid Bradfield scheme will be added to the Prime Minister's list of projects that will be fast-tracked? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. And I would refer Senator Hanson uh, to the answer I just gave to my previous question. And my understanding is the Prime Minister announced certain uh, projects today and said there would be further announcements to come. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. I appreciate that, and I appreciate the water schemes that have actually been put in with the dams, but there has been no real commitment to the hybrid Bradfield scheme, which will actually bring water from going out to, to the ocean inland. So, therefore, I say to the Minister, the government has been very critical of Queensland's Labor's failure to give a clear date on border openings. Is it safe to say that because you won't commit to your date to start this project, that the Liberal National Party have no plans to build the Bradfield scheme? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Hanson, I will have to reject the premise of your question. And as I said in my answer to your primary question, over the decade since it was first proposed, there have been a number of assessments on the merits of the original Bradfield scheme and more recent variations. It is important that the feasibility of these schemes are now investigated using the best available contemporary science. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Morrison government is using technology to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and to help support our economic recovery? The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Van, for your question. Um, it is um, absolutely unquestioned that, uh, that Australia is doing an extraordinary job. Uh, to flatten the curve of the, can, uh, the coronavirus pandemic and to contain the spread, which means that we have saved many, many lives of Australians through this process. But now is not the time to be complacent. As restrictions are being eased in our communities, Mr. President, it is absolutely important that all Australians remain safe and they understand what it is that they need to do to remain safe because it's critically important, not just for us as individuals, but it is very important that we don't just protect ourselves, but we actually need to look out for others. And that's why, through a society-wide um, uh, effort to make sure that we, uh, we have the appropriate response in place for the coronavirus, one that, I said, as I said, has made us a world leader and the envy of the rest of the world in areas such as testing, tracing and containing the virus, and we've worked absolutely tirelessly over the last few months to make sure that we have got the capacity in place, and that includes making sure that all Australians have got access to the kind of digital capabilities that they need to navigate their way through this pandemic and as we go forward. And it is absolutely vital that all, Australia, all Australians um, are empowered to proactively limit the spread of the coronavirus and protect the community. And that's why uh, the Prime Minister launched Australia's contact uh, tracing app, COVID Safe, to help protect the lives and the health of the Australian community, to make sure that we were in a position that we could quickly respond and be able to trace people if they had come into contact with somebody who had the virus. Um, and this app complements their existing manual process by which we do currently trace and track people uh, and that, that uh, processes that are being undertaken by state and territory officials. It is absolutely essential that we have this in place as we ease restrictions on social gatherings. Order. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Minister. How else is the government ensuring information is available to all areas of the Australian public? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the Australian government is, uh, is assisting the Australian public in many ways, but uh, including particularly making sure that we have an easy to access uh, one uh, place of, uh, of information through the australia.gov.au website. It's the central source, it's the authoritative source, it's trusted, it's regularly updated because we want to make sure that all Australians have got the information that they need regarding the coronavirus to keep themselves, their family, their friends and their community safe. Uh, this website brings absolutely crucial information together across all of government agencies so that when people are seeking advice, whether it be about health measures, financial me measures, welfare measures, that they are able to access it in one place. And this is guidance for businesses, for individuals, for travellers, for people with disability. Every Australian can access this site and get the kind of information that they need to navigate our way through 
this, this pandemic. Over 22 million people have visited the australia.gov.au website so far. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Minister, could you tell us what the government is doing to assist those more vulnerable in the Australian community? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, as restrictions begin to ease, it is really, really important that every Australian downloads the COVID Safe app so that we can make sure yeah, yeah. we can resume life as best we can. Uh, we can get people back into jobs, we can get people back out socialising. But to do so, we also need to protect the most vulnerable. And the best way you can protect the vulnerable in, within our community is to make sure that you have the COVID Safe app on your phone. Um, so far, it's been really strongly received through the states and territories, um, and it is being recognised as a very valuable tool, uh, which has enabled our um, states and territories to lift uh, the restrictions and make sure that this virus isn't silently creeping its way through our communities. But in addition to the, uh, the COVID Safe app, we're also encouraging people uh, to make sure that they make themselves available all forms of technology, all forms of information, so that they know what they need to be doing to protect the many vulnerable people that are in our community, because we have an obligation to keep them safe and not just ourselves. Senator McCarthy. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. On Thursday, Senator Stoker appeared on Sky News and said in relation to the Queensland Premier, and I quote, she's choking the economy by having these borders shut. She's the knee on the throat of the businesses of Queensland, stopping them from breathing. Does Mr Morrison agree that it was insensitive and inappropriate for Senator Stoker to use the words of a dying man to make a political point on late night TV? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, I didn't see those comments, and rather than to provide a commentary on um, alleged commentary, I'll have a conversation with Senator Stoker separately. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Uh, Mr President, um, what action will Mr Morrison take? Senator Cormann. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, it's the first I've heard of this, and I've just indicated what, what uh, I will do before making any further comment. Uh, I'm not aware uh, whether uh, the Prime Minister is aware of this comment, so I would have to take that question on notice. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Senator Stoker is locked in a battle for Queensland LNP Senate pre selection against Senator McGrath. Does Senator Stoker have Mr. Morrison's full support? Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr uh, President. <coughs> the Prime Minister supports all his colleagues and, uh, of course, pre-selections are a matter for party organisations. Senator Rennick. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. This year has been challenging for all Australians, particularly our seniors. Today, as we mark World, World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, can the minister outline the steps the Morrison government has taken to tackle elder abuse in Australia? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. I thank Senator Rennick for his question. Uh, Mr President, uh, elder abuse is something that all of us uh, need to pay attention to. It is a particular problem in our community and takes, I think, uh, will require some considerable community attitude change. The government the Morrison government is committed to ending the abuse of Australian seniors in all its forms. Today the government launched an awareness campaign to highlight the issue and assist those experiencing physical, emotional and financial abuse to get help. This is one of the many initiatives the government is delivering through the national plan to respond to the abuse of older Australians. We are also committed Mr. President, to working with the states and territories to consider uh, reforms such as those to enduring powers of attorney laws. Our government also funds various support programs, including a 20 fr uh, 20 free 24-hour phone line, 1800 Elder Help, 1800 353 374, and the Older Persons Advocacy Network, OPAN, to provide free, confidential and um, independent advocacy on, to support older people, including for matters relating to elder abuse. Uh, Mr President, we have continued with the reform agenda to protect senior Australians in aged care while we continue through the Royal Commission running its course. We introduced unannounced vis uh, re-accreditation visits from 1 July 2018. We established the Independent Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission 
uh, in, on the 1st of January last year, bringing together the com uh, complaints accreditation assessment and monitoring into one agency, as recommended by a number of reviews. We also introduced a suite of critical reforms commencing on the 1st of July last year. New consumer-facing standards, a new charter of aged care rights, and a new na a national aged care mandatory quality indicator program. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline what measures the government has taken to ensure our senior Australians in aged care are being supported and kept safe during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and the government has been extremely active to ensure that senior Australians not only are safe but have access to the services that they need during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission has continued to do all they can to meet the physical, mental health and social, uh, emotion, uh, social and emotional needs of aged care consumer, consumers. Mr. President. The Commission continues to undertake its uh, critical work, including conducting site visits while ensuring that, for, uh, particularly importantly, infection control requirements on, uh, are, are met with uh, uh, inspectors entering aged care facilities. While it's important to keep older Australians safe from COVID-19, it's also important to ensure that senior Australians in aged care uh, facilities continue to have visitors for their overall wellbeing, Mr President. And in that context, the Code for Visiting Residential Aged Care Facilities has been a very, very important initiative undertaken by the government in conjunction Order, with the sector. Senator Colbeck. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Can the minister outline what the government is doing to protect older Australians in residential facilities against abuse. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, I thank Senator Rennick for the question. Um, Mr. President, any mistreatment or assault of senior Australians or an aged care recipient is unacceptable, and the government takes all of those instances extremely seriously. Yesterday, on behalf of the government, I announced a further $23 million investment into the Serious Incident Response Scheme, which was a recommendation of the Australian Law Reform Commission report. Um, to protect vulnerable Australians and senior Australians in aged care from uh, abuse and neglect. Mr President, it's an important measure to increase the transparency to keep our loved ones safe. Residential aged care providers will be required to manage all incidents, including resident on resident and, and importantly resident on resident, and with a focus on safety, wellbeing uh, and prevention. There is still much more work to do, Mr President, and the safety and wellbeing of all senior Australians con continues to be one of the key priorities of the Morrison government. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Communications, Cybersecurity and the Arts. The CEO of Australia Post argued that there was a 50 per cent drop in addressed letter volumes as justification for the government's proposed changes to service requirements. But Australia Post today admitted that the drop in address letter volume for March was seven times smaller than it had claimed and largely in line with forecasts. Why hasn't the government been honest with the Australian people about why it wants to slash postal services? The minister representing the Minister for Cyber Communication, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank the Senator for that question. I find it quite extraordinary that Senator O'Neill could actually ask this question uh, for a number of reasons, because the only mistruths that are coming uh, are from those from the other yeah. side. And in fact, there are seven Order. mistruths, including the one that you have just mentioned. And I thoroughly reject the whole premise of your question. And let me give you seven reasons why the premise of this question is not true. Like, Labor has claimed that Australia Post will cut jobs and remove one in four posties. This is a lie. It is not true. It's, secondly, it's also been claimed that Australia Post wants to cut delivery services in half. This is also not true. Senator Wong on Labor a point of order. Also... Sorry, Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, direct relevance. I know the minister is reading out the very lengthy press release that Senator Cormann put out. What we actually asked her about, what we actually asked her about was material released today by Australia Post, which is their own numbers as to uh, the drop in letter volumes. Senator 
Cormann on the point of order. On the, on the point of order, uh, the uh, minister directly dealt with the uh, question in her opening sentences, in her opening statements, by rejecting the premise of the question. Now, uh, Senator Wong might want to tell the minister how to answer the question, but that is not, that is not in her uh, capacity to do. Uh, so the minister was being directly relevant and she was providing further context for the Senate in an abundance of helpfulness. So on the, on the point of order, I am listening carefully to what the minister says. The Senator Cormann is correct. I cannot instruct a minister how to answer a question. However, once a minister has addressed part of the question, further material that is provided must also be directly relevant. I am listening carefully to the minister. Um, the part of the question I took related to volumes of business being conducted by Australia Post, um, material that refers and relates to the volume. Um, as asserted in the question, is directly relevant. Now, I'm listening to the minister, minister's answer. She has one minute, 17 remaining. Senator Reynolds. Mr. President, and yes, I am seeking to be complete and thorough in my answer of all of the mistruths uh, that have been told by those opposite in relation to Australia Post. So, parcel volumes are actually up 64 per cent, so you asked for the latest numbers, and letter volumes are down 36 per cent uh, May on year from last year. So let me get back to the fourth untruth from Labor. So fourthly, uh, Labor has claimed Australia and small business will be disadvantaged compared to metropolitan areas. Fourth untruth. The fifth untruth is it's been claimed by Labor that vulnerable Australians will be most impacted by the changes. Guess what? Also untrue. Uh, Labor has also claimed that the changes this government has implemented uh, during COVID-19 are permanent. Again, guess what? Untrue. And the seventh. Uh, the seventh big lie from Labor in relation to Australia Post is that the government wants to privatise Australia Post. Again, guess what? Absolutely untrue. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The CEO of Australia Post has refused to provide a guarantee that there will be no forced redundancies. Will the minister give a guarantee that no Australia Post employees in delivery, transport or processing will be forced into redundancy? If not, how many people will lose their jobs, Minister? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. I think Senator O'Neill didn't listen to my first of my seven uh, untruths because uh, clearly he hadn't heard the first one. So let me just repeat the first big untruth that Labor is peddling. As you've just said, uh, it has been claimed by Labor uh, that Australia Post will cut jobs and remove one in four posties. And this is simply not true. Australia Post has said repeatedly Order. Senator there Reynolds will be no on Senator Reynolds, redundancies I have Senator or plans Reynolds, to cut posties. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. If it's so easy, will the minister give a guarantee of no forced That's redundancies? That's not a point of order, Senator Wong. That's a restatement of the question. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I mean, S Senator Reynolds directly addressed the question. No forced redundancies. I mean, this is just a complete that and utter furphy. The Labor Party pursuing conspiracy theory after conspiracy. Okay, Senator like, Cormann, completely that's disrupted. not a response to the point of order, but I'll let it go on the basis that there was not even a point of order initially. Senator Reynolds to continue. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. And if I can continue on that first point. Uh, so, Australia Post has said there will be no forced redundancies or plans to cut posties' uh, take home pay new to the new temporary arrangements. Many posties will continue delivering letters on bikes, and others will be retrained to deliver parcels in vans because they're up 64 per cent, putting them where and that she will be putting her posties where the work is, and that is with parcel posts in particular. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Senator Colbeck told this chamber that the government's proposal to double letter delivery times for many Australians was a response to COVID-19. Can the minister guarantee that Australia Post has not proposed similar changes prior to COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, Senator O'Neill clearly didn't hear my third great myth being peddled by Labor. And I'll repeat that again for the benefit of those in the chamber. It has been claimed by Labor, again repeated now, that wait times for letters will more than double from three to seven days. And that is not true. Mail fee standards order. for regular Senator Reynolds, state letters. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Wong on a point of order. 
direct relevance, and we can repeat the question if the minister didn't listen the first time. Uh, we are referring to an answer given by Senator Colbeck, where he indicated that this policy response was a response to COVID-19. And we've asked the minister to guarantee that Australia Post has not sought similar arrangements pre-COVID-19. Um, on the point of order, um, the, the, the quote order, the, the quotation asserted from an answer last week did refer, I believe, to lengthening times of delivery. The minister is in order if she is addressing that particular point, um, and that because that is directly relevant because it was part of the quotation. Senator Reynolds. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I will can say again that it is. You've claimed that there will be increase in wait times for letters from three to seven days. This is not true. Mail speed standards for regular interstate letters, which is mail travelling around our country, have not changed. Order, Senator, they... sorry, Senator, order, Senator Reynolds. Senator O'Neill, order, Senator Reynolds, please. Are you seeking point of order? It's hard to tell. Sorry, at the po is that a point of and order, Senator O'Neill? Please go ahead. Senator Reynolds continues. We've heard a lot from her about my hearing capacity. I want to say it's pretty good. Senator Reynolds has not heard the first part of the question, and clearly, it was Senator Colbeck who told um, the chamber Senator, that the government's proposal to double, double letter delivery times for many Australians was a response to COVID-19. It was Senator Colbert Senator who Senator made O'Neill, that fact I, I think, believe it, you are going to the substance of an answer. I cannot instruct a minister how to answer. If the minister is talking about a, a claim that was made in the quotation you've used in your question, she is being directly relevant. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much. I think I've now made this point for the fourth time that there have been no changes no changes, no changes, no changes, no changes. And I think, as my colleague Minister Fletcher said, Labor is again resorting to its usual by election tactics of whipping up a baseless scare campaign Order, for Senator those Reynolds, in aged care and Senator Reynolds, time for the answer has expired. Monero. Senator McLaughlin. My question is for the Minister of Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the minister outline how Australia will expand defence cooperation with India? following the elevation of our bilateral relationship to a comprehensive strategic partnership and how this partnership will help drive our economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator McLaughlin for the question and also for his enduring commitment to defence and to defence industry. Thank you. Strengthening Australia's defence relationships is a key priority for me and also for the Morrison government. That's why, since becoming minister, I've conducted 16 international visits and also hosted six international counterparts here in Australia. And during COVID-19, I've maintained this tempo of international engagements with over 20 virtual calls uh, with 14 international counterparts. These defence relationships are critically important for our nation, none more so than our relationship with India. The recent Australia-India's Leaders Virtual Summit was a groundbreaking, groundbreaking moment in our relationship. As Minister Birmingham outlined in this place last week, India and Australia is the fifth largest export market, with the expansion of our trade relationship, which will be crucial as we both recover from COVID-19. And as my counterpart, Minister Singh, and I discussed at our last call, both our defence forces are playing leading roles in our nation's responses to COVID-19. The Comprehensive Strategic Partnership further strengthens our bonds through two new landmark defence agreements. Firstly, the Mutual Logistics Support Arrangement, which paves the way for deeper and more sophisticated defence cooperation between India and Australia. It will result in increased engagement through more mil complex military uh, exercises, which will enhance our capacity to respond to shared regional challenges. Secondly, the Defence Science and Technology Arrangement, which recognises that collaboration is absolutely essential to optimise research outcomes for both nations. This arrangement will now place our two nations at the forefront of defence technological research. And through both these two new defence arrangements, we will work more seamlessly together to shape Order, an open, Senator inclusive Reynolds, and time prosperous Indo-Pacific. Senator McLaughlin, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on the growth of Australia's defence cooperation with India and next steps for our engagement? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. 
It's very pleasing to see that our defence relationship with India continues to grow and to mature. The number of shared activities between the two of us has increased fourfold over the last six years alone. And last year, our bilateral cooperation reached new heights with the conduct of Exercise Ausindex, which is our most complex military exercise together to date. For the first time, our navies undertook anti-submarine warfare exercises together, and our P-8 maritime surveillance and response aircraft flew coordinated missions in the Bay of Bengal. The time is now right for both our nations to increase defence engagement and also cooperation. Our new comprehensive strategic partnership will enable this more complex and comprehensive joint activities, but it will also deepen our cooperation so that we together can address the challenges we both face in our region. Senator McLaughlin, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the importance of Australia's defence relationship with India in the Indo-Pacific? Senator Reynolds. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, India and Australia are not only strong economic partners, but we are also natural security partners, particularly in the Indian Ocean. And as a West Australian, I am particularly cognisant of this. Our shared security challenges in the Indian Ocean include maritime threats terrorism and natural disaster response. All of these have significant implications for the economic prosperity of both our nations. It is in Australia's national interest to work with India to address these challenges, both bilaterally, trilaterally and also multilaterally, through international forums such as the Indian Ocean Rim Association. There has never been a more important time for Australia to work with India and other like-minded nations to shape a prosperous, open and a stable post-COVID Indo-Pacific. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Sophie from Rose Bay in Tasmania is pregnant with her second child. She lost her work contract due to COVID-19 and needed to stay home to homeschool her five-year-old son. As a result, Centrelink have told her that she will no longer qualify for paid parental leave. She could not have planned for this situation. Why does the government believe women like Sophie should not have access to paid parental leave? The Minister for Women, Senator Payne. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And, uh, I'll take the details of the specific case on notice and refer that to the responsible minister for further information. Mm -hmm. As I've said in the chamber before, Nobody is able to plan for a pandemic. Nobody is able to plan for an economic response that has taken this government to extraordinary ends to address the challenges that the entire Order. country uh, is dealing with. And we have sought very, very hard to work with those opposite, in fact, and to work with uh, the states and the territories in the process of that economic response. As Senator McAllister has raised specific issues in relation to an individual, I'll take those, as I said, on notice. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Thank you. Last week, the government voted against women like Sophie retaining their eligibility for paid parental leave. Sophie's child is due in September. She has struggled to find a new job. The government's decision means she only has weeks to find a way to replace the paid parental leave she was going to rely on. Why is the government punishing women like Sophie for the economic consequences of COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And there are a number of supports available to families who don't currently meet the paid parental leave tests. Uh, those who have lost a job or have reduced hours during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, should appropriately check with, their, check with their employer if they're in the first instance eligible for a JobKeeper payment. We also recently amended the Paid Parental Leave Act to allow for the period a person receives the JobKeeper payment to count toward the Paid Parental Leave Work Test. Uh, parents who have lost their job but don't meet the Paid Parental Leave Work Test and are not eligible for the JobKeeper payment may be eligible for other payments, such as the Parenting Payment, the Job Seeker Payment, which of course currently includes the $550 fortnightly coronavirus supplement as well as possibly being eligible for family tax benefit uh, and uh, both parts A and part B, as well as the newborn 
supplement and the newborn upfront payment uh, of up to uh, $2,239 for the first child, $1,120 for subsequent. Expired. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. Last Monday, the government announced it would force working women to pay childcare fees they couldn't afford. Last Thursday, the government voted against helping pregnant women affected by COVID-19 who are out of work because of COVID-19. Are there any women that the government is prepared to support? Senator Payne. Mr. President, um, I think Senator McAllister is not helping her own cause or anyone else's, frankly, uh, in, uh, in that statement. Clearly, the economic initiatives that the government has advanced in terms of the COVID uh, response are to help all Australians. All Australians. And what I have, what I and others have made clear in relation to the childcare sector is that the sec well, Senator McAllister. Order. Order. Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. As, uh, as I have made clear, and the Minister, uh, Minister Tian, has made clear, in working with the sector, the changes that the government made in recent weeks to address the childcare sector were very much needed by the sector to ensure it was able to survive and to ensure that it could offer increased care and to ensure that those parents seeking more care were able to obtain it. And a transition payment is being provided by the government, which complements the uh, JobKeeper payment Order, that was Senator previously Payne, in time place for the as part of has that support. Expired. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. How is the Morrison government ensuring vulnerable women and children experiencing or at risk of all forms of violence are supported during the coronavirus pandemic? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much, Senator Hughes, for a question on this particularly important matter. Um, the federal government continues to work um, with the sector and with individuals to make sure that women and their children are supported and have the necessary avenues, should they need, to be assisted uh, as a response to family and domestic violence. And over the past few months during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, my colleague, uh, the Minister for Women, Senator Payne, and myself have been working very closely with the state and territory ministers to make sure that. Um, our response is, is appropriate, that we have made sure that we've got all the safety measures in place, uh, particularly recognising that it's actually the states and territories who have the primary responsibility for the delivery of frontline services to women uh, who find themselves in a situation of needing help. But in addition to that, the Morrison government has made available $150 million uh, on top of the existing money that we put into the national plan to reduce violence against women uh, and their children. And as part of that $150 million, $20 million has been invested to increase the capacity of national initiatives uh, that were already in, uh, included in the plan, but to make sure that they are supercharged. Because we don't know, we didn't know at the start of this pandemic, and we still are unsure of what kind of support women are going to need. But as restrictions are starting to be lifted, uh, we need to make sure that we're in a position that we have all of the support services in place so that if women need um, our support, that they are able to get it. So this could include such things as counselling support for families um, or at-risk people. Um, it could also include um, men's behaviour change programs to make sure uh, that we're providing not just short-term but medium and longer-term response to support men during this time. Um, 1800 Respect, making sure that there is sufficient resources to make sure that any woman who needs to access help is able to get it in a very timely manner. Order. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you. How has the government ensured all Australians have access to information about domestic, family and sexual violence and the importance for those affected to seek help? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. During the COVID um, pandemic, it has been uh, very challenging to make sure that all women and children, um, and, and men for that matter, uh, have got access to timely and appropriate information to make sure that they can get the support that they need should they find themselves in a situation of domestic violence. Um, a number of initiatives have been put in place, but uh, one of the most critical information campaigns that we launched during this time is the Help Is Here campaign. And the critical message of the Help Is Here campaign is firstly to make sure that, that people know where they are able to get access to the supports they need should they find themselves in a situation of needing that, but also to really reinforce the message that tough times do not excuse tough times at home. 
So the Help Each Here campaign has used a number of different types of media uh, and traditional media, but particularly we wanted to use more innovative ways. And I'd like to thank the supermarkets, um, Woolies, uh, Coles, Audi and Metcash for making sure that they made available the information in women's restrooms and the like Order, so that Senator women could get it. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister highlight the importance of an appropriately executed parliamentary inquiry into family, domestic and sexual violence? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, it is very important that uh, the inquiry that was referred uh, by myself and the Minister for Women, Minister Payne, recently to the Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs um, was clearly uh, around two things. One was to make sure that we didn't miss the opportunity to learn through this particularly intense pandemic uh, the impacts of the kind of crisis this is on women and their children uh, as it related to, to domestic violence. The second aspect of this that we thought was very important is as we come up to the, the conclusion of the fourth action plan for the protection of women uh, and their children, um, we thought it was a time that we needed to have a look at what was working and what wasn't working. We needed to listen to the experience of the sector, learn how various government services in the community, what they had to say and what they thought we should take into the next plan. But most particularly, we wanted to make sure that we have a platform to make sure all Australians understand that we all have a responsibility if we're really going to make a difference. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much. After that great answer, I ask that further questions be placed in the notice paper. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Gallagher and Green. Well, the question asked by Credit Suisse is, is the home builder scheme big enough to really move the needle? Well, Credit Suisse, of course, answered that, that question in their briefing note because they say no. They say it's disappointingly small. They say we doubt the incentives are large enough or the eligibility criteria wide enough to really move the needle. Well, Senator Cormann has explained that this program is going to support 140,000 direct jobs. Well, we'll see whether or not that comes about, because it is telling that even in providing that answer, Senator Cormann was very careful to say that these are estimates only. And we've learned quite a lot about estimates in recent months, haven't we? We've learned quite a lot about the government's capacity to accurately estimate the take-up of their programs, the cost to the budget and the impact on the economy. Because it was a pretty big failure in estimating when it came to JobKeeper, and I have very little confidence in the answer provided today by the minister. And the truth is, that's true for his colleagues as well. And that's why the member for Herbert has gone on the record raising concerns about the program. That's why the member for Leichhardt has raised concerns about the program. And it's why Senator Canavan, represented in this chamber, representing the National Party, is raising concerns about the program. Because anyone who looks at it closely, looks at the fundamentals, at the architecture of this program, knows that it all looks pretty improbable. Australians who earn less than $125,000 a year are expected to spend more than $150,000 on a renovation. Not only that, they're expected to enter into the contract now with no certainty about whether they qualify for the grant. And more broadly, people are generally concerned about their economic position. And it's no more so than in regional Australia. It's one thing to cap a program out at an individual income of $125,000 or a household income of $200,000. What do people think the actual median household income is? What does the coalition actually believe is going on in normal households in regional Australia? Well, I can tell you that in New South Wales, the median income for a household outside of the Sydney metropolitan area is $45,000. That's the expenditure in a regional area uh, like the seat of Page, an area I spend quite a bit of time in. Does the government really think that people whose disposable income 
at a household level each year is $45,000, are going to be able to stump up the cash to meet the $150,000 threshold that is necessary to even qualify for a program of this kind. Is that really what they think? Well, certainly members of your own government don't believe so, because the member for Herbert are raising concerns, is raising concerns that renovations for houses in his electorate won't get anywhere near the $150,000 threshold. That's what the, menace, the member for Leichhardt is raising. Clearly, those people understand that in their areas people do not earn these vast amounts of money that are assumed by the people sitting around in the government benches. Perhaps they haven't saved the money. Perhaps on their $45,000 disposable income a year they haven't been able to save, put aside in the bank, $150,000. Perhaps they could borrow it. Well, what is the one thing that has been raised over and over and over again by the RBA? over the last 18 months. It is the vulnerability of the economy produced exactly by indebtedness, by rising debt to income ratios. Perhaps that is what the member for New England was talking about. Perhaps that was his concern when he said, I'm concerned about the complexity of trying to pay back that debt. Perhaps that's what Senator Canavan was concerned about when he said, I'm worried we're putting ourselves in a weaker position if asset prices in Australia were to fall. People are not sitting on $150,000 waiting, waiting to splash it on a home renovation, and they're not in a position to borrow it. The government's program is not going to produce a much-needed boost for the construction sector. It's not going to help Australian families. It's poorly targeted, and as the Grattan Institute has said, it is classic retail politics, but lousy economics, which is exactly what you'd expect from Scotty from Marketing. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and in taking note of answers today, I do just want to pick on a, uh, a couple of the comments that Senator McAllister just made uh, regarding the concern that Australians have for their economic position. Because, to be honest, I agree with Senator McAllister. I think Australians are certainly uh, concerned about their economic position currently and, and their livelihood, as you would only expect during a pandemic that has had uh, catastrophic impacts upon our economy. But I also think, and here is where I think uh, Senator McAllister's, McAllister's and my views might start to diverge, I think most Australians are, are confident that the plan that the Morrison Coalition government has to handle the economy coming out of the coronavirus crisis is, is a good one, and that's because this government has been able to demonstrate to the Australian people that we are capable of injecting jobs into the economy. We are capable of strong, responsible budgetary management. And most importantly, we are capable of doing both of those things concurrently, uh, which is more than I can say for my friends on the opposition benches when they were in government. As Senator Cormann said in his answer today, uh, this government is about jobs, jobs and jobs. And that is something that we delivered on uh, leading up into the coronavirus crisis. We injected 1.5 million jobs into the Australian economy, and that is something that I certainly am incredibly proud of, to be part of a government that successfully uh, did that. As I've said in this place many times, the reason I uh, nominated to uh, be a candidate as a senator for Tasmania was because I've seen too many young Tasmanians have to leave home because they can't get jobs locally. And, and I know, uh, being a young Australian, uh, coming out of the coronavirus crisis, many young Australians are concerned about their livelihood and they are concerned about uh, being able to get a job or keep a job. Uh, and that's why the plan that this government has to ensure that the Australian job market can recover from the coronavirus crisis is so important. I don't want us to see us lose the momentum that we have, uh, particularly in my own state of Tasmania, where as we know, with Liberal governments, state and federally, our state has come a very long way uh, in the last five or six years, and I don't want to see us go back to the dark old economic days. Obviously, the government's focus at the moment is on the health and wellbeing of Australians, and we are seeing great success on the health front. Uh, but we know, as I said, that the impacts of coronavirus across the economy have been severe. 
Businesses and households are facing increased uncertainty and economic activity has slowed. That's why we have put an economic support package in place to provide timely support to affected workers, businesses and the broader community. And this has helped keep Australians in work and businesses in business. Uh, we've put a floor under the economy and we will lay the foundation for a strong economic recovery coming out of the coronavirus crisis. We are focused on reopening and rebuilding. We need to get businesses back open, enable Australians to go back to work and ensure consumers and businesses have the confidence to return to normal activities. And that's why the home builder policy is so important. It was why our job keeper uh, package was so important. These are the measures that the Australian government, the Morrison coalition government, have put in place to ensure that we can rebound from the coronavirus crisis into just as prosperous and successful a nation and successful economy as we were in prior to this. Madam Deputy President, I turned 30 years old just a couple of weeks ago, and when I was thinking about uh, this significant birthday, I did reflect on the fact that so many Australians uh, my age are going to be experiencing most likely a recession for the first time uh, at some point over the next six months. Uh, it's been 29 years since Australia last had a recession. And that is incredibly hard, and it will be hard on young Australians to uh, navigate their way through that and the stresses that that will put upon their work prospects. But young Australians also know that this government has a strong uh, economic policy in place to help us recover from the coronavirus, and that is built on the trust that we have with the Australian people. The trust that is built upon our record, our record of creating 1.5 million jobs in just over five years. That is the record of this government, and it is because of that record that the Australian people have faith in us as a government to rebuild following the coronavirus crisis, to make sure that more young Australians can keep themselves in jobs for now and into the foreseeable future. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thanks, uh, Madam Deputy President. And, uh, as we speak, I'm just concluding the build of a house. So I've had the uh, great experience of interacting with subcontractors, tradies and uh, small businesses in the building industry. And they are looking at a, a cliff of unemployment. The pipeline is definitely drying up. And I think that they were all quite excited with the announcement of Home Builder. But, as has been pointed out in this chamber today, the actual tailoring of this scheme doesn't do what its intended purpose should be. And that is to get people continuing to work. So the builders I've spoken to, the tradespeople I've spoken to, say that come December of this year, all the new bills that commenced 12 months ago will be finished, the pipeline is diminished, and this scheme just doesn't do it. The age, experts pan the scheme. The financial review, flaws highlighted. The Weekend Australia, home builder doesn't do enough for tradies. The Guardian, a blunder. Mr Harry uh, Trigamoff doesn't address units. They're excluded. And the Canberra Times points out very precisely that people and victims of the bushfires are also excluded. So when you look at this scheme and you see who the architect is, the assistant treasurer, I think, Mr Suka, your mind goes back to an earlier scheme where, when we asked, was there any treasury expertise uh, used in designing this type of scheme? Did he get any economic rationale? And the answer was no. And this is the uh, first home buyer scheme that was announced during the election. And what is very clear when you go into these sorts of policies, there is always agreement among economists. It is exceedingly difficult to work out the economic rationale for it. And if you have ever built your own house or gone into a contract with a builder, they are business people, and what they will try and do is get you to put a fancy heater in, some floors in, and borrow the money to do that. Now, if this 25,000 goes into a new build, and the end result is that a, a, a first home buyer says, "Oh, I can now put in a $12,000 floor 
or I can put in a fancy heater. <laughs> the reality is that's an awful economic decision because you shouldn't be borrowing that over 25 years. Bricks and mortar, fair enough, but the furnishings and the fixtures and fittings. And I've actually heard stories of builders saying, don't worry, with that contract you signed last month, we'll tear it up and do a new one because you'll get 25 grand. Uh, we're looking after you. So the economic evaluation of these schemes is that they're really not uh, as economically good as they're purported to be. And so this is exceedingly bad uh, timing in sort of uh, it's quick. You've got to do it by I think the fourth of December. 150000 for a renovation? I chose to knock down a house because it was going to cost me 60000 to do a renovation. Why would I spend 150000 in most areas outside of capital city, Melbourne and uh, Sydney on a renovation? I mean, you can get a house and land package in the outskirts of Adelaide for 300000 All right, as you move in, 10, 15 k's or 8 k's from the city, that package is more likely to be 600. But you know, these figures don't stack up. So is it another case of Mr Sucker getting some very targeted policy to go where he thinks there's a few votes? Because it doesn't seem to be broad enough to do what he's actually intending, which is keep people employed, to build the pipeline of work. It's tightly constrained. It appears to be targeted, but we don't see the underpinning uh, economic rationale for that. And it may well be at estimates and the like when we ask for that sort of rationale, it may well be it comes back to the standard answer is it was a decision of government, we didn't give advice on it. Now hopefully that's not the case because I really would like to see the underpinning economic evaluation of this policy as to why it's targeted in such a way. And the opposition has rightfully put up the task or the challenge to the government, why have you not done any public housing? Why is there no public housing policy for this government? Why wouldn't you use this as a time to prime that pump and to get some building into that vital sector where there is a desperate need for it? Clearly the government's gone missing. Uh, Senator Rennick. Thanks, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I don't know about you, but there seems to be a smell wafting through this place. At first I thought it might have been a leaked septic tank, but no, it turns out it's the Australian Labor Party. Because we find out that not only are they trying to get into the coffers of the hard-working Australians by ripping out their union fees and by dipping into their superannuation funds, they find out that they're branch stacking. And the worst thing about these allegations is, is the tawdry language. Senator Rennick, the tawdry please, language. Please, I'm getting there. I'm coming there. Senator Rennick, there's yep. a point of order. Please resume your seat. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Madam Deputy President, is in taking note of answers. The the senator opposite appears to be. Egregiously off topic. Off Thank topic. you, um, Senator Galletra. As you know, this is a broad ranging debate, and I was just waiting to see if Senator Rennick was getting to the, the questions. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Rennick. Deputy Speaker, and I was, because this side of the chamber wants to get people and wants to stack families into homes. And that is why we are, pre are very proud of the Home Builder program, because it will support up to a million jobs indirectly and 140,000 jobs indirectly. And can I say, Madam Deputy Speaker, that homes are in the DNA of the Liberal Party? And why do we know that? Because in our party's uh, opening speech from our founder, Robert Menzies, he mentions the word no less than 23 times. And I'm going to quote this because it's worth remembering. As, as Robert Menzies said, I do not believe that the real life of this nation is to be found in either great luxury hotels and the petty gossip of so-called fashionable suburbs. It is to be found in the homes of people who are nameless and, ad and unadvertised. And whatever their individual religious conviction or dogma, see in their children their greatest contribution to the immortality of their race. The home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is the indispensable condition of continuity. The health determines the, its health determines the health of society as a whole. And this party is proud to support jobs and it is proud to support our building industry, which will, only, which will, also, which will help our carpenters, our builders, our, bri our brickies, our electricians. And it will help small traders, it will help architects, it will help home designers, it will help engineers. 
And I should also say that the party has also helped this year by helping with the first home loan deposit scheme to help eligible first home buyers purchase the modest home with a deposit as little as 5 per cent, allowing them to get into the market earlier. Australian first home buyers have now reserved all of this year's financial first home loan deposit scheme guarantees. And that is a good indication of how our younger people want to get into housing. Because as we've said as I've said previously, housing is where the home is, it's where the heart is, it is where the family is. And there is no greater proof of our indication of our support for the Australian people than supporting people into homes. Because this side of the chamber is about supporting people into homes. That side of the chamber is about homelessness. This side of the chamber is about lower taxes. That side of the chamber is about higher taxes. This side of the chamber is about jobs. That side of the chamber is about no jobs. And most of all, this side of the chamber is the party of free choice, whereas that party side of the chamber is the party or the side of total control. And we also support, and I'll just pick up uh, Senator Gallagher there, we actually do support uh, uh, community housing. Uh, we have over $1.3 billion in the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation program, uh, and we also support the delivery of 1,500 new social and affordable dwell dwellings and the refinancing of a further 5,000 existing dwellings. On top of that, we also provide uh, Rent Seeker on top of uh, the New Start allowance, which is another way in which we support housing in this country. Uh, Home Builder will work with the uh, state and territories on this, and they are expected to be well placed to administer the Home Builder program, as most already administer similar first home buyer schemes, including the first home owner grant and the stamp duty concessions through their respective state or territory revenue office. And the government's focus on health and the well-being of Australians is why we support home ownership. And we are seeing success on that. This is the party that will increase the level of home ownership. It will, and by doing that, we will improve the health of Australians. You know, when we were going through the COVID crisis, it was great to have a home to go back to and, and, and it's the support. And it's interesting, actually, the feedback we get from people now, how much they enjoyed spending it, how much they enjoyed spending time at home with their children. Uh, heaven forbid. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I'll um, leave it at that. Cheers. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Ayres. Well, it's always a um, special experience following uh, Senator Rennick uh, in one of these debates. Um, it's like a sort of um, I, I, I think it's, uh, it should be illegal, the, uh, the feeling it gives one listening to Senator Rennick's uh, lofty tones going through the um, oh, going through the debate. He's Senator, the Ayres. Senator Ayres, please resume your seat. Senator Rennick. Point of order there. Could he please uh, deal with the question on notice, please? Thank you. And uh, I remind Senator Ayres, this is a broad-ranging debate and I'm giving him the opportunity to get there. Uh, he's only for 20 odd seconds in. Thank you, Senator. Ayers. I, I, I certainly intend to get to the substance of the um, of the debate, but I did want to reflect um, reflect on the previous contribution. It's a transcendental experience, really, listening to Senator Rennick. He's the beat poet of the Senate. It's a sort of series of of um, uh, odd allusions brought together that make uh, that make very little very little sense. Almost as much sense as the policy justification for home builder that's been made here and in other places. I understand that Mr Sukar said that it would support 140,000 jobs, 27,000 building projects. I mean, just combining those two numbers for a minute makes you realise how fundamentally uh, ill-conceived uh, the policy foundations of this scheme are. It has all the hallmarks of a Morrison government policy announcement. It will increase inequality. It will provide negligible stimulus. There's a very big number attached to the program—$688 million. So a very big number. By not being a round number, it conveys the impression that it's somehow precise. So the number's big, conveys the impression of precision. But there will, of course, be like all of these schemes, zero delivery. 
very little money will go out the door. It's all about the announcement, not about the delivery. No doubt there's a television ad coming our way soon to make sure that people understand how precisely large the amount of money is, how precisely precise it is, how, what enormous stimulus it will provide. No doubt there will be people in high-vis jackets. Maybe they could borrow Senator Canavan's high-vis jacket. It doesn't get much use. Uh, no doubt there will be earnest expressions of support for the tradespeople of Australia, but zero delivery. It's a scheme that will pay people a small amount of money in the context of an overall building project to do building projects or renovations that they were going to do anyway. You can't find a person in the building industry, a serious person in the building industry, who supports this proposition. You certainly can't find a sensible economist, you know, one with a degree and a bit of postgraduate uh, learning who's prepared to go out and publicly advocate for this scheme. It is all spin, no substance, big announcement, no delivery. And some people, sceptical people, believe that this announcement's all about the politics. I'm not sure that that's true. I'm not sure that that's true. I don't think, I think you would struggle to find a household in Eden Monero that will benefit from the home builder scheme. All of the focus group work, all of the data work, all of the sort of clever work that, that is done in the Liberal Party National Secretariat has produced this policy as somehow a policy that's going to provide some advantage. But the problem is when it meets the real world, there won't be too many people. 22,000, Senator Cormann said, had registered interest already, which just establishes that the people who are registering interest for this project are people who would already decided to build. It is just like a vacuum sucking forward uh, projects that people were proposing to do, dragging them into this side of Christmas. And what that means is no extra work will actually be done. It will just shift when small building projects were going to be done. What an extraordinary claim that this, pro that this program will support 140,000 additional jobs. If you look at median and house prices in Cooma, 317,500. It's very hard to imagine that $150,000 renovation is going to be done to one of those homes. It's a program that will overcapitalise a very small number of people's property. It won't deliver a single extra job. Uh, and it will be uh, just Peter one more Ayres, policy your time failure has from the expired. government. So the question is that the motion is moved to take note of answers moved by Senator McAllister to be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the uh, response given to me by Senator Payne, uh, the Foreign Minister, in relation to my question about Australian citizen uh, Calm you. Gillespie, who's just been sentenced to the death penalty. Um, in Guangzhou in China. Um, like many uh, Australians, I was appalled to learn over the weekend that Calm Gillespie was sentenced to death last week. And even though Mr Gillespie had been detained in China since late 2013, uh, some six and a half years, the Australian public only became aware of this case when the Guangzhou Intermediate People's Court posted a notice on its website. This is in stark contra contrast, of course, to other cases where Australians overseas face the death penalty, like the Bali Nine in Indonesia, for example. Australian media reported on that trial. The Australians shared uh, the pain of Andrew Chan and Myaran Sukumaran's loved ones as they were sentenced to death and then sadly executed on the 25th of April, uh, 29th of April 2015. Uh, we campaigned for clemency and we did what we could to support them during their time in prison. In the case of Calm Gillespie, the Australian public has been kept in the dark. I spoke just last week in this place about China's opaque and unjust judicial system where the right to a fair trial doesn't exist. We've seen this time and time again. Um, there is the case of Australian academic Dr Yang, who's been charged with espionage, even though we haven't seen any evidence against him. Dr Yang's been held for long periods of isolation and there are serious concerns at his treatment. 
And then there are the Australians, permanent residents and their family members who have been caught up in the crackdown against the Uyghurs in China's Xinjiang province, which I also spoke about in this place last week. At least in those cases, we have been aware of their detention and have been able to raise our concerns publicly, which is why the Australian government must let the public know when it first became aware of Mr Gillespie's arrest and at what levels and what times it has raised his case with the Chinese government. While it's well and good to offer a private briefing to senators and MPs on consular matters, especially given that Senate estimates didn't occur in May, unless there's a genuine concern that it would further imperil an Australian citizen, it's not a substitute for providing this information to the Australian public. In Mr Gillespie's case, the softly, softly approach clearly has not worked. Furthermore, it's critical that we know how many more Australian citizens or permanent residents are stuck in jail in China and how many of them are at risk of facing the death penalty during this particularly difficult period in our relationship with China. Um, in my final few minutes, I'd like to move on to another troubling, troubling consular case in that region, that of Chow Van Kam. Uh, Mr Chow is a, re a retired baker from Sydney, and today he'll be spending his 71st birthday in a remote prison in Vietnam. He was convicted of terrorism late last year and sentenced to 12 years in prison, all because of his affiliation and activities with an opposition political party. Mr Chow has not been accused of violence or attempted violence, but was convicted regardless following a four-and-a-half-hour trial. Vietnam is a one-party state that does not tolerate dissent. Mr Chow is currently one of more than 160 political prisoners in the country, and he's not spoken to his wife or children since his arrest 18 months ago, and consular officials haven't been allowed to visit since January. We call on the Australian government to redouble its efforts to free Mr Chow. We must demand that Vietnam release him on humanitarian grounds as an immediate priority, given his age, medical condition and his risk of serious illness if he contracts coronavirus. Chow Van Kam should be at home with his family on his 71st, birth 71st birthday, not languishing in a Vietnamese prison. Um, Senator Waters, before I put your taking note motion, I just remind you that um, you really do need to speak about the answers you've taken note of, so the latter part of your contribution wasn't that. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Waters to take note be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. So we'll now move to um, notices of motion to be given for another day. We have any of those, Senator Waters? Uh, yes, Deputy President. Can I uh, seek leave to defer uh, notice of motion number 650 in my name to tomorrow, please? So is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. 650. Thank you. Um, Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Griff. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Griff for the 15th to the 18th of June 2020 for personal reasons. So um, the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. I seek leave to move a motion of leave of absence for a senator. I'm just not sure if your mic is on. I heard that, but I know you're seeking leave. Is leave granted? A leave is granted. Senator Seward. Uh, I, seek leave, uh, I seek leave of absence for Senator Rice for last Friday, the 12th of June. Okay, I'll just alert um, the broadcasting. I don't believe that Senator Seward's mic is on, but I know she's seeking leave. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seward to seek leave of absence be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. No further motions? No. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. I'll call the clerk. Movement notifications have been lodged as followed. Uh, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young for today, postponed to the 16th of June. Uh, general business notice of motion 659, standing in the name of Senator Seward for today, postponed to the 16th of June 2020. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 10 on today's order of business. Thank you. <clears throat> I 
I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and we will start with general business notice of motion number 653, standing in the name of Senator Di Natale. Do you want me to come back to that? Okay. Uh, so we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 655, standing in the, same, in the name of Senator Dean Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 655 relating to the Queen's birthday honours be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Smith be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 656, standing in the name of Senator Brown. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senator Billick will also sponsor the motion. Thank you. I ask that general business notice of motion number 656 relating to Auslan be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Urquhart, standing in the names of Senator Brown and Billick, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 657, standing in the name of Senator Lyons and others. Um, Senator Walsh. <laughs> Uh, Deputy President, before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators Faruqi and O'Neill will also sponsor the motion. Thank you, Senator Walsh. I ask that general business notice of motion number 657 standing in my name and the names of Senators Sheldon, Watt, Wong and Lyons relating to the International Day of Justice for Cleaners be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Walsh. Deputy President, I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Walsh with the addition of the names be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 660, standing in the name of Senator Seawirt. 660? Yes. Yeah. Um, I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 660, propo proposing an order for the production of documents concerning the Abbotsford Service Centre before asking for it to be taken as formal. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Seward. I amend the motion. The terms circulate in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Uh, so the uh, the question is that the motion be taken as formal. Any objection? There being none. Um, so I'm going to put the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by as amended by Senator Seward to be agreed to. Are you seeking the call, Senator Dunny? You're going to move it. Yes. Beg your pardon. Yes. That would be a good idea. Thank you. Senator Dunian. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. The landlord of the Yarra Service Centre in Abbotsford advised Services Australia through its legal representative on 12 May 2020 that it will not, to agree, uh, not agree to any lease extension beyond the 22nd of May 2020, uh, 2020 under any circumstance. Then, on 21 May 2020, Services Australia received an offer via text message to allow an extension to the lease for three months. Late on 21 May 2020, Services Australia received a signed three-month lease extension. As leases come up for renewal, the opportunity is taken to review the servicing options to ensure the agency provides a sustainable and accessible and fit-for-purpose network of service centres. So the question is that the motion as amended by Senator Seward be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now go back to... Oh, Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Um, I should have done this earlier, sorry, but I, um, it's in relation to motion 633 in the name of Senator Dodson. Um, I wish to withdraw that motion. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. 633 has been withdrawn. So we now move to general business notice of motion number 653, standing in the name of Senator Di Natale. <coughs> 
Uh, Deputy President, uh, I ask the General Business Notice of Motion number 653 relating to healthcare professionals be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy President. I'll move the motion. So the question is that General Bis I oh, beg your pardon, Senator Dunningham. Statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank, Thank you. you, Madam Deputy President. The government acknowledges and thanks our healthcare professionals for their contribution to keeping Australians safe. The highest priority of the government is to secure and supply PPE to keep our healthcare workers safe. To date, we've secured more than half a billion masks into the national medical stockpile and dispatched more than 46 million masks into hospitals, aged care facilities, GPs, dentists, pharmacies, Aboriginal controlled community health organisations and NDIS registered providers and self-managed participants. As such, the government is pleased to support this motion and is delivering on calls made by the senator. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Thank you. We support this motion. We acknowledge and praise the work and commitment of Australia's healthcare professionals and healthcare workers. These valued Australians provide compassion, care and support for many everyday Australians in need. Referring to Clause C, though, we note that nations like Taiwan which have a similar population to Australia, quickly learned that they just had to isolate the sick and the vulnerable. And that allowed healthy and productive people and businesses to keep working and earning money. The result is that their economy remained healthy and they had far fewer deaths than in Australia. The truth is that this government did not refresh Australia's COVID strategy in April, when Taiwan and other nations proved that their strategy worked and was far superior to ours. The government has exposed healthcare professionals to a needless risk. So the question is that the general business notice of motion is moved by Senator Di Natale, 653 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 648, standing in the name of Senator Watt and others. Senator Urquhart. Um, Madam Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 648, standing in the names of Senators Watt, Chisholm and Green, relating to the Brisbane Sikh Temple, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? Um, I'm just seeking formality first. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Scar. Is leave granted? Um, I need to hear a voice, one way or the other. Yes, for one minute. Madam Deputy President, last Thursday the Senate passed Motion 606, whereby the Senate expressed its deep appreciation to members of the Brisbane Sikh Temple for their assistance to people in need during the coronavirus pandemic. This motion replicates much of that motion, except it now contains a critique of the Morrison government and it quotes me in certain respects, albeit accurately. Madam Deputy President, this should not be about politics. This should not be about the government. This should not be about the opposition. This should certainly not be about me. What it should be about is the generosity of spirit of the members of the Brisbane Sikh Temple, their kindness, their generosity, and how their actions reflect the best of Australian values. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 648, standing in the name of Senator Watt and others, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 665, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I ask General Business Notice of Motion number 665 relating to Australian stories and streaming services be taken as formal. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Hanson Young. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Thank Senator you, Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the government response to the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission's digital platforms inquiry included a staged process to reform media regulation towards an end state of a platform neutral regulatory framework covering online and offline delivery of media content to consumers. An options paper authored by Screen Australia and the Australian Communications and Media Authority to consider how best to support Australian stories on screens in a modern multi-platform environment is open for consultation until 3 July this year. 
The government will consider stakeholder responses, including the extent of Australian content obligations on free-to-air television and whether there should be an Australian content obligations on streaming uh, on streaming on-demand services. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 665, standing in the name of Senator Hanson Young, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 649, standing in the name of Senators Patrick and Urquhart. Senator Patrick. Thank you. Um um, Madam Deputy President, I ask that general business notice of motion number four, uh, 649, proposing an order for production of documents concerning the Defence Honours and Award Appeals Tribunal, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patrick. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I move the motion. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number. I'll beg your pardon, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I request um, uh, leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Lambie. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Teddy Sheehan earned a Victoria Cross, and there's not a soul in this chamber that denies that. The only thing that some of you aren't sure about is whether to give it to him. That's all this is about. It's government policy that you won't give a Victoria Cross to somebody who didn't receive it at the time unless there's compelling new evidence. But that's not a legal position or legal requirement or a legal defence. It is just a policy preference. You don't dispute that what's in front of you is enough to give Teddy a Victoria Cross, but you won't give it to him. Guess what? It is not yours. It is his. An independent expert tribunal found that you earned that cross. Give him what he's owed. You are no longer denying a hero his honour. And it's your policy preference and your bloody stupid captain's poor call that is reflecting on that. Thank you, Senator Lambie. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Thank Senator you, Dunning. Madam Deputy President. Ordinary seaman Edward or Teddy Sheehan was an extraordinary Australian and, an Australian and Australia will remain eternally grateful for his service and his sacrifice. Given there are different views on whether there is compelling new evidence about Teddy Sheehan's actions, the Prime Minister has commissioned an expert panel to provide advice as to whether the 2019 review by the Defence Honours and Award and Appeals Tribunal has had any significant new evidence that is compelling enough to support a recommendation to award Teddy Sheehan a Victoria Cross. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 649, standing in the name of Senators Patrick and Urquhart, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 658, standing in the name of Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy Your President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 658, relating to First Nations peoples, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seward. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I again seek leave to make a short statement. Yes, I believe it's been agreed. 90 yes, seconds? slightly longer. No. 90 Thank seconds you, has Madam been agreed. Deputy Thank President. you, Senator Dunningham. As the Prime Minister said at a press conference on 12 June, and I quote, in Australia we know we have had problems in our past. We have acknowledged those, and indeed in our federal parliament we have acknowledged those. I've always said we need to look at our history. The comments I was referring to was how the New South Wales settlement was first established and the views that were communicated at the time in informing the New South Wales colony. And if you go back to people like William Wilberforce and others, they were very involved in the First Fleet expedition. And one of the principles was to be that Australia, or in that case New South Wales, was not to have lawful slavery. And that was indeed the case. There was not, uh, there was not the laws that have ever approved of slavery in this country. So I don't intend to get into the history wars. My comments were not intended to give offence, and if they did, I deeply regret that and apologise for that. This is not about getting into the history wars. I was simply trying to make the point that Australia, yes, we have had issues in our history. We have acknowledged them, I have acknowledged them, and we need to address them. And particularly those who I work closely with in this area would know that. Order. Personally, I have been heavily invested in these issues. So the question is that general I oh, beg your pardon, Senator Roberts. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. We support this motion. The Queensland State Parliament's member for the electorate of Mirani is a direct descendant from the Vanuatu Kanaks, blackbirded into slavery to work on North Queensland cane fields in the late 19th and early 20th century. 
Stephen Andrew is proud of his ancestry and proud of his service to our state and country in parliament and in the North Queensland community where he proudly lives a free man. One Nation, the people of Morani and I are proud of Steve Andrew's service to our state and country. He and we are proud of his heritage. He and we want our country's history to be told honestly. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 658 standing in the name of Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 581 standing in the name of Senator Polly. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 581 stand in the name of Senator Polly relating to the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 581 standing in the name of Senator Polly be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Um, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells? So the question is that general business notice of motion number 581, standing in the name of Senator Polly, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I advise senators that there may be further divisions. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 652, standing in the name of Senators Waters and Rice. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. Um, before moving that motion number 652 be taken as formal, I seek leave to amend the return date by one additional sitting day. Uh, to Wednesday, the 17th of June. Uh, is leave granted? Yeah. Leave is granted, Senator Waters. Thanks very much. I ask that general business notice of motion number 652 as amended, standing in my name and the name of Senator Rice, proposing an order for the production of documents concerning the community development grants be taken as a formal motion. So the question. Oh, Senator Patrick, are you seeking the call? Yes, I, I um, would ask that this uh, motion be split into uh, part one and then together two, three and four. Part one and then two, three and four together. So the question is, and I apologise for not knowing precisely which section the amendment is in, but we're going to move to part one. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 652, standing in the name of Senators Waters and Rice, part one be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, we'll now move to the rest of that amendment. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 652. Uh, Parts two, three and four, standing in the name of Senators Waters and Rice, be agreed to. And, um, it's an amended motion. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Senator Seaworth. Sorry. Stop the bells. Before we put this to a formal vote, I'll just advise the Senate on date. So we split uh, this motion into part one, which we voted on, and then the rest of the motion, which is two, three, and four. On part one, you will recall, recall that Senator uh, Waters sought an amendment to change the date from the 16th of June to the 17th of June. That then required a change of date in two. Um, from the 17th of June to the 18th of June. So, with the concurrence of the Senate, um, we'll put the motion that way. So, the question is that the amended motions, parts two, three, and four of General Business Notice of Motion number 652, standing in the name of Senators Waters and Rice, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes.
order, there being 26 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <coughs> we now move to general business, notice of motion number 662, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 662 relating to universities and JobKeeper be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Australian universities remain eligible for JobKeeper if they satisfy the relevant criteria. Our COVID-19 higher education relief package guarantees over $18 billion in funding this year, allows Australians out of work due to COVID-19 to gain new skills in priority areas such as nursing, teaching, health, IT and science through short online courses at significant discounts. It also exempts students who access fee help or VET student loans from 1 April to 30 September from loan fees to engage to, uh, with new study or continue their course, and it provides regulatory fee relief so that they can better support their students during this crisis. Senator Roberts. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. One Nation does not support this. It's about time that universities became more accountable for how they spend their hard-earned taxes. They teach students business and risk management skills, but apparently they could not teach themselves. They made risky business investments when they should have focused on building Australian capability. Fatcat University executives who earn around $1.2 million each year, plus bonuses, spent our money on underutilised facilities and student accommodation that should have been left to the, to the open market to own and operate. Last year, the Centre for Independent Studies warned the University of Queensland that they risked a taxpayer-funded bailout because of their over-reliance on Chinese overseas, overseas students, yet the University of Queensland did nothing. Universities are not treating us or our money with respect. Everyone is suffering dur during the economic downturn, and universities are not a protected species. They created their own problems. They need to apply some basic business principles and to sort out a sustainable business model, revenue, expenses, risk and quality. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 662 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required? Do you want uh, just ring the bells for one minute, please. Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 662, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Um, stop the count. Senator Roberts, so I'm sorry, you're moving around. Are you in the count, or can you please resume your seat? Well, then please don't move. I do remind senators that when the count is on, you are not, once the tellers have been appointed, you need to remain in your seats. Thank you, whips.
Order. There being 27 ayes and 28 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business. Notice of motion number 663, standing in the name of the Leader of the Australian Greens, Senator Waters. Very much. Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 663 relating to consideration of the National Integrity Commission Bill 2018 number 2 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Morrison government is committed to establishing a Commonwealth Integrity Commission to enhance accountability across the public sector. Exposure draft legislation was ready for release to allow for consultation ahead of introduction into Parliament before the glo global economic and health crisis caused by the COVID-19 outbreak. Obviously, in recent months, the government's focus has been to keep Australians safe and provide Order. the support needed to help businesses to, and to protect jobs. The Greens National Integrity Commission Bill No. 2 2018 has fundamental flaws that could result in wasteful duplication and individual injustices. The bill was not supported by the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee when it considered the bill in April of last year. The government remains committed to establishing the CIC and will progress with the next steps of the release of the draft legislation at an appropriate time after more immediate priorities concerning the management of COVID recovery have been dealt with. Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 663, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Are those of that opinion say aye? Against? I believe the ayes have it. Ring the bells. Do you want four minutes, please?
Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number um, 663, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Though the ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 664, standing in the name of Senators Waters and Faruqi. Senator Waters. Thank you very much, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 664, standing in my name in the name of Senator Faruqi, relating to supporting women in work, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thank you, Deputy President. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Be pleased to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Women are making a significant contribution to the COVID-19 response and recovery. While many businesses have been adversely affected by COVID-19 and are reducing their workforces, some areas of the economy have an increased demand for workers, including in industries and occupations dominated by women, such as the health and care sectors. Some male-dominated industries are also seeing positive demand, such as in transport and logistics and mining and mining services. It will be critical that these industries draw upon everyone's full capabilities, both men and women, to accelerate our overall recovery as a society and as an economy. So the as, uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, Labor understands. Are you I seek leave to make a short statement. Yeah. Is leave granted? Thank you. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor understands the intent of this motion and supports a large part of it, um, but I think the inclusion of 664A3 um, means um, that we will, will not be in a position to support it today. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 664, standing in the name of Senators Water and Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Ring the bells for one minute.
Look, uh, stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 664, standing in the name of Senator Waters and Faruqi, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being nine ayes and 38 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 661, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 661, relating to the destruction of ecological communities in West Pennant Hills, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a very short statement. Uh, leave is granted for a very short time, Senator Dunningham. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Deputy President. This is a state matter, and the Commonwealth EPBC Act already provides protection for threatened ecological communities. Thank you. So the question is that Gen oh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator Gallagher. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Thank you. Leave is granted. Um, Labor won't be supporting this motion. We uh, support the upholding of the EPBC Act protections on all matters, including for threatened species. Uh, we don't believe the Greens should use, uh, seek to use Senate motions to attempt to intervene in proper consideration of projects and matters under the Act, nor are the Greens or should the Greens be considered the arbiter of these matters. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 661, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 661 standing in the name of Senator Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Uh, Senator Davey, the count has not been declared. <laughs> Order. There being eight ayes and 38 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We now move to the last general business. Notice of motion for today, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 651, relating to coal seam gas and farmers not getting insurance, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Waters. Thanks, uh, Deputy President. I move the motion. Uh, Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The coal seam gas industry plays a vital role in contributing to regional communities. The Queensland experience is that landholders and the industry are successfully coexisting and provided a range of mutual benefits. In total, more than $505 million has been paid to Queensland primary producers through land access agreements, with nearly $80 million paid in the last financial year alone. There are a range of insurance products that are available to landholders to cover potential public liability issues, and the Greens have no interest in helping farmers. Their only concern is to destroy the gas industry and remove farmers' rights to undertake activities like land management. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. I seek leave to make a short is statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Labor supports the coal seam gas industry and notes that project approval processes in each of the jurisdictions are stringent, robust, and science-based. And as such, we see no merit in this motion. Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? No wonder you're in trouble. I need someone to. Yes. Thank you for one minute. Thank you, Senator. Thank Roberts. you. One Nation opposes this. Fact. While it's true that one insurance company has withdrawn liability coverage for coal seam gas infrastructure on farmers' property, there are other insurance companies continuing to provide this service. Firstly, the core issue is farmers' rights that Liberal, National, Labor state governments in Queensland have bypassed in their rush for gas royalties. These rights of farmers over their own property need to be restored. 
Secondly, gas companies, not farmers, need to provide insurance for their infrastructure. Thirdly, state governments have a responsibility for gas mining and effectively underwrite that liability. That is the incentive for state governments to get it right in regulations to protect our valuable natural environment. The issue of insurance is a state government responsibility, and we must oppose the Greens' relentless pursuit of centralisation and destruction of states' rights, undermining our national constitution. The federal government has no role in mandating insurance coverage on Queensland farms. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 651, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. I only heard one voice, Senator Waters. I am happy to put it again. Uh, thank you. Uh, division required. Ring the bells for one minute. New Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 651, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being nine ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. That concludes formal business. I think we are moving to the matter of public importance. Yeah, sure. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 15 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Walsh. Dear Mr President, 
Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The Morrison government's failure to deliver for bushfire victims who were promised immediate support, but months later only 4 per cent have received any help. Um, is the proposal supported? Yes, it is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times in each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, the bushfires that swept through much of the Australian continent over the course of the last half of 2019 and the first months of 2020 were unprecedented but not unpredictable. Uh, the bushfires caused immense damage. And what Australians around the country are looking to the Morrison government for, what Australians in bushfire affected regions are looking to the Morrison government for is for it to keep the promises that it made. Uh, there will be an opportunity over the course of the coming months to examine in some detail the level of preparedness, the capacity of the federal government and the state governments to do their work in terms of bushfire mitigation, hazard reduction, dealing with the impact of dangerous climate change. But right now, what Australians want to see is a government that keeps to its word. And the evidence is that what we're seeing uh, in Australia from this Commonwealth government is the same hallmarks of the Morrison, ad man, all spin, no substance, the big announcement, the zero follow through every single time, no doubt we'll see advertising about bushfire recovery. But what we don't see is the government spending what it said it would spend. We don't see boots on the ground doing the work that needs to happen in terms of recovery. I can tell you that in the area that I come from, in the northwest of New South Wales, the bushfire recovery effort, six months after those fires swept through some of those towns, the promised cleanup only recently commenced. It took even longer for the promised cleanup to commence. Uh, on the south coast of New South Wales. Uh, that is unforgivable. That shows a wanton lack of care and a lack of commitment and a lack of understanding of the role of the Commonwealth government at this point. I heard one of the opposition senators bellowing out across the chamber recently that this is all a state responsibility. Well, bushfires don't know state boundaries. This is absolutely squarely the role of the Commonwealth Government. Recently, Services Australia Deputy Chief uh, Executive Michelle Lees told, told the Royal Commission that one in 10 people who applied for one-off disaster recovery payments were unsuccessful. One in 10. One in three who sought recovery allowances were rejected. Uh, when she was interrogated about why, Ms Lee said that applicants may have lived outside an eligible local government area or the damage to their property was considered insufficient. Well, tell that to the people on the south coast of New South Wales. The Royal Commission has heard that some people struggled to apply because their identity documents had been destroyed. The National Bushfire Recovery Agency head, Andrew Colvin, told the Commission that many victims have been treated differently because of jurisdictional issues associated with disaster recovery efforts. 
What people need is a government that sweeps all this aside, that steps in and makes sure that the promises they made belatedly, belatedly, not, not before Christmas, not after Christmas, as they scrambled in their response to realise what the real responsibilities of federal government, of Commonwealth leadership, actually are. Keep those promises that they made. Now, people who lost their homes in the Clear Range fire at Bumbalong have been forced to start their own heartbreaking clear up. They've decided they can't wait for the Commonwealth government. They're going to do it themselves. According to Kim Templeton, Secretary of the Bumbalong Valley Progress Association, people in that community feel abandoned. After losing a third of the valley's homes in the space of an hour, it took three weeks for official records to reflect the loss, he said. He went on to say it took us five weeks to convince the department that our postcode was actually affected. Um, so what is the government doing about it? Well, the Liberal candidate for Eden Monero says bushfire recovery has been hampered by poor coordination between the groups offering aid. Well, she's right. They are not coordinated enough, she went on to say. What an indictment of the government that she wants to join. Coordination during and after national disasters is what governments do. It's taken Minister Littleproud until two weeks ago to announce a review of disaster recovery payments. A review, what's actually required, is to get the payments out the door, to do the job that the government is entrusted by the people of Australia to do. In the meantime, the government's blamed everyone they could point the finger at. It's been a concerted effort, led by Senator Molan and some of the characters who are involved in the Eden Monero by-election, to point the finger at charities, at councils, at state governments, at anybody else but Scott Morrison and the Commonwealth Government. Well, the buck stops with you. Through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, the buck stops with the Prime Minister. The Liberal candidate for Eden Monero wants to join a government that is chaotic, incompetent, and obsessed with itself until it comes to launching an advertising campaign, very focused, very focused on the press release, very focused on the announcement, big dollars, uh, with, with uh, uh, breathtaking figures and justifications, but zero, zero delivery. And when you look at the Nash National Bushfire Recovery Agency organisational chart, the one thing that the government's been good at doing is filling all of the communications and engagement positions in the agency. Big tick for the communications officers, big tick for the people who designed the memes, big tick for getting the message out there, zero, zero for delivery in terms of policy substance and the things that matter for bushfire communities. The government's rhetoric isn't matched by what's happening on the ground. The bu businesses in those communities can't access the, commu the services that they need to access. People who lost their homes can't get their ruined houses cleaned. Businesses who've lost their business in many cases are still waiting for demolition. And people are still living in substandard accommodation as winter particularly in the south coast of New South Wales, sets in. We've got a government that's obsessed by spin, obsessed by marketing, obsessed by sloganeering, uh, that has just not been able to deliver, particularly for the people of south coast New South Wales. It should not have taken a by-election. It should not have taken a by-election to wake this hopeless rabble of a government up to its real responsibilities. 
We're going to do the work here in the Senate. We're going to do the work to hold this government to account. We're going to do the work in the Finance and Public Administration inquiry into bushfires and the bushfire recovery. And we're going to make sure that this government is dragged kicking and screaming to do the job that it's responsible for, that it should be delivering upon and that it's manifestly failed so far to do. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ayres. Senator Molan. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. I rise to address the matter of public interest submitted, I think, in the name of Senator Walsh. Senator Ayres has now spoken on it, which claims that bushfire victims who were promised immediate support, uh, uh, but uh, the motion, uh, the matter of public importance, claims that months later only 4 per cent have received any help. Madam Acting Deputy President, the ALP are politicising bushfire recovery in an apparent attempt to score cheap political points with the Eden Monero by-election in full swing, and that was patently obvious. Senator Walsh, uh, and possibly Senator Ayres, has not once requested a briefing from the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. If Senator Walsh were truly concerned with the plight of bushfire victims, one would have thought that the senator might have requested a briefing on the work of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. If she requested a briefing uh, and she was truly concerned with the plight of bushfire victims, one would have thought the senator might have requested a briefing on the work of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency. That agency and government have worked to be as transparent as possible with the opposition and members of the crossbench. And it's not just Senator Walsh. Uh, this, the, the National Bushfire Recovery Agency has given a whole of opposition's shadow cabinet briefing. It's included one-on-one uh, -on -one briefings with, senators, uh, with Senator Murray, uh, Senators uh, Murray Watt, uh, also Catherine King MP, Fiona Phillips MP, Susan Templeman MP, and 16, by my count, 16 other briefings. So to say that the Labor Party is going to hold us to account in this House, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, is a travesty. If you're, if you're going to hold anyone to account, let's start understanding the facts and understanding what's going on. Additionally, the National Bushfire Recovery Agency sent an email to all opposition and crossbench members in bushfire-affected electorates in May 2020, asking them to advise if they wish to participate in a virtual briefing on bushfire recovery, and not one member of the opposition or the Greens even responded. If the ALP and Greens were truly concerned with bushfire recovery, one would think all impacted MPs would have taken the opportunity to receive a briefing, and not one did. Instead of working constructively with the government to support bushfire victims, the opposition are taking advantage of the government's effort to, uh, 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 to keep them informed with their constituents' recovery and they should be linking in with us on every possible opportunity. And what about this 4 per cent figure? Senator Ayres didn't mention the 4 per cent figure, I suspect, because he is so deeply embarrassed about it. The Labor Party figure of only 4 per cent of those impacted by the bushfires as having received assistance is just fantasy. I can only surmise that this figure is a form of calculation derived by taking the, all, the entire population of the local government areas that had fires occurred in them and cross-reference that to the number of people who have been supported by Australian governments. And just because it's in some publication, Senator Watt, doesn't mean it's correct. At best, this is poor understanding of the reality of the situation. At worst, it is mischievous and irresponsible use of arithmetic to politicise the plight of bush bushfire victims. While approximately 7.1 million people live in local government areas that have been activated for bushfire recovery assistance, clearly not all of these were impacted the same way or indeed at all. Some of these local government areas include large, heavily populated areas. A smaller proportion of Australians were resident within the burn scar and were directly impacted through loss of loved ones and property. For instance, if we are to take the figure being used by the ALP, one would assume that the entire Gold Coast was directly impacted by flame, and that is ridiculous. The ALP are putting, these un uh, they're putting those untouched in high-rise 
on a par with those properties destroyed in our rural and regional areas, and that's bizarre. Another proportion were also indirectly impacted in a severe way through loss of income, trade and crops. The most meaningful measure of the number of Australians that were directly and indirectly uh, impacted is through the take-up of support measures being delivered by all levels of governments, which continue to rise. I want to make a number of additional points and then get down to some real, some real facts. The first point is that the government policy uh, is about helping Australians recover from the recent bushfires, and that is a national priority despite the impact of COVID, just as we do not forget the scourge of drought or the scourge of flood. We will work and continue to work on providing support to those impacted by the bushfires. Secondly, to get the money out fast, the Commonwealth uses state and territory governments and local councils to deliver the programs. Thirdly, we have enlisted charities to distribute a, pro a proportion of the funds as emergency relief, which is managed separately to public donations. And generally, this has worked, and where it has been less than perfect, where systems and processes can be better, the National Bushfire Recovery Agency is working with partners to make improvements. Madam Acting Deputy President, $2 billion has been allocated to the National Bushfire Recovery Fund, and the Prime Minister has said that more is available if required. Funding is being rolled out over a two-year period. At mid-May, half of that money had been distributed. So when you add in the $417 million more that has been allocated through disaster recovery payments and disaster recovery allowances, you find that over this period of time, $1.4 billion is out there working for the victims of bushfire. And the reason that it's rolled out over two years is that so people in the in community can think about their recovery needs and can seek support at their own pace. Let me remind you that in a two-year, $2 billion program, we have spent, as I said, $1.4 billion. I've sat with fire victims at evacuation centres with smoke in the air when they were assisted by officials to apply for and receive the bushfire recovery payment and the allowance uh, and approval has been given on occasions on the phone and uh, money has been in the account for 30, uh, within 30 minutes and often much shorter. Let me speak about what we have actually done in Eden Monero as the Labor Party raised Eden Monero. In Eden Monero, of the five local government areas included in the Eden Monero electorate, 502 primary producer grants have been approved, providing almost 32.4 million in support. 130 concessional loans have been approved, providing over 7.6 million on the ground. 4,429 $10,000 small business support grants, grants in Eden Monero, amounting to over 44.2 million in support. 601 $50,000 small business grants have been approved, amounting to over $16.7 million. And over 37 point million in Commonwealth payments have been made to individuals under the disaster recovery payment and the disaster recovery allowance. Of course, there will always be people who fall between the cracks. But everyone that has been brought to my attention has been dealt with and has received federal aid, received aid from the federal level, the state level or from charities. Of course, we can always do it better, but the 4 per cent accusation is plain mischievous. Uh, acting, uh, 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 Mr Acting Deputy President, despite the fires, coming on top of the drought and being followed by COVID, and despite the fact that individuals may slip through the cracks, the government and its agencies have effectively supported the victims of bushfires across this nation and will continue to do so. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on this matter of public importance. The devastating bushfires of last summer ripped through communities across our country. Lives were lost, livelihoods were lost, 
acres upon acres of bush was lost in flames, and more than a billion animals were killed. I traveled up and down my state of New South Wales and heard the tragic, heartbreaking stories from people who have lost loved ones, who have lost homes, who have lost businesses that they built from scratch. Many talk about the intensity of the fires and how climate change is in the forefront of their minds, about how the climate crisis has fueled the bushfires, and how angry they are at the Morrison government for not taking action. It's been six months since the height of the fires, and people are not getting the support they need, and they're not getting it fast enough. And now they are dealing with the devastation left by the bushfires and also the pandemic all together rolled into one. And yet this government is trying to lead us backwards. The government and the COVID commission talk about a gas-led recovery. While it might be exactly what the Liberal Party's donors are after, doubling down on fossil fuels will be no recovery at all. It would take us further away from the targets that we desperately must meet to avoid the worst of the climate catastrophe. It is criminally irresponsible. Not only is the government planning to double down on carbon emissions, but they haven't even had the decency or the ability to follow through on the promise of support for bushfire victims. We watch the apocalyptic scenes unfold in real time this summer. It's now an entirely unavoidable truth, even for Prime Minister Scott Morrison, that the climate crisis is already here. Catastrophes like these fires, the drought, the floods, the extinction events, the water shortages, they will keep happening as the climate crisis intensifies more frequently and more ferociously. Just over the weekend, I met with people in the electorate of Eden Monero, which actually bore the brunt of so much damage during the bushfires. In February, the New South Wales Rural Fire Service reported that the fires had burned 365,000 hectares in the Bega Valley and 270,000 hectares in Yorubadala. That's 58% of the Bega Valley's land mass and 79% of Yorubadala. People are trying their best, of course, to rebuild. They are showing real courage and resilience, but they need support. There is soon to be a by-election in Eden Monero, and the bushfires and climate are at the top of the mind of the people in that electorate. They want investment in their communities because they know that we can recover from the COVID-19 crisis, we can rebuild after the bushfires, and we can tackle the climate crisis. And while we're doing that, we can also create thousands of jobs, much needed jobs in our communities. We could choose an investment-led recovery plan where we rebuild an economy that actually helps people by constructing public housing, by providing caring roles in the community, in the public sector, by vital post-bushfire environmental restoration jobs, and jobs in renewable energy. We've got the means to do this. We just need the political will. The psychological trauma and devastating economic and environmental impacts of these fires won't be forgotten in Eden Monero, or in fact, across the country. But in Eden Monero, people have a real opportunity to send a strong message to the Morrison government on the 4th of July to reset the political agenda, one that actually works for people, not fossil fuel vested interests that so influence this government. And I hope that they use their democratic right to do exactly that. It's simply unacceptable and cruel that the government is sitting on resources so needed by bushfire-affected communities. People need support now. Victims of the bushfires can't wait. Neither can our climate or our planet. Senator Watts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on this debate uh, on a very important topic that affects so many people who've gone through so much across our country. And it's become customary to talk about the Black Summer bushfires and, of course, 
we did see horrific scenes across much of the country through summer. Uh, but it's also worth remembering that these bushfires started well before summer. Uh, they started in my home state in Queensland back in July, and we saw them in other parts of New South Wales uh, as early as September and October, which reflects again the unprecedented nature of these bushfires and the damage they inflicted across such a wide part of the country over such a long period of time. And it's for all of those bushfire victims, uh, whether they are on the New South Wales south coast, the Blue Mountains, uh, the Snowy Valley area, or as far north as central Queensland, um, that we speak up today again about this government's and this Prime Minister's, in particular, failure to deliver on the promises they've made to bushfires. Uh, everyone will remember uh, the Prime Minister scurrying back from his overseas holiday in Hawaii, caught out, caught trying to pretend he wasn't away initially and then finally having to admit that he was. And what did he do when he came back to the country? Well, in early January this year, he called one of his hurried press conferences and pledged immediate support to bushfire victims. That was in the first week of January. Immediate support is what this Prime Minister promised to bushfire victims. And yet here we are, months down the track, in the middle of winter, in some of the coldest parts of this country, where people continue to live in caravans, in some cases in tents, in other forms of temporary accommodation, in sheds, and in many cases still waiting for debris to be removed so that they can just begin the rebuilding process. And I know this government and this Prime Minister doesn't like Labor and community groups and journalists and a whole range of other people continuing to speak up on behalf of these bushfire victims, but we will continue to do so. We are not going to let this government forget these bushfire victims. We're not going to sit by and let them continue to suffer in their caravans, in their tents, in their temporary accommodation in winter while this government fails to deliver on promises that it's made. And it's deeply unfortunate that in relation to these bushfires, we see a continuation of a pattern from this Prime Minister, which is that he's all about marketing. He's all about the headline. He's all about the press conference. And he actually doesn't really care, once he gets that run in the media, whether the promises that he makes are actually delivered and whether the people he's made promises to receive the support that they very much need. Now, I've listened to Senator Molan object to our Labor's pointing out that only 4 per cent of bushfire victims in bushfire-hit communities have received the support that they have been promised. And when I asked Senator Rustin about this last week, as the minister representing the Emergency Services Minister, she also took umbrage and accused me of being loose with the truth by using the 4 per cent figure. Well, I'm happy to table, for Senator Rustin's benefit, the article in the Canberra Times from June the 3rd this year, which, from which that 4 per cent figure is drawn. And it actually comes from evidence that the National Bushfire Recovery Agency gave to a committee of this parliament. So perhaps before this government wants to accuse people of being loose with the truth about figures that we cite, they might actually want to do their research and make sure that they've got the correct figures themselves. So as I say, I'm happy to table that, uh, that article for the benefit of the minister and the benefit of the Senate more broadly. Um, uh, I seek leave to table that Is document. leave granted? No, leave is not granted. Yeah, you don't want to know, do you? The government doesn't want to know. The, they, they want to come in here and accuse people who are speaking the truth about bushfire victims of making it up, but when they're actually offered the opportunity to read the document that proves the point, they don't want to see it. And that is, again, that is symptomatic of this government's approach to the bushfires. They don't want to believe the truth. They want to get out there and make these marketing slogans and tell us all that it's all going brilliantly and everyone's being looked after. And the minute the truth is revealed, whether that be an individual in Cabago or someone 
outside Taree who are still waiting for their property to be cleared. They just don't want to know about it. Uh, and that is, as I say, that is very symptomatic of this government's approach to the bushfires. Now, as I say, last, only last week in this article in the Canberra Times, which the government doesn't want to have tabled, um, 4 per cent, only 4 per cent of people who live in bushfire-affected regions have managed to get access to government support. So 96 per cent of those people in those Mr. Um, 96 per cent of people who live in those bushfire regions have not received the support that this government has promised. And this is not the only time that this government has tried to cover up figures in relation to their support for bushfire victims. If you go back about a month ago, uh, we were asking questions of the government about their bushfire recovery efforts here, and we made the point that the government's own question on notice, its own documents and its own figures uh, showed that of the $2 billion National Bushfire Recovery Fund that this government announced in January, at that point in time, according to the question on notice, only $250 million had been spent. Uh, and the government was responded, oh, no, 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 it's not true, not true, not true, not true. Well, it came from their own documents. It came from their own figures. So they hurriedly then released some new figures, which showed that the number had increased and acknowledged that. It's now at $529 million. And if you look at the documents the government has, re has released to prove that point, they're very, very keen to throw in all sorts of other figures to try to make out that they're spending more than they actually are. Now, I could give you more and more figures, statistics, data, such as that one in 10 bushfire victims who've applied for the government's disaster recovery payment has been rejected. One in three bushfire victims who applied for the disaster recovery allowance has been rejected. As I say, I could give you figure after figure after figure after number after number after number. But it's important that we don't think about this as numbers. This is about people. This is about people who I've met in everywhere from Cabago to central Queensland to the Blue Mountains to the Hawkesbury and everywhere in between. And it's also uh, it's people that Senator, Mo Senator Molan has also met to his credit. And they are the people who are still waiting for this government to get its act together and actually deliver the support that's been promised. These are people who've suffered unimaginable loss, loss of life, of property, of belonging. And they're now having to navigate a complicated system of bureaucracy and red tape. And sadly, many have just given up because it's too hard. My office has spoken to many families who've been waiting months for loans and grant approvals. One was recently knocked back because of a mistake on a form and is now waiting through an even more complicated appeals process to get back on their feet. Why do these people have to continue suffering through this government's ridiculous processes and this government's obsession with marketing over deliver delivery when they've already been through so much? Now, for months, we have been pointing out the need for case managers to help people navigate the, the, the grants process. But unfortunately, the government has still not taken up this suggestion and it's bushfire victims who are, the poor, who are the poorer for it. Now, to his credit, Mr Andrew Colvin, the, the coordinator of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, in his evidence to the Royal Commission only a couple of weeks ago, acknowledged that the government's requirement to, uh, on bushfire victims to keep retelling their stories over and over again to different government officials was re-traumatising individuals. Well, my simple question is, if the government knows that its processes are re-traumatising individuals, why doesn't it fix them? You're the government. You've been in power for seven years. By now, surely you can work this stuff out and actually treat bushfire victims with some respect. Now, I really hope that this government can get its act together and support bushfire victims and just deliver what it's promised. Is it really so much to ask this Prime Minister to think about more than just getting the headline, to think about delivering on what he promises, to keep Senator faith with Watt, bushfire your victims? your time has expired, and I will remind all senators that interjections are always disorderly. Senator Davey. 
Thank you. Uh, I rise to speak on this matter of public importance, and I'd like to thank uh, Labor, as, as Senator Watt, through you, um, Acting Deputy President, has said that Labor felt they had to remind our government of the bushfire victims. Well, I can assure Labor and I can assure the community we need no reminding of the people that suffered the tragedy that was the summer just gone. Uh, this is a clear example of Labor trying to politicise something that should never be politicised. Over summer, we saw what we now call the Black Summer, but as uh, Senator Watt quite rightly said, it started before summer. We saw 18.6 million hectares burnt, not just in Eden Monero, as some people have sort of uh, alluded to today, but right from Queensland to Victoria, along the entire New South Wales seaboard in my state and across to South Australia. Nearly 6,000 buildings were destroyed, 34 lives tragically lost and an estimated one billion animals killed. Now, Senator Watt was quite, quite right that it was indeed <clears throat> the uh, National Bushfire Recovery Agency Deputy Coordinator Major General Andrew Hocking, who told the Senate committee that about 5 per cent of bushfire hit communities had received government aid. However, if you read further beyond the headline of that article, he explains the mathematics, which is overly simple when you are talking about a complex recovery scenario. He explained that an estimated 7.1 people live in the local government areas that were impacted directly or indirectly by the fires. And doing a simple mathematics of division, you can then extrapolate that to 5 per cent. It is not effective maths, and it does not clearly show what this government has done, because this government support was immediate. Firstly, we put in place immediately two major forms of financial support through the disaster recovery payment that made available $1,000 for each adult and $400 for each child where they were adversely impacted by the bushfires. We also identified the need to help families with upcoming school expenses and provided a further $400 for, for each eligible child. Then we made the disaster recovery allowance available to those who had lost income as a direct result of bushfires. Now, this was just our immediate support. Through those programs, a, a total of 281,000 Australians had received direct financial support from the Australian government. But support is not limited to a checkbook. And our government got out immediate support for mental health. We provided $100 million committed to the mental health for bushfire victims, free counselling and Medicare rebated psychological support, including via telehealth, was quickly made available. That is why our government continues to support the mental health of Australians, uh, and 24 per cent of a $53.4 million program has already been spent. Another form of immediate support came through the di distribution of face masks during the bushfires. This is immediate and practical support that people needed. We got 3.5 million masks out the door over the course of summer that saved many lives because it addressed issues such as asthma and quality of air. We also had the Defence Force out on the ground immediately. That is support. At Mallacoota, we saw the biggest ever maritime evacuation of Australian citizens. That is support. We had immediate rollout in the form of communications with SkyMuster mobile uh, trucks going into impacted communities. Immediate support. And we continue support for our bushfire affected communities through the ongoing cleanup, the ongoing rollout of financial counselling, small business grants and low interest loans. So, Mr Deputy, uh, Acting Deputy President, I refute the claim that our government has failed to support our communities. We will not turn our back on them. We stand with them now and into the future. Yeah.
Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, from Bega on the south coast up to Ratville up in the northern rivers, Australians impacted by the summer bushfires are being failed by the federal government. It's been six months since the unprecedented fires, but only 4 per cent of those impacted have received support. It's been estimated that 7.1 million Australians were impacted directly or indirectly by the fires, yet only 291,000 people have been supported through disaster recovery payments. And it doesn't matter whether, how people seek to quibble with those statistics. It's a pretty poor record and it's borne out by the stories on the ground. It's borne out by the stories about the fact that only 288 businesses have been approved for a concessional loan as part of the government's bushfire recovery package. It's borne out by the further information that only 219 million of the 362 million allocated to demand-driven bushfire recovery programs has been spent. Survivors of these fires need support, and they need it urgently. And the government's lack of action and their lack of ambition for these communities is completely shameful. And it reflects an overall complacency and laziness about their role, a focus on themselves and their own jobs at the expense of the communities that they have promised to protect and support. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated the problems that people are facing in regional areas. In Eden Monaro, people who watched their houses burn just months ago are now facing serious challenges with unemployment and facing the closure of small businesses. Seven and a half per cent of jobs in the region have been lost during COVID-19, the 11th highest electorate in the country. And when you talk to people from the area, they express their disappointment in the federal government's response. Many are still struggling to get back on their feet from the fires, and now they face this. My office has heard from a man who lived just one kilometre from the fire in Toowoomba, and this man defended his property, and he watched while many of his neighbours' houses burnt. Social distancing measures have made it difficult for him to access the supplies he needs, but he has persevered and he's repaired his property. And they are strong communities. These are resilient communities, but they need significantly more support to recover from these very difficult times. And it says something about the motivations of those opposite, that much needed temporary housing was only made available once a by-election was announced for a media opportunity. This electorate needs strong and local representation. It needs a person like Christine McVeigh, a fierce advocate for locals through the fires, and someone who will take this fight to Canberra. The thing is that the immediate crisis may have passed, but it hasn't passed for the people who've endured so much. For many people, there is not going to be a return to normal for a very long time. As Amanda Gearing, who's a researcher in this area, has written, the effects of a serious natural disaster last for many years. Five years on, after the floods in Queensland, people are still struggling, and the journey was longer and more difficult for people who lost family members during or after the disaster, who may have been traumatised by a near-death experience, who could no longer work in their old job, who had significant health problems, or had insurance claims that were slow, difficult or rejected. These people don't cease to require support just because the fires have been put out. We are talking about a long journey to recovery. And these are communities who know how to manage their interests, how to advocate for their own interests. It was the community that led the response to the bushfires, and it's now the community that is leading the response to COVID-19. The government needs to provide support to these communities to give them the tools and resources that they need. They don't ask for much, but they do ask, at minimum, for government to take an interest in their lives. They ask for governments to think about the fire seasons that may lie ahead, to take seriously the warnings from professionals, and to actually start to tackle the issues with climate change that have provided an accelerant to an already dangerous climate. 
We cannot afford to be complacent. Our lives Senator depend on Senator McAllister, your time has expired. Senator Rice. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. People suffered so much from last summer's fires, and our government has failed far too many of them. Despite the unprecedented tragedy of the bushfire season, the news cameras have now largely gone. But for so many people, particularly in my home state of Victoria, the impact is still ongoing. People in East Gippsland are still living in sheds, in caravans, even in tents, and they haven't been given a timeline of when the rubble remains of their homes is going to be cleared away. Recent media reports tell us that Rotary volunteers supplied about 34 shipping containers to be used as temporary homes, but they needed another 100. And I'd like to read the words of one survivor who's faced the trauma. He said, your memory and thoughts are all muddled. I go to counselling every week to try to process my emotions and understand it. I'm a very capable person, but there have been times I have struggled to even make a phone call. But it's not just the tangible help after the fires directly where the failure has occurred. In late May, the Finance and Public Administration Committee heard from Greg Mullins, representing Emergency Leaders for Climate Action. That's 33 former fire and emergency service chiefs and deputy chiefs covering every fire service in Australia. And his words were powerful. He said, it settled science. There's no question the atmosphere is warming due to the burning of coal, oil and gas. Just a 1.1 degree increase has led to weather conditions that have never been experienced before. In just under 50 years of fighting fires, we haven't seen fires of this magnitude before. And even more scary was when he told us that when he spoke about the climate emergency, he said, I was spoken to by my minister at the time and by some senior officials. What kind of pathetic excuse for a liberal democracy are we living in? We should be listening to the science and our independent officials, and instead the government gagged them. In that same hearing, we heard that the Prime Minister knew of the unprecedented nature of the fire season that, was, that we faced before he went off on holiday to Hawaii. And he went anyway. The Prime Minister buggered off during last season's bushfires, but he has the chance to do the right thing now. The Coalition can and must support people who have survived these fires, to treat them with respect, treat them as if they were family, and they must do it soon. People should not still be living in tents. And the government can do a lot more to invest in and rejuvenate local communities and create jobs in environmental rehabilitation, to restore damaged landscapes, employ people working in the bush to tackle weeds and pest animals, fencing off rivers and streams, building tourism infrastructure like walking and cycling trails. And they could start protecting our forests, employing local people, including First Nations peoples, in doing that, and stop native forest logging, which is doing more damage to our forests on top of the fires, killing more wildlife on top of the billion animals that were killed in the fires. In East Gippsland, where people have been suffering so much, there's a proposal for the Emerald Link. It's a proposal for forest protection and tourism and recreation infrastructure from the mountains to the coast that would rejuvenate local economies and be an icon project, something to be really proud of and would reflect what an extraordinary part of the country East Gippsland truly is. These projects are good for people, good for our economy and our environment, and they can be undertaken quickly and efficiently, compared with the massive mining and development projects that the government announced today, which they want to fast track, trashing and slashing our environment protections and our precious wildlife. Finally, the Morrison government must do more on the climate emergency. We know climate change makes fires more intense and more frequent. People suffered so much from last summer's firestorms that were so intense because of the one degree of heating that we have already experienced. Just think of what three to four degrees of global heating is going to do. That's what the Morrison government have us on track for. On top of the Morrison's government's failure to look after bushfire victims, failure to plan and deliver sustainable economic initiatives. Morrison's inaction 
on the climate crisis is risking Australian lives last summer, the coming summer and all summers to come. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak today about this important matter. While I thank Senator Walsh for the opportunity to highlight the great work of the federal government is, that the federal government is doing to support communities hit by the summer's bushfires, I also understand that she has not once sought a briefing from federal authorities on the recovery's progress. This may explain some of the misperceptions we heard earlier. There is no doubt that the extensive nature of these fires has impacted our communities, including those in Victoria such as Mallacoota, Can River and Orbost. Whilst I have said in this place previously, these fires are not unprecedented. Nevertheless, this level of damage requires huge amounts of effort and time to recover from. If Senator Walsh and Rice were truly concerned about the plight of Victorian bushfire victims, one would have thought the senators might have requested a briefing on the work of the National Bushfire Recovery Agency, especially in those communities. As a government, we recognise that the scale of the destruction and that the recovery effort needed was going to be enormous and long-lasting. That is why the government established the National Bushfire Recovery Agency to lead the work to drive a strong economic recovery. This is the first time that a federal government has recognised the need for a permanent national body to work in partnership with the states and territories to aid their efforts in recovering from bushfires. The National Bushfire Recovery Agency and the government have worked to be as transparent as possible with the opposition and members of the crossbench. This has included a whole of opposition shadow cabinet briefing and one-on-one -on -one briefings with other Labor colleagues, including Senator Watt and local MPs such as Catherine King, Fiona Phillips and Susan Templeman. Mr Acting Deputy President, this government has established a $2 billion regional bushfire recovery and development program. So far, over $1.3 billion from that program has been spent. It draws on local voices and local governments to develop the right sort of recovery plan for communities in the most severely impacted regions. Funding is rolling out over a two-year period. This means people and communities have time to think about their recovery needs and seek the right support at the right time for them. Already, over 281,000 Australians have received direct financial support from the Australian government through the disaster recovery and allowance payments. Approximately 23,000 businesses have received direct financial assistance. Fortuitously, today's sacking of Victoria's small business minister following allegations of political branch stacking may possibly even speed up the recovery of small businesses. It sounds like he was more focused on politicking than his portfolio, but that is an off-heard observation of Labor. This money has either already been paid or is being reimbursed to state and territory governments for help they deliver on our behalf. Including the Labor government in my home state of Victoria um, and perhaps Senator Walsh's concerns might be better directed to her state Labor colleagues. Communities are recovering from the combined impacts of drought, fire and the coronavirus. But make no mistake, the challenge is immense. What is required is a focused partnership between governments and the people on the ground, and that helps them recover in a way that suits their individual needs. Thank you. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, as leader of the Nationals in the Senate and a proud uh, regional Victorian, I'm very pleased to be able to participate on behalf of those communities uh, and contribute to this matter of public importance. Raised by the Labor Party, which is quite ironic, um, it's nothing more than a stunt, but I guess we shouldn't be surprised. An attempt, a really cheap and tawdry attempt to politicise uh, the bushfire recovery. Our regional communities have been hit by a triple whammy—the drought, 
bushfire and COVID-19. And we're doing everything we can as a federal government to support them through that. Labor is not interested in bushfire recovery. They're interested in any single distraction to take the spotlight away from their grubby ALP branch wheeling and dealing. If Labor was actually interested in the people of Victoria, uh, the senator that put this motion forward uh, would think she would have actually so shown some interest. And I think, Senator Van, you, you raised a very valid point that when the government offers to all senators, because we know that when we work together across political parties, when we work together across jurisdictions, we achieve great things. We've done it in flattening the curve with COVID-19, and we can do it with bushfire uh, recovery. But when offered that briefing so they can get across the detail, no one showed up, Senator Van. No one showed up from the Labor Party. And guess what? No one showed up from the Greens. But those of us that live out in these communities actually are not surprised by uh, you know, this fickle, fickle and offensive uh, politicisation of something that is very real and is impacting people's daily lives. We've just heard in the debate tonight Senator Rice gets on her high horse. We hear the typical Green talking points rolled out yet again. Well, you know what? The Royal Commission into the bushfires in our home state, Senator Van, those horrific bushfires that occurred on the 7th of February 2009, killed 173 people. Killed 173 people. The Royal Commission said, you know what? Our volunteer and our um, professional fireys need to work together better. You know what makes a difference to fires? An ignition point, a fuel load, access to tracks and access to the country, country the, the national parks and the state parks, etc., to actually manage the fire. Fuel burns uh, also make a difference. Now that's over a decade ago and here we are. Here we are. Um, so I just want to also put on the record Thank you to our CFA volunteers, the RFS, um, the South Australian volunteer uh, firefighters who spent day and night. And I remember uh, going out into Kajiwar and Koryong and Talangada and talking with the CFA uh, volunteers after New Year. They were exhausted. They'd be out defending their neighbour's property uh, and they would get home to find their own backyard burnt. <laughs> Um, I guess so. That is a bit disappointing, but you know, here we are, batting it away. At the end of the day, I know my Senate colleagues on this side of the chamber have gone through um, the significant support uh, that our government has put on the ground and into regional communities to support those bushfire-affected communities. An initial two billion dollars for those recovery efforts. Financial counselling. We've already paid out a million dollars. We've already paid out 18.2 million dollars in small business grants. Uh, the $10,000 small business grants already paid out $173 million. I could go on and on and on. The reality is we all know in this place we, have to, we come with bags of money and good intent. It is state governments that are responsible for the front line rolling out these programs. And to come in, particularly in Victoria, with young Daniel Young Daniel Andrews had a big day. I hope he watched 60 Minutes. I know I really enjoyed it last night. Not a lot of, not a lot of surprise there for me. Not a, I don't know where the cameras were, Senator McGrath, but it is time for state governments of all colours, of all colours to get serious about supporting regional communities. And I just want to put on the record Natalie O'Connell, Mayor of uh, East Gippsland and an OMEO resident, David Wartman, Taolong Mayor, thank you for your leadership in our communities over summer. Senator McKenzie, your time has expired and that time for the discussion has also expired. Uh, there being no documents listed for the debate today, we'll move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, I table documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the proposed Commonwealth Integrity Commission.
Minister. Uh, thank you. I table documents relating to the order for the production of documents concerning the Building Land Care Community and Capacity Grants Program. Thank you, Minister. We will now move on to committee memberships. No changes to committee memberships. Messages from the House of Representatives. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the National Radioactive Waste Management Amendments Site Specification Community Fund and Other Measures Bill 2020 for concurrence. Minister. Thank you. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and now be read a first time. The question is, the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the National Radioactive Waste Management Act 2012 and for related purposes. Minister. I table a revised explanatory memorandum relating to the bill and move this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, in accordance with Standing Order 1153, further consideration of this bill is now adjourned to 31 July 2020. A message has been received from the House of Representatives returning the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019 Measures No. 3 Bill 2019 and informing the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendments made by the Senate. Minister. I move that consideration of Message No. 218 in Committee of the Whole be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. Do you need to put that? Oh, Senator Patrick. I move the following amendment that the words, all words after that, be omitted and replaced with the message be considered in Committee of the Whole immediately. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Patrick be agreed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The ayes have it. No. Noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
school. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. Stop the bells. The question is that the amendment moved by Senator Patrick to the motion regarding the message from the House be considered immediately be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Oh, so the ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Ciccone, tell if the ayes. Senator McGrath, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 30, noes 26. The matter is resolved in the affirmative.
He is considering message number 218 from the House of Representatives relating to the Treasury Laws Amendment 2019, Measures No. 3, Bill 2019. Minister. Uh, I move that the committee does not insist on its amendments, to which the House of Representatives has disagreed. So the motion is uh, that the committee does not insist on the amendments. Those of that opinion say aye. I oh, sorry, Senator Patrick. No, so I'd like to um, just say a few words, uh, Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President. Sorry. Remind the Senate uh, exactly what this uh, this amendment is about that was rejected in the House. And that is that there are 1,119 companies that are, um, that are exempt from having to lodge uh, company returns with ASIC. So what that does is create a, uh, an opaqueness about these particular companies. It was a provision that was put into the Corporations Act back in 1995 as a temporary measure. Well, it's been a 25-year temporary measure. There is, uh, um, so there are issues in relation to tax transparency in respect of this, because, it, uh, in the words of the uh, uh, of ASIC in their committee report, they basically uh, uh, raise the concern that this uh, creates an environment that could encourage aggressive tax uh, minimisation. So it's important that we deal with that. We also don't want to have a class of companies in Australia that have very, very special uh, privileges. Uh, a, a separate group of uh, companies with people like Kerry Stokes, Lindsay Fox, uh, uh, Anthony Pratt, uh, who are the owners of, or proprietors of this, these companies, having a special privilege that no other business has. You start up a new business, and those businesses don't, uh, you know, once they get to the size required to uh, lodge, lodge reports, uh, they don't get this exemption. So we need to deal with this. It, went, uh, it was passed by the Senate. It, uh, it, was pa it was passed by the Senate. It went back to the House. It's been rejected because the government want to protect their mates. They want to protect their very uh, wealthy mates that uh, provide them with political donations. And it, the time has come for that to stop. The question, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Senator Patrick. Can I just remind the chamber that this is an amendment put forward by Senator Patrick that has nothing to do with the substantive part of the bill, that the other parts of the bill, the other schedules in the bill, are time critical and we would like to get this passed. And I would also remind the chamber that Senator Patrick has attached exactly the same amendment to another bill that is being debated later this week. Senator Wish Wilson. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, the Greens will be supporting this amendment, like we supported the amendment last week, uh, like we proposed uh, nearly two years ago. Indeed, uh, the Greens have brought a very similar amendment to this chamber on two occasions. There is no reason at all for these grandfathering exemptions to be in place. Uh, just to give the chamber a very brief reminder, last week uh, the minister couldn't give any reason at all, any reason at all, for the policy basis, the public policy basis of exempting some of the wealthiest uh, individuals and biggest companies in this country from providing annual reports to the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. No reason at all, because there is no justification for grandfathering. This was done by the Labor Party, the Keating government, uh, over 20 years ago. It was locked in by Mr John Howard. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, an anomaly of the past that has no place at all in present-day transparency around financial matters and the Greens will be supporting this amendment. The que uh, Senator Lambie. Oh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I was just wondering, and I think it needs to be asked, you know, curiosity always kills the cat when it comes to political donations in this place, but how many of those over 1,000 of those companies are actually being political donators of the Liberal Party over the last 25 years? And could you please tell me how many are still donating to the Liberal Party today? Minister. 
Thank you, Senator Lambie. In the uh, debate that we had on this bill just a few days ago, that very same question was asked by Senator Patrick, so I'll give you the same answer that I gave to him then. But I can't tell you that because it's not something that I would know. Donations are a matter for the Liberal Party and the National Party organisations, as you would know well. Donations are declared in accordance with the um, AEC with section 314AB um, and subsection 1 of the Commonwealth Electoral Act. And that register is publicly available on the AEC website. Senator Lambie. Um, do you think that, since it was already asked last week, you probably would have had answers ready because you probably would have known this was coming back here anyway, so you could actually you know, be, be nice and be ba at least be able to achieve answering at this time? And so the Australian people could actually see what was going on here, which, <laughs> let's see it, we can smell it a mile away. This has got to do with political donations. Minister. Senator Lambie, thank you very much. And uh, look, I should probably again just add to the answer that I gave to you before and that I gave to Senator Patrick uh, just last week when this bill was originally debated, when we debated not just this amendment, but we also debated, debated the substantive component of the bill, which I again reiterate is in fact time critical, that donations themselves are a matter for the Liberal and National Party organisations that you know and that Senator Patrick knows and that the Greens know uh, donations are declared and always have been, always will be declared in accordance with the AEC with section 314A subsection 1 of the Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918. That register is publicly available. It's publicly available on the AEC website. You can actually visit that website, should you choose to, where the full register of donations is publicly available. The URL of that website is www.transparency.aec.gov.au. Um, in fact, I think Senator Patrick has a list of those donors, and he has a list of, from the AEC website, which he can show to you, and you can compare the pair, so to speak. But what I would tell you, oh, what no. I would say, Senator Lambie, as you would well know, that um, if the aim of the game here is to ensure that tax avoidance is minimised, you should know that Australia is in fact a global leader in the international fight against tax avoidance, that this government has in fact implemented more than a dozen measures in just the last four years alone to address this very issue. Government measures since 2016 include a multinational tax avoidance law, the MAL, you would know it better as, a diverted profits tax, the DPT, which have both doubled the penalties for tax avoidance and have established the ATO Tax Avoidance Task Force. Now, that task force, which was created on the 1st of July in 2016, has enforced existing laws, but it also supports the government's new tax avoidance measures. It specifically targets multinational enterprises, it targets large public and private groups, and it also targets wealthy individuals. From the 1st of July 2016, right through to the 31st of March in this year, the ATO has in fact, through these measures, raised $16.9 billion in tax liabilities against large public groups, against multinational corporations, against privately owned and wealthy groups. And this cash has generated collections, sorry, this generated cash collections of $9.9 billion. Now, $8.8 .8 billion of the liabilities and $5.1 billion of the collections are attributable, attributable specifically to that task force. In fact, in the 2019 um, and 20 budget, the government announced more than $1 billion of additional funding to extend that task force, to expand its activities because it has done such a tremendous job. And that expansion of its funding and expansion of act act activities is expected to raise the tax liabilities of around $4.6 billion over the forward estimates period. In the 2018-19 budget, this government also announced further measures that included strengthening the rules that limited uh, interest deductibility to stop companies shifting profits out of Australia, including requiring companies to align the value of their assets with the value included in their financial statements. And it also broadened the scope of large multinationals 
that were being subject to the, multi, uh, the uh, multinational tax avoidance law, the MAL. Uh, Australia has been, as you have clearly had demonstrated here, very vigilant in adopting the actions that were recommended by the OECD and the G20 Base Erosion and Profit Shifting Project, the BEPS project, including country by country reporting, something I know that has been asked about numerous times at Senate estimates, hybrid, mis uh, hybrid mismatch rules, anti-treaty abuse rules and strengthening the transfer pricing rules and signing the multilateral instrument. Australia has also gone beyond those BEPS recommendations by implementing the multinational anti-avoidance legislation, the diverted profits tax, and doubling the penalties for multinationals that seek to avoid tax, imposing tax conditions on foreign investors, and strengthening thin capitalisation laws and establishing the tax anti-avoidance task force. Enhanced whistleblower protections, uh, as you would know, Senator Patrick, have also been enacted to limit disincentives for individuals to report tax misconduct to the ATO. On top of that, Australia has also enhanced its tax laws in a number of other areas to protect the integrity of our tax bases. In fact, uh, since 1 July 2017, uh, the GST has applied to digital products and services imported by Australians, and since 1 July 2018, the GST has applied to low-value imported goods. Uh, a piece of legislation I remember very well. From in the 2018-19 uh, budget measures, just to expand a little further, the thin capitalisation measures, which I know was something that the Greens were particularly interested in, the government announced in 2018-19 in that budget that it would require entities to rely on their financial statements for thin capitalisation purposes. Now, what this did was it removed the ability for entities to use a higher value or to recognise assets that cannot be um, that cannot be recognised under the accounting standards. Now, this measure was enacted on the 13th of September 2009 as part of the Treasury Laws Amendment, making sure multinationals pay their fair share of tax in Australia and other measures. The Act of 2019, one that Senator Wish Wilson, I know, spoke on very passionately indeed. That we also, in the 2018 and 19 budget, amended the definition of significant global entity, the SGE. The government announced in that budget, in the 2018-19 budget, that it would broaden the definition of a significant global entity, thereby expanding the scope of entities subject to the diverted profits tax, to the multinational anti-avoidance legislation, and increased administrative and tax uh, avoidance penalties as part of the same legislation. Now, this measure applies from income years commenced on or after 1 July 2019. So we'll only start seeing the effects of that kicking in at the end of this financial year. The measure was enacted on 25 May 2020, the Treasury Laws Amendment 2020 Measures No. 1 Bill Act 2020. And these initiatives have shown measurable results. The, mal the multinational anti-avoidance law, the MAL, addresses artificial arrangements designed to avoid a taxable presence in Australia. The government's successful implementation of the MAL has seen many, many large businesses restructure their operations in order to be compliant with the law. The multinational anti-avoidance legislation has now seen over $7 billion in taxable sales being returned to Australia. In addition, uh, $654 million in additional GST has been paid in the 2019-20 year to date, the 31st of March 2020, by the 31st of March 2020, as a result of some global entities restructuring in response to the multinational anti-avoidance legislation. The estimated business to consumer net GST is approximately $57 million from this legislation alone. So that's the multinational anti-avoidance legislation. But the diverted profits tax, the DPT, is estimated to raise over $100 million per year from the 2018-19 budget in additional tax from large multinationals that are seeking to avoid tax. Uh, and you should know, Senator Lambie, um, particularly on the 18th of December 2019, the ATO announced that it had settled a tax dispute, dispute specifically with Google with a payment of $481.5 million on top of Google's uh, previous tax payments. Now, the result of this 
brought the increased cash collections from e-commerce taxpayers to around $1.25 billion a year. The ATO has credited the operations of the multinational anti-avoidance legislation and the diverted profits tax, or sorry, and the tax avoidance task force with returning that Australian-sourced sales by digital firms to Australia's tax base. On 15 May 2020, several media organisations reported that, among other things, Google's financial accounts revealed that it incurred an additional $50 million in back taxes in 2019. Now, this raised Google's total pa tax paid in 2019 to around $99 million. Google's 2019 calendar year Australian pre-tax profit was reported to be around $134 million. Now, there is more that I can tell you, but unfortunately my time has nearly run out. But I would suggest that the coalition governments, the Morrison government's commitment to ensuring that companies pay their fair share of tax, to ensuring integrity, to ensuring transparency, Order. has been demonstrated over and over again. Senator Patrick. I'm, I move that the question uh, now be put. The question. The question before the chair is that the question now be put. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
remind people who are not senators to not walk through the chamber. Stop the bells. So the question is that the question be put. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the eyes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the nose. Order, so that, uh, there being 31 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is negated. So the question is that the committee not insist on the amendments disagreed by the House of Representatives. I'll just give people a few minutes to get back to their seats. Those of that opinion, those of that opinion say, are you seeking the call, yes. Senator Hume? Yes, sorry. sorry. So we're still in committee. Yes, phase. we're still in committee. Yes. All right. I'm just proceeding through the questions before me. That's all right. All. Thank you very much. So I was in the process of describing to Senator Lambie, who was talking about uh, government's actions towards um, tax avoidance measures in the last few years, uh, and we got to the multinational anti-tax avoidance law. That particular law, as I mentioned before, applied from the 1st of January. 2016. The results of that particular law, the Multinational Anti-Avoidance Law, or the MAL, has been an additional $7 billion of sales revenue that has been booked in Australia um, already. Large taxpayers that are bringing their Australian-sourced sales back onshore. The multinational anti-avoidance measure is designed to stop multinationals from artificially avoiding a taxable presence in Australia. Approximately $753 million in additional GST was paid in just the 2018-19 year as a result of some global entities restructuring in response to the multinational anti-avoidance measure. We have also, in fact, toughened that measure even further. Now, that applied from 1 January 2016 and was expected to result in an unquantifiable gain to, uh, to underlining revenue. 
uh, that prevented multinationals from using foreign trusts and partnerships in corporate structures that would seek to undermine the multinational anti-avoidance legislation and avoid the operation of the multinational anti-avoidance legislation. The diverted profits tax, the DPT I described earlier, that commenced on 1 July 2017. It is at this stage probably too early to tell um, uh, the results of the diverted profits tax, as it's only applied to income years. Or expect, um, sorry, it's only applies to income years from the 1st of July 2017. But it's expected that the results of the DPT are largely around behavioural change. Um, it's been estimated that the DPT, uh, the diverted profits tax, will raise around $100 million every single year. The ATO uh, DPT project team has been actively involved in identifying uh, potential diverted profits tax risks. Thin capitalisation and uh, the valuation, which is the valuation of assets and treatment of consolidated entities, that, uh, that program applies to new valuations that were made after the budget announcement. The 1st of July 2019, from the 1st of July 2019, all entities must rely on valuations that are in financial statement. Now, that legislation was enacted on the 13th of September 2019. The thin capitalisation rules and the change to the thin capitalisation rules is expected to result in a gain to revenue of around 240 million over the forward estimates. Uh, that uh, that program tightens Australia's thin capital the program that tightens Australia's thin capitalization rules by requiring entities to align the value of their assets for thin capitalization purposes with the uh, with the value that's included in their financial statements on top of that this government has implemented a new uh, GST application of GST on digital products and services that was commenced in July 2002, sorry, 2017, and the net GST revenue of the 955 million, sorry, the net GST revenue of 955 million that was raised between the 1st of July 2017 and the 31st of December 2019. Now that GST uh, applies to digital products and services that were imported, that have been imported by Australian consumers, and collections to date have vastly exceeded expectations. On top of that, um, GST now applies on low-value imported goods. That, uh, that GST now applies from the, that was commenced on the 1st of July 2018, and the GST revenue uh, of that um, from that program uh, has raised around $556 million between the 1st of July 2018 and the 31st of December. 2019. You will recall before this time GST didn't apply to goods that had been imported that were beneath a $1,000 value. Of course, that was an enormous disadvantage in this increasingly digitised age for those uh, high street shops that were competing with online businesses, and particularly those from overseas. Um, electronic distribution platforms and goods forwarders uh, became uh, required to account for, for GST on sales of imported low-value goods with values of $1,000 or less to consumers in Australia, and connections to date have vastly exceeded expectations. This government has officially um, and uh, effectively has effectively has effectively been tackling uh, multinational tax avoidance, transparency, and uh, and accountability to companies of all sizes. Thank you. Minister. Thank you very much. Uh, I move that uh, the debate on this bill be now adjourned to tomorrow morning. The question is that the debate on this bill be adjourned until tomorrow morning. That, those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. Okay, Clark. Oh. The, the committee reports progress. Uh, Clark. Government Business Order of the Day number two, Crimes Legislation Amendment, Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019, second reading debate. Uh, is anyone seeking the call? Senator Antic. Thank you, uh, 
Mr. Um, Acting Deputy President. My apologies. My, uh, uh, prior to um, question time, I was uh, uh, speaking in support of the crimes, um, uh, amend legislative amendment, sexual crimes against children and community protections, protection measures bill. Uh, and I had outlined um, some of my um, uh, concerns about um, the statistics surrounding um, um, abuse towards uh, children and uh, the manner in which uh, it could or could not be held. Uh, I had detailed um, some statistics from the Australian Institute for Health and Welfare uh, and I had given some examples uh, in relation to how this plays out in a very real sense. Um, but, Mr Acting um, Deputy President, uh, last year the Australian Federal Police received almost 18,000 reports of child exploitation involving children or Australian child sex offenders. Um, this is um, a doubling of what we saw the previous year, uh, and it shows why it's particularly important um, that this behaviour is not tolerated. And it's also why the Morrison government is introducing the Crimes Legislation Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Bill. And what the bill strives to do is strengthen Commonwealth laws in order to provide greater protection to the community through deterring and punishing child sex offenders. And it seeks to do it using four key mechanisms. Firstly, new offences for grooming activities and for websites and online platforms designed, designed to host child abuse material. Aggravated offences uh, for the most horrific types of child abuse engaged while someone is outside uh, of Australia will also uh, be introduced. And there will be presumptions against bail and presumptions for imprisonment, making it harder to be granted bail and more likely that child sex offenders will go to prison and stay there. And finally, uh, the bill seeks to introduce mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious child sex offences and for those who are likely to be repeat offenders. Uh, the bill implements recommendations from the Royal Commission in, into institutional responses from child sex abuse to protect vulnerable witnesses. And this protection will allow a witness to automatically give evidence via a video recorded interview rather than needing uh, to leave and seek leave, sorry, seek leave from the court to do so. And the bill will also prohibit cross examination at committal hearings. And a broad package of reforms has already been introduced by the coalition government to protect vulnerable Australians. There's always the opportunity to do more. But the bill complements tough new measures to, to stop child sex offenders from travelling overseas to abuse children, and it complements Carly's law, which targets online predators that use the internet to prepare or to plan to sexually abuse children, um, uh, which, implement, which was implemented in the Combating Child Sex, ex Sexual Exploitation Legislation Amendment Bill of uh, 2019. The recommendations from the Royal Commission addressed in that legislation look to improve the Commonwealth framework for offences related to uh, issues such as the overseas child sexual abuse, uh, forced marriage, um, a failure to report sexual abuse and a failure to protect children from uh, such abuse. So it is critical that we stop any way these criminals might be enabled. We must send the message that this behaviour will not be tolerated and that the perpetrators will not get away with their actions. We must use all reasonable legislative mechanisms to tackle these abhorrent crimes. And I should note that Labor's claim in relation to the inquiry into the combating of child sexual exploitation legislation amendment bill in 2019 was that mandatory sentencing quote, increases the incentives for defendants to fight charges, uh, and which of course is entirely false because we note that within a 12-month period of the Western Australian State Liberal government introducing mandatory sentencing provisions for assaults against police and other officers, there was in fact a 28 per cent drop in assaults against police. And it's a sobering statistic um, to, to realise that in 2018 to 2019, 39 per cent of convicted Commonwealth child sex offenders did not spend a single day in prison. This is just simply not acceptable. Similarly, from February 2014 to January 2019, 
a shocking 40 per cent of Commonwealth child sex offenders did not spend a single day in prison, and during that period only four offenders received a fine. This just simply cannot continue. So, pursuant to the provisions of this bill, a sentence can only be suspended fully when the total sentence is three years or less. And the bill introduces a presumption that the offender can only have their sentence of imprisonment fully suspended in exceptional circumstances. If the total sentence is above three years, a non-parole period must be set. And the bill introduces a presumption for cumulative sentences, which increases the likelihood of an offender receiving a sentence of greater than three years because, on most occasions, sadly, offenders are charged with multiple offences. And if a non-parole period is actually set, it can be as little as one day. But the Attorney General would then have to decide to release the offender on parole, which puts the discretion back in the Commonwealth Government's hands. Where a person receives a sentence of three years or less, uh, a, the court can provide the offender that should spend a, specific, a specified period of time in prison before being released on a recognised release order. The community and, most importantly, the victims and their families expect that we in this place will protect our most vulnerable. We must ensure that there are consequences for these offenders and that they are not given the opportunity to re-offend. Now, this is not a pleasant topic. It's a topic that's often seen as taboo and it's a topic that's not often spoken about as often as it should be. But unless we speak up for those who need our protection, we will never shift the stigma attached to these crimes against children or these offences in general. So it is time that we increase the awareness and work to protect children to give them the best opportunity in life. Uh, this bill does uh, that. This bill is uh, the Morrison government's attempt to try to tighten these laws as it should be. Um, so I take this opportunity to commend the bill to the Senate and commend the Morrison government for its work in ensuring that we protect those who are most vulnerable as we should. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I don't serve just voters. I serve everyone who is a resident of Queensland and Australia. And that especially includes those who don't vote because they're too young. I won't go over the statistics, the gory details, because they are, are horrific. Other speakers have done this from both sides of the chamber. But I do serve the young. And why do I serve the young? Because the abuse of children is not only the, one, not only the most heinous crime, it is also the destruction of our, of our nation's future. As I see it, the child, especially the young child, up to about six, is the embodiment of our universe. It is the, the, the ultimate expression of our universe, a lovely, the lovely eyes of a child and what is going on in the heart of that child. From zero to six are the critical years, according to Maria Montessori, who's done more work than anyone else ever on the development and behaviour of humans. And she says that zero to six are the critical years for the development of intellect and character. And some mongrel comes in and, and steals that person's development, that young, young child's development. And I only look at yesterday and the day before when I was in the Hunter Valley with Stuart Bonds and we were helping some people who are victims at adult of corporate crimes, group crimes. And Stuart and his wife, Cindy, have a lovely daughter called Penny. And Penny was an is an absolute delight. Eyes shining, heart pumping, asking questions. She's only two and a half but speaks like a four-year-old, speaks like an adult in many ways, full sentences. And I was just marvelling at that lovely little human, the embodiment of our universe, combined with the human spirit. As Tom Peters said, the, the renowned man management expert, he said many years ago, and I'll always remember this, the height of our civilization is the four-year-old. They're developing, but they haven't been corrupted by our society yet. And yet children need to be protected. They're naive. Worse than that, or more, more important than that, they're innocent and they can be preyed upon. They're weak and vulnerable in many ways, despite that sparkle and that energy. And when somebody 
molests a young child. They're doing enormous damage, lasting damage, terrible damage. They're not doing it just to the child because the child's play, pain plays out for the rest of her or his life. That is terrible. But then what happens to that pain is it sometimes gets transferred to other people when that child becomes an adult. And so on, the handing down of that pain. A lifetime of pain, a cost in sorting out that person's problems sometimes later on, the costs that are borne by our society, the costs that can be borne by other individuals. And that is a huge cost to our society. So every way we look at this, this bill must go forward. We know that sentences on pedophiles are not tough enough. We know that judges are being weak. And society is not dealing with this vital issue anywhere near adequately. We must have much more serious sentencing because judges have shown they have been weak. Now, we've had questions about this bill. Senator Hanson and I have listened intensely to the Labor Shadow Minister for the uh, Shadow uh, Attorney General. And he made some good points, provided us with some data. We then went to the Attorney General and listened to the Attorney General, reassured us on those points, reassured us on the checks and balances in this bill. Because these are the worst of criminals, but they still need to be treated fairly and within the law. This bill, as it is now, sends a powerful message to the scum of our society, the absolute scum and dregs of our society. We must be tough on those who hurt the weak, who hurt the vulnerable, who hurt our kids. Our kids are the future. Our kids deserve to be free from this scum. We are voting in favour of this bill because of our kids, and I commend the, to this bill to the Senate. Senator Roberts. Uh, Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I'm extraordinarily proud to be a member of the Morrison government that's tackling a host of problems for Australia. And as the mother of three beautiful children, there is nothing closer to my heart than the care and safety of our precious children. There is nothing more abhorrent than sexual offences against children. That's why I'm especially gratified to be part of a team that's bringing long-awaited and important changes to protections for children against sexual predators. Our government is resolute in its commitment to protect children from sexual abuse. For far too long, these predators have received grossly inadequate sentences for acts of unspeakable depravity. That's why we're introducing the Crimes Legislation Amendment, Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019. It is completely unacceptable that in the years 2018 to 19, a staggering 39 per cent of the Commonwealth's convicted child sex offenders did not spend a single day in prison and four received fines. Last year, the AVFP received almost 18,000 reports of child sex exploitation involving Australian children and child sex offenders. This number was near double from the previous year. It's time to send a clear message to perpetrators that their behaviour will not be tolerated. This bill will strengthen Commonwealth laws in order to provide greater protections to children by deterring and punishing child sex offenders. The bill has four pillars to achieve this. It contains new aggravated offences for the most horrific types of child abuse, committed while someone is outside of Australia, including where the child is subject to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment. It introduces new offences related to grooming activities, which includes websites and platforms designed to host child abuse material. It implements a range of assumption, presumptions against bail and presumptions for imprisonment. And it introduces mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious child sex offences. The Commonwealth has the power to create offences that criminalise conduct by our citizens whilst they are overseas, and we're not afraid to do that. We're providing to law enforcement officers the tools to prosecute child sexual predators no matter where the offences occur. That's why the new Criminal Code contains offences that criminalise the sexual abuse of children by Australian citizens whilst they're overseas. 
We're targeting those predators that travel to other countries to prey on vulnerable children and commit abhorrent acts so that even if they escape prosecution in the country they travel to, they will not escape justice at home. The bill also provides for the prosecution of predators who commit child abuse through live streaming these despicable acts in cases where the child is outside of Australia. It also includes offences related to the grooming of children for sexual abuse outside of Australia. This is the unfortunate and sickening reality that we are addressing. And I'm pleased that our government's tackling the safety of children, not just at home, but overseas. I'm proud that we're willing to take responsibility for abhorrent acts, even when they're committed by an Australian in another country. Simply put, it means it'll be much more likely that child sex offenders will go to prison. They'll stay there longer and they will find it much more difficult to get bail. The bill will also introduce mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious of child sex offences and for those who are repeat offenders. This will address the completely unacceptable situation where 39 per cent of convicted offenders did not spend a single day in jail. And there is more positive news. Vulnerable young witnesses will be protected during the justice process. They will automatically give evidence via a video recorded interview during committal hearings. Cross-examination during a committal hearing will not be permitted. This implements an important recommendation by the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. You might ask why we need mandatory minimum penalties for these offences. And the short answer is Australians expect it. The brave survivors of these unspeakable crimes deserve it. And our, our government is determined to protect our precious children. Too often the courts are imposing inadequate sentences for child sex offences and fail to punish, deter or rehabilitate offenders. This must not be permitted to continue. And that's why mandatory minimum sentencing for the most serious child sex offenders and repeat offenders lies at the core of the reforms of this bill. Our government's not afraid to handle the tough issues while ensuring the legislation is fair. And there are important safeguards for teenagers caught up in or participating in sexting. When this bill previously came before the House, the opposition suggested that the government's reforms will see teenagers locked up for five years for sexting. This bill will not target adolescent flirtations over Snapchat, Facebook or other social media sites. This bill does not target the type of relationship between consenting adolescents. And whilst I hear you, Senator McKim, as the mother of a soon-to-be teenage daughter, I kind of wish it did, but it doesn't. And uh, you know, it targets order. serious predators aiming to sexually exploit our vulnerable children. The mandatory minimum provisions do not target people under the age of 18. Young people will not be subject to mandatory <coughs> imprisonment. Police and prosecutors also retain the discretion not to pursue an investigation and must ensure that any prosecution is in the public interest. Our presumption against bail measures are designed to further protect children from these predators charged with serious offences. It will apply to those offences that attract a mandatory minimum penalty. This is a presumption against bail. The bail authority will retain discretion, discretion to grant bail where they may consider issues like the defendant's age and community safety. The courts will retain their important power to set non-parole periods for child sex offenders. They'll retain the discretion to reduce mandatory minimum penalties by up to 25 per cent. And this importantly will provide some flexibility to allow for cases involving cooperation with law enforcement and early guilty pleas. However, in the case of suspended sentences where a conviction is recorded but no time served, there will be an important change. Suspended sentences will only be permitted where the total prison sentence is less than three years. Courts will have full discretion to uh, will have discretion to fully suspend sentences only in truly exceptional circumstances. And importantly, if the total sentence is greater than three years, a non-parole period must be set. This bill also introduces a presumption against bail for cumulative sentences where multiple charges apply. The bill increases the likelihood of an offender receiving a sentence of greater than three years because on most occasions offenders are charged with multiple offences. In short, we've assured the courts may still use its judicial discretion 
while ensuring that the most serious offenders receive the appropriately long sentences. And there is a new aggravated offences category. That's because we are disturbed by the emergence of alarming trends that see offenders inflicting severe violence on children alongside sexual abuse. The vile behaviour serves to exploit the vulnerabilities of children, which stems from their trust and reliance on adults. It's the exploitation of these, vulnerable, and of these vulnerabilities which makes these, this offending so abhorrent and, let's be truthful, so very upsetting. And that's why the bill covers scenarios in which the sexual abuse includes cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or results in the death of a child. These measures, as well as increased maximum penalties for aggravated child sex offences, ensure that offenders are subject to increased prison times and others are deterred from committing similar crimes. The Morrison government is introducing grooming offences for third parties. Grooming refers to the preparatory stage of child sexual abuse, where an adult gains the trust of a child or the trust of other people with influence in the child's life, with the purpose of sexually abusing a child. That's because predators don't just groom their victims. They can target and groom a parent, teacher, scout leader or even a sibling in a depraved attempt to gain access to a child. It will apply to a case where an Australian citizen may travel to a foreign country and establish a relationship with the director of an orphanage to gain access to victims. This would include predators that take advantage of the anonymity of the internet to develop relationships with people who may inadvertently assist the predator to sexually abuse a child. We learned from the Royal Commission into Child Sexual Abuse that parents were groomed without their knowledge by predators seeking access to their children. Importantly, new offences provide law enforcement agencies with the power to investigate online predators and travelling child sex offenders before any abuse occurs. The maximum penalty of 15-year imprisonment will serve as a strong deterrent for those who intend to use grooming practices to sexually abuse children. The Morrison government is also committed to tackling child abuse on the internet. There has been a distressing rise in the number of websites that function for the sole purpose of distributing child abuse, um, child abuse material and encouraging discussions about child sexual abuse between its members. We've recognised that it's crucial to address the increasing role that technology plays in enabling the online exchange of child abuse material. The bill does this by introducing new offences, targeting administrators and facilitators of websites and online platforms that provide access to child abuse material. It bolsters existing offences in the Criminal Code related to the production and sharing of child abuse material. It strengthens offences related to the administration, creation, development, alteration, maintenance, control, moderation, advertisement, sharing or promotions of child abuse material online. The term electronic service is broadly defined, ensuring the bill remains relevant as technology evolves. It reaches to the dark web and it provides a maximum term imprisonment of 20 years. The offence is designed to ensure that the most serious, malicious and exploitative conduct is pursued through the courts. So, In summary, the bill complements a broad package of reforms that the coalition has already introduced. They include the tough new measures to stop child sex offenders from travelling overseas to abuse children, Carly's Law, which targets online predators who use the internet to prepare or plan to sexually abuse children and the Combating Child Sexual Exploitation Legislation Amendment Act 2019, which implements a number of recommendations from the Royal Commission and improves the Commonwealth framework for offences related to child abuse material, overseas child sexual abuse, childlike sex dolls, forced marriage, failure to report child sexual abuse and failure to protect children from such abuse. These reforms will be welcomed by law enforcement bodies and law-abiding Australians especially parents who have a rightful expectation that we do everything in our power to protect our children by ensuring that predators receive longer jail sentences. This bill first became before Parliament in 2017. On September 3, 2019, Anthony Albanese said that people who engage in vile acts against children should have the book thrown at them. 
But in the same breath, he also claimed that these amendments could sometimes lead to less convictions rather than more, because judges or juries will make the view that because it's mandatory sentencing, all of the circumstances can't be factored in. The Morrison government is not afraid to tackle this issue and supports community expectations and, indeed, the expectations of parents across the nation. Australians rightly expect that child sex offenders go to jail, and this bill will make sure that that happens. We've all heard that the Greens and segments of the Labor Party don't support mandatory sentencing on principle. And yet they did support mandatory minimum sentences for people smuggling offences during the previous failed Labor-Greens-aligned government. Our argument is that this bill is too important not to support it. During the inquiry into combating child sexual exploitation and legislation amendment bill 2019, Labor senators commented that mandatory sentence increases the incentive for defendants to fight charges and may increase the risk of recidivism. This just isn't true. When the West Australian state Liberal government introduced mandatory sentencing for assaults against police, there was an impressive 28 per cent drop in police assaults in a 12-month period. Labor has the chance to right the wrongs of the shortened Labor opposition and to support these important changes. It's time to put children first with the mandatory sentencing of child abusers. Forget ridiculous left-wing ideology positions. They are not relevant in this debate. Sexual predators deserve to be in jail. Our children deserve protection from evil predators, and our government, the Morrison government, is committed to seeing that happen. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It's my great pleasure to rise and speak on the Crimes Legislation Amendment, Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019. Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government is resolute in its commitment to protect children from sexual abuse. For too long, people who sexually abuse children have been receiving grossly inadequate sentences. It is completely unacceptable that in 2018-19, 39% of convicted Commonwealth child sex offenders did not spend a single day in prison. 39% convicted offenders did not spend a single day in prison. Last year, the Australian Federal Police received almost 18,000 reports of child exploitation involving Australian children or Australian child sex offenders. This number is abhorrent. It is almost double that of the previous year. This is an alarming trend that the Morrison government is committed to reverse. It is time to send a clear message to perpetrators that their behaviour will not be tolerated. That is why we are introducing the Crimes Legislation Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill 2019. So what does this bill do? The bill strengthens Commonwealth laws in order to provide greater protection to the community through deterring and punishing child sexual offenders. The bill does four broad things to achieve this. It introduces new offences related to grooming activities and for websites and online platforms designed to host child abuse material. It introduces new aggravated offences for the most horrific types of child abuse engaged in while someone is outside of Australia, including where the child is subjected to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment. The bill implements a range of presumptions against bail and presumptions for imprisonment, very important provisions meaning it will be more likely that child sex offenders will go to prison, they will stay there longer, and it will be harder for them to get bail. And also, very importantly, Acting Deputy President, the bill introduces mandatory minimum sentences for the most serious child sex offences and those who are repeat offenders to address the completely unacceptable situation where, as I've mentioned, as we've heard in this debate, 
39 per cent of offenders, that's convicted offenders, last year didn't spend a single day in jail. The bill also implements recommendations from the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sexual abuse to protect vulnerable witnesses by allowing them to automatically give evidence via a video recorded interview and also prohibits cross-examination at committal hearings. This bill complements a broad range of reforms already by, introduced by the coalition. Uh, these include tough new measures to stop child sex offenders from travelling overseas to abuse children. Carly's Law, which targets online predators who use the internet to prepare or plan to sexually abuse children. Uh, and the Combating Child Sexual Exploitation Legislation Amendment Act 2019, which implements a range of recommendations from the Royal Commission and improves the Commonwealth framework for offences relating to child abuse material, forced marriage and other matters such as the failure to protect children from abuse. So, Acting Deputy President, where is the opposition on these matters? We know that Labor refused to support this bill when it was before the parliament in 2016. We know that Labor does not have the will to tackle these abhorrent crimes. We know that Labor is divided and not focused on passing these changes to protect children from the predators. And as we've just heard from Senator Hughes, and I will reiterate this, on the 3rd of September 2019, the member for Grainler, the leader of the, op of the opposition, Mr Albanese, said people who engage in vile acts against children should have the book thrown at them. But in the same breath, he argued that these amendments will sometimes lead to less convictions rather than more because judges or juries will form the view that because it's mandatory sentencing, all of the circumstances cannot be factored in. This argument is nonsensical. It is completely at odds with community expectations. Community expectations that it is not okay for 39 per cent of child sex offenders convicted federally in the last financial year who did not spend a single day in jail. The community expects better than that, and that's why we are determined to implement this bill. We know that the Greens and parts of the Labor Party don't support mandatory sentencing on principle, which of course is a principle they only employ some of the time, given their support for mandatory minimum sentences for people smuggling offences in 2010. So does that mean Labor doesn't think that child sex offences are as serious as people smuggling offences? In the inquiry into the Combating Child Sexual Exploitation Legislation Amendment Bill 2019, Labor senators commented that the problems created by removing judicial discretion in sentencing are well attested. As the Law Council of Australia stated in its discussion paper on mandatory test sentencing in May 2014, there is very little evidence that mandatory sentencing increases public safety. On the contrary, the evidence is that it may have the opposite effect mandatory sentencing increases the incentive for defendants to fight charges and may increase the risk of recidivism. That's just completely not supported by the facts. Facts like when the West Australian state Liberal government introduced mandatory sentencing provisions for assaults against police and other officers, there was a 28 per cent drop in assaults against police in just a 12-month period. And I have to say, Mr Acting Deputy President, this does not reflect at all well on the Law Council of Australia as well. Mr Albanese has a chance to right the wrongs of the shortened Labor opposition and support these important changes. He needs to stand up to people in the Labor Party, like Senator Carr, who oppose mandatory sentencing of child abusers because of some ridiculous ideological opposition. Mr Albanese needs to stand up for Australian families 
and support this critical legislation to protect our community from the evils of child sexual abuse. And as I say, mandatory sentencing is a very important part of this bill. We will not tolerate the current record that we are seeing in relation to the number of offenders, convicted offenders, who do not end up in jail. It is a, an abhorrent proposition, and the Morrison government is determined to remedy that. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the safety of children online is a key concern for this government and a key concern for the community. It is vital we keep our children safe from sexual predators. Unwanted contact from strangers is one of the dangers children face when they are using the internet and social media. And I know that this is a particular concern for every parent, including myself, uh, given the fact that the internet has become a part of children's everyday life in so many respects. And it, as I say, for me as a parent, it causes me enormous worry, as I know it does uh, with every parent. It's worth reiterating the eSafety Commissioner's top tips for parents in protecting their kids online. They include to use parental controls in apps and devices to monitor and limit what your child does online, setting time limits for using devices during non-school hours, uh, keeping your children in open areas of the home when using their devices so that they can be properly monitored, turning on or reviewing privacy settings to restrict who can contact your child in apps and games and other types of ways in which uh, third parties can access your children via the internet. And of course, uh, keeping engaged through watching what your children are doing uh, and being very involved in your child's or children's online activities. Importantly, the government, through the Minister for Communications, Cyber Safety and the Arts, Paul Fletcher, is committed to introducing a new Online Safety Act, having been through an extensive period of consultation. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government takes child sexual exploitation extremely seriously, and we are determined to tackle it comprehensively. Our children deserve that protection, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Minister. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I thank honourable senators for their contribution in this debate. As the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse stated, the sexual abuse of a child is a terrible crime. It is the greatest of personal violations. It is perpetrated against the most vulnerable in our community. It is a fundamental breach of the trust that children are entitled to place in adults. For too long, the criminal justice system has failed innocent children who have fallen victim to predatory offenders. I thank the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, the Scrutiny of Bills Committee and the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights for their consideration of the bill. This consideration gave the government the opportunity to further highlight the improved community safety which will result from these important reforms, including the operation of the mandatory minimum sentencing scheme, the presumptions in favour of actual imprisonment and cumulative sentencing, the presumption against bail the increased requirements for rehabilitation and supervision of offenders and the offences to counter emerging forms of child sexual abuse. In their dissenting reports, the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, Labor and the Greens have called for the mandatory minimum sentencing scheme contained in Schedule 6 of the bill to be removed. This was on the back of claims that mandatory minimum sentencing has perverse unintended consequences, such as making it more difficult to prosecute criminals because they are less likely to plead guilty or to cooperate <coughs> with law enforcement if faced with a mandatory minimum sentence. My Labor and Greens colleagues have again raised these issues as part of today's debate, and I would like to take the opportunity to address some of these concerns. 
Senator McKim raised concerns that mandatory minimum penalties are ideological and not supported by any evidence that these penalties will in fact f uh, increase recidivism and de-incentivise offenders to plead guilty. With respect to Senator McKim, these claims are ill-founded and con uh, contradicted by what we know about these truly abhorrent crimes. An offender being sentenced to a prison term increases the likelihood that they will be subject to supervision upon their release into the community, and they will be provided the opportunity to engage in rehabilitation programs and education to reduce their risk of reoffending. Child sex offenders released from prison on parole are subject to robust parole conditions that require them to engage in psychological or other relevant treatment or restrict their use of electronic devices and limit, also limit their engagement with children in the community. The bill incentivises offenders to enter early guilty pleas and to cooperate with law enforcement through sentencing discounts of up to 25 per cent for each form of assistance, resulting in a total potential sentencing discount of up to 50 per cent, not 25 per cent, as stated by my colleague Senator Watt. On the matter of guilty pleas, this is an argument often put forward for mandatory minimums. And while you may argue for it, uh, it may argue it uh, for people for people smuggling or for other crime types, it just doesn't hold weight in the case of child sex offences that we're discussing here. And that is because in so many of the cases we're talking about, offending is taking place online. And as a consequence, there is often irrefutable evidence of online child exploitation activity, which comes from an individual's own devices. And that is why currently at least 80 per cent of Commonwealth child sex offenders plead guilty. The existence or otherwise of mandatory minimum sentencing will make no difference to these offenders pleading guilty. Senator McKim also raised his concern that mandatory minimum penalties may apply to sweetheart scenarios. I would like to reassure Senator McKim that the bill does not capture this type of conduct. The scheme does not apply to persons under 18 years old, so it will not apply to the 17-year-old innocently engaging with the 15-year-old girlfriend. The scheme has built-in safeguards to allow for the individual circumstances of each case to be taken into consideration at each step of the criminal justice process. History shows that these sweetheart scenarios are not the types of offences that are pursued. The cases that are pursued are those that involve predatory behaviour. They are the individuals on the legislation targets and that the agencies focus on. Labor also raised the concern that juries and judges will be less likely to convict guilty people if they do not believe that a mandatory minimum sentence is justified in a particular case. Now, again, while this argument might work for mandatory minimums for other crimes, there is no evidence of this occurring. And in relation to child sex offences, the most reprehensible type of offending on the statute books, it is a far-fetched claim. In relation to Senator McKim's concern about lack of evidence of mandatory minimums achieving their desired policy outcome, I would reiterate uh, the example cited by the government during the debate earlier today, in which it was outlined that there, were, there was in fact a 28 per cent decrease in assaults on police officers when Western Australia introduced laws that imposed mandatory minimum sentence for police assaults. But of course the purpose of mandatory minimums is not just as a deterrent but also to ensure that those who do commit the crime are, appro are appropriately punished. I note too that concerns were raised during the debate that mandatory minimum sentences may result in unjust and disproportionate sentences where the punishment does not fit the crime. However, this misses the nuance of the scheme. The scheme is a layered and considered approach, which has safeguards that enable the courts to take into account the circumstances of each individual case. And it ensures that judges maintain a high degree of discretion, which was a concern also raised by Senator McKim. Judicial discretion over the non-parole period is retained. Thus, notwithstanding a, mandatory minimums, uh, notwithstanding a mandatory minimum sentence applying, it will be open to the judge to order a non-parole <coughs> period for a time of their choosing. This allows the courts 
to take a range of sentencing considerations into account in determining a sentence of appropriate severity in all the circumstances of the case. This is, of course, in addition to the discretion available to the judge to issue discounts in sentencing of up to 50 per cent for guilty pleas and for cooperation with law enforcement. Further, people suffering from a cognitive impairment at the time of their offending will not be subject to the mandatory minimum sentencing, as the Crimes Act already has, it contains protections to ensure that they do not face criminal responsibility. Indeed, the mandatory minimum sentencing scheme is a sensible solution that reflects community expectations and ensures that sentences for child sex offenders actually reflect the gravity of those crimes. Concerns have also been raised about the resourcing impost that this bill will have on states and territories and law enforcement agencies. Now, these concerns are also not well founded. States and territories have been consulted during the development of this bill in various forums. They were discussed at meetings of the National Working Group on measures concerning child sex offenders in the July and October 2000, in both July and October 2017, which comprised senior police and justice officials from each of the states and treasuries, states and ter territories, and also from the Commonwealth. The Law, Crime and Community Safety Council, the Council of Australian Governments and the Ministerial Council for Police and Emergency Management discussed measures relating to child sex offenders at meetings held variously in 2016, 2017 and 2019. Funding or resources have never been requested in any of these meetings. The bill also contains a number of other important reforms which must also be acknowledged and which are supported by my opposition colleagues. The bill provides for increases to the maximum penalties for the most serious Commonwealth, <coughs> crime sex, Commonwealth child sex offending. And the impact of these offences can be damaging and, and lifelong in their effect. Increased maximum penalties reflect the gravity and the higher level of culpability of these most serious offences. I would like to place on the record that the proposal to simply increase the maximum penalties will not be enough to shift current sentencing practices, as some have suggested. Of those offenders who even receive a custodial sentence, the most common amount of time spent in jail was six months, despite some offences currently attracting imprisonment penalties of up to 20 years. In its dissenting report to the Senate Standing Committee on Legal and Constitutional Affairs, Labor recommended, that the amendment, uh, recommended the amendment of the bill to include a comprehensive statutory review of the Commonwealth sentencing practices for child sex offenders, the findings of which should be reported to the parliament within three years of the bill coming into effect. My colleagues, Senator Watt and Senator McKim, have also tabled amendments providing for a statutory review. The government sees merit in this idea and has put forward amendments that would see a statutory review of sentencing for offenders convicted of Commonwealth child sex offences, with the findings to be reported to Parliament within four years of the bill coming into effect rather than three years. This additional year will ensure that the review properly captures the impact of this bill on sentencing outcomes for Commonwealth child sex offenders charged after the passage of this bill. In conclusion, this bill signified this, government's, uh, signified this government's commitment to ensuring that the Australian community is protected from these heinous crimes. And I thank honourable senators for their contributions to this debate, and I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to the criminal law and for related purposes. So the Senate now resolves into committee. Minister. I table a supplementary expl explanatory memoran memorandum relating to the government amendments to be moved to this bill. So is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole 
There being no objection, is it so ordered? Uh, the question is that the bill stand as print. Sorry, Senator McKim. Uh, thank you. I, I understand that um, the government has just tabled a supplementary explanatory memorandum um, relating to amendments. Uh, and I, I, I just ask you, Minister, did you wish to move your uh, amendment now or later? Later. I'm, I'm happy to. Oh, I just offer the call to, to the minister out of courtesy. Minister. Is that, I'd like to move those amendments now, if I may, Acting Deputy President. So the question now is that. Uh, okay. So leave is granted to move them together? Leave is granted. Minister. So the question is that those amendments. Oh, sorry, Senator McKim. Um, thank you, Chair. I just want to um, uh, thank the government for um, moving these amendments. Uh, both. Uh, uh, well, sorry, I, I won't speak on behalf of the Labor Party, but the Australian Greens did, um, uh, and I did uh, say in my um, second reading speech that I thought uh, there should be a statutory um, review uh, of um, of uh, these provisions. So, Minister, I just wanted to um, clarify with you. And, I'll, and, and sorry, obviously, um, your amendment has been circulated relatively late. That's not a criticism. It's more of an explanation for um, for me seeking um, this advice um, from you. Um, in terms of the scope of uh, the review that would result um, from your amendment. Uh, can I confirm that it, it would cover um, all of um, the, uh, the matters uh, in this bill uh, as well uh, that, that relate to um, sentencing outcomes for um, offenders convicted of Commonwealth sex offences, but also of um, existing statutory provisions relating to um, sentencing outcomes for offenders convicted of Commonwealth sex offenders. Minister. Yes, Senator McKim, we can confirm that. Senator McKim. Um, oh, sorry, uh, after you, Senator. Senator, Senator Watt. Thanks, Senator McKim. Uh, I also want to join with Senator McKim in thanking the government for uh, listening to what we had to say on this point about a review. Uh, as I said during my second reading speech in relation to this bill, Labor believes that this bill should proceed without mandatory minimum sentences, and we'll come to that later. Mandatory sentencing is wrong in principle, does nothing to reduce or deter crime, and worst of all, it has adverse consequences. It makes it harder to catch criminals, harder to prosecute criminals, and harder to convict them. It should not be supported. Uh, as recommended by Labor Senators of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee, Labor also thinks that the Attorney-General should be required to initiate a review of sentencing practices in relation to Commonwealth child sex offences uh, so that the government and the parliament can ensure that people convicted of child sex offences are being sentenced in accordance with community standards and expectations. Happily, these hastily prepared amendments uh, moved by the government would implement that particular recommendation by Labor Senators. Uh, Labor does welcome these amendments. If they are successful, I would like to give the Senate notice that the opposition will not be moving items one and three on sheet double eight double O. Senator McKim. Um, thank you very much, Chair. And in a similar um, spirit, uh, should these amendments be successful, and I believe, uh, of course, that they will, uh, we will not um, proceed with. Uh, our amendments, which provided for a review, which would be amendments one and three on sheet 8826. So we uh, look forward to supporting the government's amendment, which I believe, uh, given the contributions we've just, just had, will pass the chamber unanimously, and then um, we can move on to uh, other issues uh, regarding this bill, including the mandatory sentencing provisions. So the question is that uh, uh, government amendments uh, on sheet one and two of uh, 115 by leave moved together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Senator McKim. Um, thanks again, Chair. 
I wanted to come to um, some of the points that the minister made uh, in summarising the second reading debate, uh, and points made by other uh, government members who um, have spoken to this legislation. Firstly, um, obviously there is a carve out in the mandatory sentencing provisions uh, of this legislation, uh, and that uh, carve out is contained in um, 16 AAC. <coughs> Uh, which provides that uh, 16 AAA and 16 AAB2 do not apply to a person who is aged under 18 years when the offence that the relevant provision specifies a minimum penalty for was committed. Um, and before I go to um, some of the implications of putting you know, such a hard marker in where if you're one day under 18 years of uh, age, you are not caught. Uh, by the minimum uh, mandatory minimum sentencing provisions, but if you are one day over 18 years of age, you will be caught by the mandatory minimum uh, sentencing provisions. I wanted to ask um, you, Minister, given um, that you've um, carved out um, people who uh, are uh, under the age of 18 when the relevant um, offence occurred, uh, why you have not carved out? Um, people who have significant cognitive impairment, because I, I place on the record, I think, because you've decided not to do that, um, two things. Firstly, uh, if there are other pieces of Commonwealth uh, legislation that apply, if you could provide some advice to the Senate on that, uh, and if there are not other pieces of Commonwealth legislation that apply and someone who does have significant cognitive impairment, impairment actually is caught uh, by, this, uh, by the mandatory minimum sentencing provisions of this legislation, I think you risk uh, filling up our jails with, um, uh, with mentally ill people, or I should say um, continuing to fill up our jails with mentally ill people. So perhaps you could address um, that, that matter, Minister, whether uh, anything in, in this bill or any other piece of Commonwealth legislation um, would mean that someone who does have significant cognitive impairment would not be caught by the mandatory minimum sentencing provisions in this legislation. Minister. Yes, thank you, Senator McKim. And I, I did mention that in my summing up speech that people suffering from cognitive impairment at the time of their offending will not be subject to the mandatory minimum sentencing, as the Crimes Act already contains protections to ensure that they do not face criminal responsibility. Senator McKim. Uh, um, thank you, Minister. I, I was probably just reading through your uh, your um, late uh, supplementary explanatory memorandum when you. Um, when you address that in, in your second reading speech, so I, I do thank you for um, for uh, addressing that again, um, Minister. I, I wanted to um, now address um, the issue that I briefly flagged earlier. Um, I heard in, uh, and by the way, I don't I don't believe I heard this from a minister, but I did hear it from some government backbenchers that young people are not going to be caught by the mandatory minimum sentencing provisions. Um, with respect that, to those senators, that is most certainly not true. Um, anyone who is 18 years and one day old uh, can certainly be considered a young person. And I wanted to um, give you some examples, Minister, because I think it's important that senators understand what they're voting for here. And I'll take these, um, these um, uh, I'll give you these examples um, in good faith. So, could you confirm that if, on a um, uh, an overseas holiday between two families, uh, an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old commence a romantic relationship and they touch each other in a sexual way, that the person in that relationship who is uh, 18 years and one day old will have to be sentenced to five years imprisonment if found guilty of uh, an offence. Could you just confirm that, please, Minister? Minister. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Senator McKim, when, um, when this bill previously came before the House, the opposition erroneously 
said that the government's reforms would see teenagers locked up for five years, as you have just said, for their flirtations over Snapchat or for Facebook or other social media platforms. This bill specifically does not target that type of sweetheart relationship between consenting young people. Rather, it targets serious predators aiming to sexually exploit vulnerable children. The criminal justice system has effective safeguards. Firstly, all child sex offences in Part 10.6 of the Criminal Code, uh, transmitting child abuse material over a carriage service, require <coughs> the Attorney General's consent to prosecute where the accused was a minor at the time of offending. Further, uh, police and prosecutors retain discretion to pursue an investigation and must ensure that any prosecution is in the public interest. So these existing safeguards have not been altered by this bill. And a review of the cases of actual prosecution for engaging in sexual activity with a child under 16 since the introduction of the offence in 2010 reveals that consenting teenagers are not, in fact, being prosecuted. The people who have been convicted of these crimes include uh, a 56-year-old who preyed on a nine-year-old who received a three-year sentence and was released on condition that he be of good behaviour after one year's imprisonment. A 49-year-old that targeted children ranging in age from nine to 14 who was sentenced to four years imprisonment with a two-year non-parole period for child abuse material and grooming offences, as well as attempting to engage in sexual activity with a child. A 36-year-old who abused eight child victims and made video recordings of the abuse that made out the offences um, was um, released on he was release, released on condition that he be of good behaviour after serving only 14 months in prison. So on the very few occasions where young people aged um, 18 and above have been prosecuted for engaging in sexual activity with a child, often the victims were manipulated or deceived into sexual activity or providing abuse material to the offender. The victims were tricked about the age and often the gender of the offender, and such co conduct cannot be excused. So, for example, a young person convicted of sexual activity with a child using a carriage service, for instance, in 2014, an, an offender aged 19 was convicted of 14 Commonwealth child sex offenders offences. The Offences were committed over a period of approximately 12 months and involved the exploitation of 14 individual children, most of whom were aged between 13 and 16, but one of the victims was seven years of age. The court awarded a 25 per cent discount for an early guilty plea. The offender's total effective sentence was three years and six months, and he was released after serving 14 months on a, re on recognizance, on a recognizance release order on the condition that he be of good behaviour, accept supervision, and pay $200 for any breach. The offender had been previously convicted of contact child sex offenders. And I note that because the conviction was before the passage of legislation in 2015 that required sentences of over three years to include a non-parole period, the court was able to sentence this offender with a recognisance release order. So this, the bill ensures that sexual predators who abuse children face appropriate, appropriately severe penalties regardless of their age. Senator McKim. Uh, well, thanks, Minister. And just to be clear, no one's um, in this debate is arguing that um, heinous crimes such as that should not uh, attract appropriate sentences. And um, so I just want to place that on the record. Um, having said that, most of your answer was completely irrelevant to the question that I asked. Um, in terms of um, the Attorney General needing to sign off, I believe you said that relates to minors. That was not the question I asked. I asked a question about an 18 year old. Um, offender, not a minor, uh, an 18-year-old offender who is obviously still a teenager and still 18-year-olds um, uh, of, of um, no matter their sex can be um, very emotionally uh, immature and, and, uh, and still at school, ab absolutely. Um, so um, as I understand your answer, the only relevant part uh, of your answer, or sorry, the only part of your answer that was relevant uh, to the question I asked was the bit about uh, prosecutorial um, uh, discretion. So, so what you're saying is that this Senate should be satisfied um, on the basis of an, un, uh, an unknown decision made by an unknown prosecutor um, that they won't prosecute um, you know, so-called sweetheart, sweetheart arrangements when, in fact, um, the sweetheart arrangements, including the example I just gave, including the example 
um, of, for example, um, an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old exchanging um, uh, sexual images or bodily images and sexual stories on Snapchat could attract a mandatory minimum penalty of five years uh, under this legislation. I mean, let's be clear here, Minister. You're asking us to accept that uh, a prosecutorial decision or an investigative decision um, made by someone that we don't know who they are, we don't know uh, what prejudices that might exist in their lives, um, should satisfy the Senate when actually if a prosecution is launched and someone is found guilty of these offences, you could end up um, in a situation where someone who is 18 years and one day old could face a mandatory minimum penalty in, uh, in some circumstances uh, of uh, five years, in other circumstances uh, of six years. Uh, and in the case of uh, a situation where there is an 18-year-old offender who is one of the coaches of a sporting team in which uh, one member of that team is uh, his 15-year-old girlfriend, uh, and he has sex with his girlfriend while his team while his team's on an overseas trip, um, they would face a mandatory minimum penalty of seven years imprisonment. And you're asking us to accept, Minister, uh, that an unknown decision that you hope might happen in the future, made by someone that we don't know, uh, we don't know what their training is, we don't know what their expertise in assessing public interest is, and you're saying that should satisfy the Senate? Well, it doesn't satisfy me, and that's why the Australian Greens maintain our strong opposition to the minimum mandatory sentences in this legislation. Minister. Uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, thank you, Senator McKim. As a, I suppose I can only reiterate that there is judicial discretion, and the part of that judicial discretion suggests that there, it has to be in the public interest. Sentencing must be the penalty must be in the public interest, and bear in mind too that the victim must be under 16. Uh, must be, and because 16 is obviously the age of consent. But moreover, moreover, history suggests that this does not happen. All the examples that you gave are entirely hypothetical. And they are. They are entirely hypothetical because, in 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 real life, that hasn't happened. They, they, those decisions, in those decisions, those decisions. Of course, they have, Senator Pratt. You know that. But as you also know, those people, those young people, have not been prosecuted and would not be subject to this. Senator McKim, what is the judicial discretion that you just um, mentioned? Uh, in relation to minister, you, you mentioned judicial discretion in the answer you just gave. Um, could you explain what you mean? Because mandatory minimum, minimum sentence actually removes judicial discretion. I'm sorry. Forgive me, it minister? was prosecutorial. Sorry, sorry, acting deputy president. It, that was my mistake. I meant prosecutorial discretion, not judicial discretion. It's late. Senator McKim. Um, thank you. So. Um, so can you just be clear, Minister, that in your, first, in your answer to the first question in, in this stage of proceedings, um, you said that the Attorney General would need to side off, but that only relates to a situation where the offender is a minor. Ca can you be clear about that? Senator McKim, you have the call. Oh, thank you. And that's my bad, um, Chair, because I started speaking before you give me the call. So I apologise for that. Um, uh, thank you for that answer, um, Minister. Uh, and just to be clear, um, I'm not <laughs> asking about a circumstance where the offender is a minor that is under the age of 18. I understand that there, are, there is a carve out in this legislation. Um, that covers that circumstance. Um, I'm asking about um, where uh, the offender is um, 18. And let's use an example. And yes, these are hypothetical, but believe me, Minister, I haven't forgotten what it's like to be young, and I hope you haven't either. Um, these may be hypothetical, but you can bet your bottom dollar that something like uh, situations similar to the ones I'm describing would happen on a regular basis. Um, so I want to ask you again about someone who is 18 years and one day old. 
let's say hypothetically it's a man, a male, they have a girlfriend who is um, 15 years and 364 days old, so under 16, under the age of consent. Um, so there is effectively two years age difference between those two people. There is two years and two days age difference between those two people. And, um, and if, um, for example, um, those two people uh, are on um, uh, a school trip, let's say, to New Zealand, um, the 18 year and one day old um, year 12 male has sex with his 15 uh, year and 364 day old uh, uh, female girlfriend, uh, the judge would have, and, and uh, the prosecution was launched, the judge would have no alternative other than to sentence um, that uh, 18 year old teenager to um, six years imprisonment and the only um, the only sucker you can offer uh, this Senate is that um, you don't believe that a prosecution um, would be proceeded with in that circumstance is that correct minister Senator McKim law enforcement wouldn't pursue this prosecutors wouldn't pursue this it's not in the public interest Senator McKim Senator McKim, you have um, thank, you, thank you, Chair. I'll make the obvious point. There are secret trials going on in this country right now that are not in the public interest. Um, Bernard Caleri <coughs> has been charged by the Commonwealth DPP when it is clearly not in the public interest that he be charged. It's a disgrace that he was charged, and that charge authorised uh, recommended by the DPP and signed off by the Attorney General is an absolute disgrace. It should not be happening. It clearly runs counter to the public interest, but it's still <coughs> happening. It's still happening. So when you say that the prosecution would not be proceeded with because it's not in the public interest, that gives me no confidence whatsoever, because prosecutions happen in this country when they are not in the public interest, Minister, and that is an unarguable statement of fact. And I tender as Exhibit A the charging of Mr Caleri, uh, who um, bravely and patriotically acted um, in, in regards to the mo one of the most shameful episodes in this country's um, recent history, uh, which was the illegal bugging of the Timor-Leste government by Australian security agencies. So I do uh, want to say to you, Minister, that I understand that's the only argument you've got to say that the prosecution would not proceed in the public interest. It gives no comfort to the Australian Greens whatsoever. Senator Hanson. Um, I can relate to Senator McKim's concerns about an 18-year-old and a 15-year-old. He's 18 years old in one day, and he might be ca get caught up. And I think um, Senator McKim's referral to going over to New Zealand, because it is federal legislation we are talking about. There is state legislation with regards to sexual crimes, but this is federal. So, what um, what we are discussing here really is about the expectations from the public. People are absolutely fed up with seeing children abused, pedophilia. Uh, the horrendous um, acts of using children to take pornography photos, going overseas to other countries and actually um, using that and the abuse on children. That's what this is all about. What Senator McKim is talking about is something that could likely happen. And, but then again, it's up to the Federal Attorney General to decide whether they're going to bring a prosecution case against it and he will sign off on that in a case like that. But what's happened over the period of time is that we've seen that many pedophiles and monsters in our society that have abused children, and we've got 39 per cent out there who have not spent one day in jail. The expectations are of the average jail term is about one and a half years. So the whole fact is we're not dealing with it. The public expectation is they're in fear for their children. That's why parents accompany their children everywhere. When I was growing up, I could actually walk to school. There was no problems with that. These days, the parents are fearful of letting children out of their sight. 
I think that we need to really look at this fairly. It did concern me, it was raised to me about the 18-year-old and compared to a 15-year-old. But at the end of the day, when I was informed about an Australian who paid $120,000 for someone else to go overseas on their behalf to actually have photos of having sex with children or photos of these children, then sending it back so in his sick mind he can watch this on the internet. That's things that we need to stop. And the whole fact is that if it means that we have to do a four-year mandatory sentence, then it may stop what is happening. There has to be a deterrent. There has to be punishment. And if most of these people, and I've heard Senator McKim say, there is no deterrent. Do you think this will stop the, the crimes? It won't. And I, and I can understand your reason. Put more police out there. But you've got these crafty criminals out there. They'll do whatever they can um, to get their photos, their pornography. They're sick. They really are sick. And it's not about that. It's about becoming a, a society where we intend to get tough with these people. Yes, these sentences have been increased. And as I ask the question, the sentences were at 10 or 15 years. How often were they imposed to that maximum? Give me one case. They couldn't because the judges are reluctant to actually impose those sentences. And that's why we've got to a case now where it's a slap over the wrist. Or they're let go, and that's why you've got 39 per cent who have committed sexual offence or criminal you know, sexual um, actions on these kids and nothing's happened. So that's why it's here in this chamber for us as legislators to put it before the courts and say, this is the minimum. And if they do have plead guilty to it, it's not the four years minimum. It'll be 25 per cent taken off that, so it's three years. So I don't know when Mc Senator McKim's getting the six years. So it is, we have to actually look at the balance of it. The balance is, do we want to let those monsters through our system who will continue to abuse the children, or do we actually have to rely on the right people, the DBP, the Attorney General and those to look at it realistically if someone of 18 does something or texts to um, their, their you know, 15 year old or 16 year old or 17 year old girlfriend. That's what we have to consider here. It's, um, it's very important and this now has been passed, the amendment has been passed, a review will be done and that was my suggestion to the government that it does have a review and it comes up and I think that's a good place to be in. So then we can actually look at what has happened over the period of time, the three or four years, and see if it is working because what we have now is not working. So we have to send out a clear message to the people of this nation that if you want to commit these crimes against our children, you, you are going to be dealt with. So I have no problem with this and I commend the government and bring this legislation through. And I know that any clear-minded you know, person in this chamber that has children of their own could not possibly oppose this legislation. And uh, I think that we're doing a good thing for our society by passing this legislation as is. Senator McKim. Um, <clears throat> um, thanks, Chair. So, look, uh, I could go through example uh, uh, after example, and uh, many of them were submitted by eminent submitters to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs um, Committee inquiry uh, into this legislation. But I'll, I'll just um, um, make the point uh, that um, the, the, um, the effective defence that the minister, uh, or, or the comfort that the minister is uh, attempting to offer. Um, this chamber around uh, whether or not a prosecution is in the public interest. I mean, I just um, I'll offer the example of where a mother becomes aware um, that her, you know, 15-year-old daughter has been um, receiving images from someone over 18 and pushes really hard in the public for a prosecution to occur. Um, I, I just don't think, um, Minister, that 
that that comfort um, is of a high enough level that that uh, that this Senate ought to accept um, the mandatory minimum sentencing provisions. And I just want to place it on the record. And I, I accept that you've um, tabled an amendment for a review. And as I've said earlier, I thank you for that, and we support that. And it is very important that that happen. But I, I just want to place on the record that. Uh, we are risking here a series of gross miscarriages of justice where <coughs> young Australians could end up um, imprisoned for um, up to seven years um, in some circumstances, and that young Australian could still be a teenager when the offence occurred, uh, and they'll be you know, well into their 20s uh, when they get out of prison with a, with a very different life in front of them uh, than would be the case if a judge um, had been uh, allowed to exercise his or her discretion in the sentencing. So, um, having said that, um, Chair, I'll now move um, the Australian Greens amendments uh, two and five to seven on sheet eight eight two six, and um, uh, the effect uh, of um, those amendments would be that the mandatory sentencing provisions uh, in this legislation would be deleted. So is Senator McKim, you're seeking leave to move those? I am, thank you. Leave, leave granted? Leave granted. So, Senator McKim, you are uh, uh, moving 8826 and 8800527. Is that correct? Because that's the way it's printed in front of me. So, I've got. Uh, um. Uh, the McKim. Greens amendments are on sheet 8826. And I indicated earlier that we're going to withdraw uh, amendments 1 and 3 on sheet, on sheet 8826 because the government has already tabled an amendment which provides for a review. I'm advised they need to be put separately, Senator McKim, so if we do that. So the question now is that uh, two and five to seven be now agreed to. All those, all those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required? Well, ring the bell.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the motion moved by Senator McKim by leave together on sheets 8826 and 8800, two and five to seven be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Brockman as teller for the noes. Order, there being 31 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is negated. I believe Senator Watt is seeking the call. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to move item four on sheet 8800. Uh, you don't need leave, Senator Don't need leave. Watt, but you've, we'll Even take better. It. Yep. We'll take it that you've moved that. I move item four on sheet 8800. Uh, I move that the question be put. No, sorry. Do you, oh. Are you speaking on it? But we'll oh, just. You don't want me to say so that, uh, that's just been moved by Senator Watt. I think Senator McKim is seeking the call. Uh, yes, I am. Um, thank you. And I just indicate that the Greens will be supporting this amendment. Thank you, Senator McKim. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Watt on uh, Schedule 6. Stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Uh, 
I think I only heard one voice. Okay. So division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. One minute. Whips. One minute. Okay, stop the bells. So the question is that Schedule 6 is moved by Senator Watt, stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes.
order, there being 31 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is negated. And for the point of clarity, that means that um, Schedule 6 is removed from the bill. So the question now is that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Crimes Amendment Sexual Crimes Against Children and Community Protection Measures Bill of 2019 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend legislation relating to the criminal law and for related purposes. Government Business ordered the day number three National Skills Commissioner Bill 2020 resumption of second reading debate. We've just moved on to a new bill. I would ask senators who aren't participating in this debate to either sit quietly or leave the chamber, please.